Jazz Mass and Man Grenades. Jazz Mass and Man Grenades. Jazz Mass and Man Grenades. Gas mass and hand grenades. <laughs>
modern is sort of you know when they 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 change so much generally generally not always but mostly that it's kind of hard to slot them in any specific time thing so we're kind of we're going to do the ears but we're going to try to do it chronologically so john where when how uh okay so daniel brayer or shane brayer uh you know from agaloc mm -hmm. before he was before he was in agaloc he was a tape trader of mine and he had he was one of my favorite tape traders because he had the good stuff he uh, had he had the the dark the black metal stuff he had the death doom stuff and everything you could possibly want he had right and so i really loved <clears throat> him and it was great because shane he was an interesting character because he had a lot of that stuff, but he didn't like, like most of it. Like he'd always be very critical of everything. You know, he'd say, Oh yeah, this rotting Christ album, is great, but the vocals suck. Or, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. It's like what are you talking about? But, Almost like kind of, <laughs> kind of pissing on the parade before you got the, in a way, judgments. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, later on him and I, you know, we, he, I got him into stuff like in the nursery and, uh, fields of Nephilim and, you know, stuff like that. He got me into Dead Can Dance and, you know, oh, so we, yeah. Diver Bottom, King Derivas, stuff like that. So, you know, but early on, I was just, you know, requesting death and black metal demos from him. And uh, one trade uh, in 94, he, there was some room on the tape. And so he just put the Vargnaut demo on there. Ah. And he was like, oh, hey, there's this, you might like this demo. You like Voivod. It kind of sounds like black metal Voivod. You know, and he's like, he's like, and it mostly sucks, but there's this one acoustic, there's this one classical piece on it that's incredible. That, it, it's worth yeah. it. Yeah. And so I remember listening to it and it was a terrible dub. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was really warbly. And, okay. Oh, shit. And so it didn't really impress me that much. It was hard to listen to, but I could tell it was good. Yeah. I could tell that it was, it was creative in that sort of beyond yes, kind of way. For sure. And in fact, I think he said that it was kind of like a poor man's Beyond Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, which got me very interested. So later on, so that's how we got into this demo. Was right, this right. right. Um, which I bought this a few years later. I found it on eBay. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and also this. I would think that's not easy to find anymore. No. And this What's, seven inch. He, yeah, let me, let me blow you he, up a sec. Hold on. Yeah. He actually gave me this. No way. Because he thought it sucked. <laughs> wow. He was just wishing he had that bag now, huh? <laughs> uh, maybe. I don't think he cares. So, yeah, that's that's how I discovered them. But it, they didn't impress me at first. And it was yeah. it was about a few months later. Because Shane would always get promos. Can I ask what year this is? This is 94. It started in 94. Okay. So a few, a few months later, in early, mid to, like mid-95, I'd say spring. Um, I was in Montana visiting Jason and his friend Lad, and Shane was there also. And he came over with a pile of CDs that he had just got because he had a zine, so he would get promos, but he also bought a lot of stuff. Okay. And in that pile was Bergtop. Ah. And so was Heart of the Ages by In the Woods. Oh, okay. And so yeah. he, you know, so I'm go, I'm rifling through the CDs, and I, I see the, first of all, I see that album cover. For Berg yeah. and like, yeah. what the fuck is this? Exactly. This is incredible. And to this day, that's my favorite black metal album art. It's awesome. To this day. It's so evocative, right? Yeah. And and the, the big version of it is even cooler, where you can see all the people that you can see like souls in the in the uh, mountain. Okay, yeah, yeah. We're um, talking about it on the LP. Yeah, there's or a part of the paint, the actual painting. The pa the painting, yeah. Oh, the painting. Okay, all right, right, right. Yeah, so I have I have this. Box yeah, set. the trilogy box set, nice. And it has a poster of the artwork. In oh, each of them. okay. So you can see more of the artwork. So you get a lot more detail. Yeah, yeah. and the logo's not in the way, so it's oh. like you see all the. But anyway, so he was like, "Oh yeah, that's that's the first album by that band, Over, that I told you about a few months ago." Mm -hmm. And I and I was like, "How is it?" And he's like, "It's incredible. Ah, it's so much changed. better than the yeah." Album. So he puts it on, mm -hmm. and I'm like looking at the artwork and the and the the photos of the band and everything. And that first song comes on and I'm like, okay, this is, this is good. This is kind of spacey guitars, kind yeah, of that. atmospheric. And then the vocals hit and I'm like, what in the hell? 
Yeah, because you're expecting death or black vocals, right? Right. Yeah. And it was like, this is so beyond. It's like Gregorian. It's like Gregorian chant vocals. Yeah. Vocals, and, right? yeah. Oh, you know, you have, to, you have to imagine this was like what March of twenty of ninety five. Right. And how old are you? You're. I'm forty eight. No, I'm no, forty. Oh, uh, in ninety five, right. I was twenty. Yeah. Yeah, you were about twenty, right? So you're. I was almost twenty one. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. No. Ninety early ninety five. No, I was nineteen. Because right. I was born in seventy five. Okay, right, right. So you're yeah. you're still you just out of school. You're yeah, just, I was still a kid, kid, right? We're still yeah, kids. I was, I was like first year of college in Seattle. You know, are you playing guitar at the time or not yet? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, you've been at it for a while. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um. So anyway, yeah, and so yeah, we I just listen. I mean, we listened to the whole thing because it's only like thirty five minutes long. Right. And I was just I was just shocked by it. And yeah, that's that was. That was my first like infatuation with the band. Right. It was like, well, I mean, they went from that demo to that first album, and and it was just like night and day. Okay, you know? so my experience is that because I am a little older than you, um, I didn't really come into them until I, it was around ninety nine, and you will remember this probably. You know, early days of the internet, we had the Yahoo chat groups, the Yahoo groups, or whatever, yeah. right? And you, you know, you get on there anonymously as Joe Blow or Gas Mask and or whatever, and you start connecting with others, you know, souls out there that kind of knew more than you did, or maybe you were interacting and kind of, oh yeah, it, I, <clears throat> I'm a little old though, John. I missed the tape trading thing. I kind of was already kind of beyond it, right? You know what right. I mean? Like it was. I wasn't picking up zines and I wasn't doing that thing. So I feel bad. Like, I feel like I really missed out on something, but it just yeah. is the way it was. I, cause I, you said you're 48, right? See, I'll be yeah. 58 in March. So I'm like a full decade ahead, but, and I'm listening to crew and dream theater and, you know, all that kind of shit in the, in the eighties, the eighties, still the eighties music, tears for fears, all stuff. I love talk, talk, but do, but I'm, and I'm also into the goth, like the sisters of mercy and, fields which i know you love them we have to talk about that but we'll talk about that after after hours here but <laughs> long story short um i was kind of dipping my toe into the extreme metal thing so like i remember the very first weirdly the very first cd i got that was extreme metal was coroner's mental vortex and i got it simply because some dude's like dude you play guitar you gotta get this out and i remember getting in going man I, you know i knew about death I knew about Cannibal. I knew about the Florida scene mainly. And I knew about Venom. And I knew about Bathory, the first Bathory album. So, you know, because we're <laughs> well beyond that at this point. But I, I really, so Bergtad actually slots in as one of the first five or six extreme metal, and I don't really call it super extreme, but extreme metal albums that I ever got. And I did, like, especially because of the black metal thing, I was always kind of like, man, you know, I call it Catholic guilt, I get, I guess, because I don't go to church and I don't really believe, but I would always be kind of scared of that, not scared, but just like leery of that, that whole thing. Because, you know, when the church burning started with the second wave and everything, I was like, man, these, these fucking dudes are fucked. They're just fucked up in the head, right? Like, I don't know if I want to be associated with that shit. But the nice thing about, is they never really were they were they were nebulous to it and they knew those people but they, yeah. they weren't they weren't directly involved in all that weirdness right so they seemed a little more safe for me well you you can comment in a yeah second. okay <laughs> so because you probably know more than i do about that but uh long story short i got worked out i want to say i got it in 99 so they already had they were already uh, uh we're already post nottons already at this point right right and um and i'm like you know oh this is pretty cool and and again the thing that i struggled with very early on with death and death metal and black metal was of course the vocal thing i just did i came from an era of melodic vocals and so i had to retrain my brain a little bit right around that time 2000 i got connected with stephen wilson and he got me into opeth and then then the walls fell down so to speak so Burnt Out was, was very important, a very important album for me because it really set me up to go into the next phase, which was you guys about a year or two later with Pell Folklore. I'm like, oh, 
this. This is like that in a lot of ways. But longer songs, cooler interludes, more guitar in a weird way. A different kind of guitar, let's put it that way. A lot more acoustic involved in the, the uh, you know, the way you wrote songs within the songs. And But, man, that first album, like, I, so I did not know about Nuttons, uh Vardnat. In fact, I'm going to make a total honest admission here. I had never listened to it until two days ago. Didn't even know it existed, really. Yeah. But I got some things to say about it. So, go ahead. You had some. See, well, it seems to me that you would have been more in, a fan of Arturis. Like that, I would have thought that that would have hit you more. It, it, it did. It did. Right. Uh, when was Sham Mirrors? Two thousand one, right? Two thousand two. Okay. Yeah, it that came was, out in the end. So. Yeah, that was definitely one. I I found out about Sham because of the Garm connection. I'm like, oh. But okay. you. But but Land well, for an All, man. What's that? The, early, the albums before that, like oh, Land uh, for an All, and uh, uh, those are I I mean those are masterpieces. I, I'm disappointed by the Sham Mirrors. I like it. I like all of them, but I, yeah. I get where you're coming from. I mean, especially the first one. What's it? What's it called again? Uh, Symphonia. Right, and, and, and then what's the fault? My angel. Oh, the seven inch. Yeah, my angel. And then they did constellation. There was an EP. Yeah, I have the I have the double disc that has all that stuff on it. And yeah, yeah. Like that was actually the last thing I got of them. I'm like, whoa, I was missing this. So yeah. You know, it, I kind of miss those days in a weird way because you had to go digging. You know, you had to go, you had to go find stuff, and you had to know somebody that knew something. And you know, <laughs> now it's everywhere. All that info is everywhere, right? I have, yeah. Well, I've got an interesting story. <laughs> go ahead. So go ahead. Yeah. So on that note, so when I got into metal, so like extreme metal, like thrash metal, would have been eighty-seven, um, and I lived in a tiny town in montana so it's like you know there was nobody there was really nobody there there was no scene there <clears throat> right but there were people in my high school who listened to metal and stuff but they were dicks they were the typical gatekeeping yeah. paul bailoff worshiping assholes yeah. and so i was on my own to just find out stuff and i did it i did it the hard way you know I'd, i would buy a magazine and i'd see a shirt that that you know dan Someone looker was wearing and, yep. mm -hmm. yeah and then i would go you know find that shirt or i'd look in thanks lists and i'd experience you know yep. it, it wasn't until 89 when i when i got in contact with edward vasquez from devastation okay. uh, the, the texas band and he was so cool to me he like he was the first one who would who wrote wrote me back and was like he sent me flyers and he and i was like what are these flyers and he's like oh this is for underground zines and demos and i'm like what's the underground and he just yeah. like taught me everything about it and that's where like my tape trading started that's when i started buying demos that was around 1990. okay and you know i started buying zines and then it just exploded from there and i just yeah. did my own research and i didn't need a scene yeah, yeah, to, yeah. you know because kind of, created, kind of created your own in a weird way right and I, it's like you know what's and what's interesting and this is how this sort of leads up to over is you know i always thought that the the thrash metal scene especially in the 80s and you would know this you know, it was very much, it was very much a club Quick. where it was very dogmatic. Yep. You could only listen to this much, this stuff. You could only, you, could, you had to look this way, much like punk was, you know, it was just like, yeah. and it was very like, I kind of saw it as like sheepish behavior. It's like, you know, the metal is about individualism, I thought. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and then later on, black metal did the same thing. You know, you had the inner circle, you had people who listen to what yeah. you used to say and it was like you could only do be this and this and this or if you're true and if you're not you're a poser and it's just like i was just like fuck that it's human and nature it, it's human yeah. nature that 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 kind <clears throat> of uh somebody well all you gotta do is look at the political system that we're right we're it was very yeah it was very almost religious right. in, in mm -hmm. like demagoguery about <laughs> shit and, and that that's it is kind of sad i mean uh, yeah i totally get it and you're right about the thrash scene like just like the the florida death scene kind of didn't groove with the the new york death scene unless they went out on tour together and were like oh this guy's fucking cool right yeah right. now then you would let the barriers fall down but you always had that kind of <clears throat> better than you man you just don't know well and i i just looked at it as you people are sheep <laughs> you know and it's like so basically i felt like a wolf among a bunch of metal elitist sheep Right. And that's how I felt about Over when I discovered them, especially with their interviews. 
because their early interviews are like, mwah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're so like arrigant. Yeah, Chris is individualist. Uh, well, no, Eric, man. Eric Lancelot. He had some really now which was which guy was he? he was the was drummer. He? he was the drummer on the oh. in the trilogy. Okay. He was kind of their spokesperson for a while, and he did a lot of those classic interviews that you see like reprinted in Lords of Chaos and stuff. Okay. And that interview in particular was just brilliant. It, I think it originally was in Slayer. Magazine. I never saw that one. Okay. So and then it was just very like fuck off to everybody. Or? Well, yeah, that's the one. That was the classic interview where he called Venom a bunch of beer, you know, drinking uh, mindless rabble and called the black metal elitists a bunch of like losers who got bad grades in high school and <laughs> got welfare and they were just like we 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 want to rise above this and i was just like you yeah. i get you guys yeah you know I, it's like i felt the same way in this sort of elitist way in my own way and they and they did but now you you kind of made a face there when i said that they weren't really part of that scene they knew all those people garm, but they weren't i know that garm hung out a lot at helvita which okay. was Euronomus's record store and I don't, I don't know this for, for, for a fact, but I thought he was present at some of the church burnings, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to say he was, I heard that he was from other people, but I, you know, wow. Okay. But I mean, I don't think he was, I think it was just, he was just kind of an outsider in the Observing. scene. You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was kind yeah. of a lurker in a way. No, um, lurker, right. a and if, you know, and if I'm, if I'm wrong, I, I'm fully, you know. Yeah, we don't, this is, we're just speculating yeah. here, so. But I mean, know. I was, I knew somebody who knew those guys at that okay. time. Well, well, I remember talking to Ivar, one of my interviews, talked to Ivar, and, you know, he, they were friends with all those dudes. They were all, yeah. you know, part of that scene, and he told a story about a, a really big-time black metal festival. I want to say it happened in, in Aust Bergen, maybe? It was, like, one of the first, like, really big, like, festivals where all those bands were there they were all hanging out in uh this one particular bar and some dude came in with like a fringe ja leather jacket on like a fringe jacket right so everybody right away is like narc this dude's a narc and he's asking all the questions like hey where's the, the where, where, man i'm here i'm ready to do it let's let's go let's go burn some churches let's go you know all this stuff and they're like this guy's a fucking narc this guy's a cop there's no doubt what it was but you know ebar had a really neat way of putting it that they just <laughs> while those guys were friends and he does not uh what's the word i'm looking for ostracize those guys as friends because some of them are still deep friends of his like you know what's his name uh um demonaz you know guys like that but he wasn't doing the church burning either but but he just said you know we just had a bigger vision for what we wanted to do we didn't we didn't feel like excluding other influences and excluding the greater sort of paradigm of music out there. And we just weren't interested in that shit. We were more interested in the Norse mythology and stuff like that, like Ulve was really, because that's the one thing you can really, for the most part, with the exception of maybe the demo, they don't really talk about Satan at all, ever. No, no. Right. And, and well, and here's other than thing. religious kind of, kind of like on the Blake it, thing. And yeah, I know that, I mean, they did interview. They didn't interview for the Black Flame, which was a Le Anton Lavey kind yeah. of magazine. Right. Um, I know that they, from from interviews, I know they were interested in Satanism, but more of like the Crowleyan kind of stuff. The, right. That, you know, more just uh, the occult as opposed to more occult. Yeah, yeah. Worshiping Satan versus but, the anti-Christian thing. The reason why I made a face was because of the the original black metal documentary Detsvard Alver. Did you ever see that? Not no, not the till the light takes us right. No no no, this was ninety four. Oh, this is early. Okay, no, I've not seen that. I gotta find that. So Chris, from wait, is that the one that Gorgorov's on with? Um... No, no. Okay, all right, go ahead. So this was the original. This was like the first black metal documentary. As wow, far as I got you. Gotta send me the name of and, that then. Yeah, and Chris was like a eight, 17 year old kid in this, and he wow. was he was one of the sort of characters who was who was involved you know in the in, in talking about the scene and stuff and he like literally shows up in the snow with his motocross boots and his fucking leather jacket with a coil on, yeah. on the sleeve and oh, okay. another sleeve and he like goes into a church and it's in norwegian but it's like he apparently he just goes and just just shits on christianity you know and uh -huh. it, it was something that was on like the national it was a big like a tv it was a big oh, show. Oh, like, yeah, right. They did it. You know, like, so it was, it was showing everywhere in Norway. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. it was like, he was like kind of the, 
the at the forefront of like basically like this to, at least a verbal catalyst anyway yeah yeah. Oh, yeah and and you know and he had a magazine called eclipse which okay. was a, in the scene so you know they he he was definitely involved in the in the black metal scene early on but here's the thing See i kind of feel like i kind of feel like chris <laughs> in a way was sort of a wolf among sheep because he was not your tip he doesn't seem didn't seem to me to be your typical black metal kid because he was into stuff like coil he was okay. into stuff like diamond and you right. know all this, all this cool stuff stuff like when and yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's just like you know all this stuff that was deemed you know are we talking about the drummer chris are we talking about no, no, chris Rick? no chris rick Rick. okay Rick. Rick. yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. right come on. So, yeah so um yeah, I you know they were certainly involved in the scene, but they quickly, they, I would say they were they were on the fringe, and they that's exited. what it was. Yeah, more like they were observers of it, just sort of taking yeah. it in and sort but, of not maybe not riding the coattails of it because they really no. didn't do that. They they kind of were just like these guys are sketch as fuck. <laughs> well, they weren't. I, I would say they were sketch, but they were definitely they were. You know, Garm was a spokesperson in the in the early scene. For sure. At no, I was point. saying, I'm wondering if they started to develop that sort of vibe that some of these guys are sketch as fuck. Like, you know, like, um, like, from my understanding, they just, they just kind of did, you know, they, they, they just wanted to move on. They wanted to yeah. do other things. They were, they were open minded. And at one point in uh, one interview, he said something along the lines of, I seek to be impeccable. <laughs> wow. And, and, and in order to do that, you've got to, you've got to transcend out of your. And you, walk. you said you have met him, right? A couple of times, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. He doesn't take a compliment very well. <laughs> no kidding, really. Wow. Yeah, no. So he doesn't uh, like fanboys much, then I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I just the second time I met him. So the but the, the two times I've met him were both at Roadburn. Oh and, right. And so the first time was in 2012 when Agaloc played, and the second and the second time was um, in 2017 when. Over did the assassination. They played it for the first time. Right, right, right. And I remember telling him because I watched them sound check, and I, it was just the way that they had the stage laid out and everything. It, it just reminded me of like Dead Can Dance or some, or Pink Floyd. Yeah, it, that, it was yeah. like an ensemble of musicians, and ensemble, it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I told him I was like, you know, at at the after their show, I was just like, mm -hmm. that was. I told him, you guys have eclipsed Coil. You guys have eclipsed, you know. Dead can dance, and he was just like, "Don't ever say that to me." <laughs> really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I kind of get that though. I, I do yeah. get it because you know how it is. You have your heroes, and he has his heroes, and he sure. doesn't want to. He doesn't want right. to hear that. You know what I mean? I, I totally get that. I, I, I appreciate that. And so, all right, let's jump into Vardnat. Let's let's get your take on Vardnat, and um, you're yeah. going to show your copy. So I'm gonna. I got, I got this version. I got I'm the blow you up. Yeah, I'm gonna blow you up. Got that. <laughs> Hold on one sec. All right, what happened? There we go. All right, I'm gonna blow you up, John. Oh, go yeah. ahead, dig, dig into it and give me your kind of oh, rundown yeah. of it. And real, real quick. Um, now, what's the seven inch though? What's on that? Is that all the material? Uh, no, no. Okay. It's uh, so it's one track from the demo, right? And it, and then it's a split with Mysticum. Oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah, it's. And it was released in 90, I think it was 94. Yeah. And what's that, who's that on? Self-release? It's like Necromantic Gallery or something. It was Well, was actually, here, I'll, I'll, let me run this down real quick. So the demo album released November 5th, 93, recorded October 15th through 17th, 93. Uh, the label, it just says independent. Um, and that, yeah, so I, I don't have any actual data on that. So probably you, you just said it. Yeah, it doesn't actually say what label, but I, I read somewhere it was like Necromantic Gallery or something. Like that. Okay. And then I also I also got this recently. Um, oh, the tape box. Yeah. Yeah, and what's interesting about this uh, is it was actually a gift from the label that put it out oh, because nice. they had contacted me uh, in 2022 because there's a book in there. Right. And they, they had contacted me to basically give a quote quotes. yeah mm -hmm. and and it, and they contacted me by my old facebook page which i never look at oh shit and so like several months later i had to log in to do some agalog facebook updates and Sorry. i see this i see this message uh, and you're like, like fuck 
Yeah. So I wrote him back and, and he, you know, by this time it was out. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, you know, I, I, I'm really sorry. I, I wish I could have been a part of that. Blah, blah, blah. And he was like, Hey, no worries. I'll just send you a copy. And I was like, Cool. Yeah, cause, uh, yeah, because that was like what about about a buck fifty, I think, or something, buck twenty five like maybe when it came out. Uh, yeah, and, and they're worth quite a bit more than that now. I guess so. I mean, this came out on a German label, it's, and it's just it's yeah, their Darkness. It's, what's it called? Something Darkness. It's Trolsk Sort Metal, nineteen ninety three to nineteen ninety seven. No, what's, the, what's the label though? What is it? Oh, the label that put yeah, this it's something out? Darkness or. Darkness descent. Yeah, or, dark dark shall rise or something. Yeah, darkness shall rise. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. yeah, I looked at that and I'll tell you the honest truth about it. I'm not a tape guy. I know. Me neither. I came through the tape years. I would probably never play that. That's no. the thing. No. So it's kind of like it's it's more of a collector's item, right? It's worth it for this. Oh yeah. Oh, the book. Yeah. Oh, that's that's another thing I forgot to pull out of my collection was the over book. But we can talk about you, that. You later. can get it then. When, you know, I'm yeah. gonna. But we'll it's got nice old foot. And the thing about it is, you know, this is the thing I loved about Over also is the photos back then. Yes. They did, they they were like well above avant garde. Well, they were, it was, they, 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 they did it in a sort of, prof, they had this professionalism to their, to their image that transcended a lot of other bands. Right. You never, you never saw them in court Spain because they probably never ever did it. Yeah. No, and they, you know, and it's like, and I really love the style that they showed off. You know, they had, they kind of kept the mystery going because you didn't always. It was very rare when you'd see all of them together. Right. It was just like a couple of them, yep. or individual pictures, or the picture of them with a the car. Yeah, or, other than Garm, you didn't really know who the other dudes really kind of were. Right. Right. For the most part, right? And I'm not even sure that he was super happy with being the focal point. Um, probably but, knowing him, probably not. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, okay. Give me your give me your thoughts on Vargnat then. I'm curious to hear this. Well, it's good. It's it. I, I I understand where Shane was coming from. It's it's definitely. I mean, the best track is that classical track. Uh, right. Which what are, what the fuck is it called? Uh, <laughs> uh, Trollskogen. Yeah, Trollskogen. That's forecasting. It, it really was. Segment. You know, and, and that you can tell. That, I mean, and like the song uh, "Ulver Ritonin's Camp," right? I think that song yeah. is the one that's on the seven inch. That's a great track. It's I got mean, the like, beginning of that to me it sounds like a Fate's Warning or Dream Dream right? Theater intro. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's like it's like clean tone guitar. Oh yeah, it's like a fucking a prog intro, or like a Fate's Warning intro, right? Yeah, in a way. So you know, it's. It, it was it's it was a very interesting demo, you know for sure. Especially back in 1993, when, you know, back then we used to call it Norse core, where it was just you know every band just was just like, you know, uh, yeah, 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 um, or like you know, Bur they all wanted to sound like Dark Throne or Burzum or you know, Mayhem, and so it was a re it was refreshing to see this band do so you know them and in the woods as well, mm -hmm. doing something that was just kind of out there and doing their own thing is very individualist and i i really appreciated that about them yeah i um i think for a demo it's pretty advanced now the sound is what is what it is who knows if they did it on a four track or eight track or probably a four track i'm guessing um it's, to me it sounds like an eight track it could be it, yeah. it very well could be yeah because <clears throat> that would have been around that time when they started to be more widely available um we're still yeah. We're still pre aid that we're still actually bouncing tracks at that point but yeah it very well could be um and there's i think there's a kind of for a bunch of young dudes that are 15, 17 18 19 there's kind of a incredibly developed sense of sophistication yes and that's what i was getting at with the photos especially about the drumming it's not on time all the time but it's there's some really tasty almost like jazz like fills and the fills are kind of and you're a drummer so you can tell better than i but well he that the drummer on on the demo is actually shrawl who ended up being in vedbuen zenda and virus okay and, yeah yeah it was talking about uh i love it with, in the woods and over right right um yeah so another couple quick uh notes here um 
the but you know the buzz saw one of the guitars is very black metal but somehow it sounds elevated especially given that what they're kind of playing sometimes is quite proggy actually yeah I was totally kind of surprised by this i was like what the fuck is this this almost sounds like a prog band like you know? there's a which, which track is it? I think it's I think it's in Tragedy and Throne. It has that breakdown where it's like down, down, bam, bam, bam. Okay, do, do. all right. I was just gonna say, yeah. like, and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I was just gonna say, um, their playing is rather proggy and advanced. In the beginning of Tragedians, or however you say it, it could have come off a of discipline here at King Crimson. Right. I hear, I hear those those really like sort of clean. You know, uh, intervallic things that they're doing. It's like, whoa, yeah. this is way advanced. You know, and then they're and then they're blending that with classical guitar, it's right? Just, or or black metal or black metal too. Then, right? Well, so, that, that particular part I'm talking about that that weird sort of proggy bouncy, yeah. Bow, 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 yeah that. But part. but it is amateurish. I mean, the timekeeping is somewhat amateurish. You hear, you kind of hear where it's kind of lagging and dragging, and you know, the, it's not it's not great, right? Well, um, and and the other thing that I thought was really funny about that demo is there's a cowbell on it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and he's at times he's almost using it like a ride symbol. It's just like, like a ride symbol. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the vocals, the some of the vocals on like on the song Natin's Madrigal, the vocals are he's like. Well, okay. So all right. So you brought it up. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna go to the part of this demo that I do not like at all. I love all. that. I do not like Garm's vocals on this thing at all. I could not get into. That. The truly and the vocals during the and the vocals in Trollskagen, where he's just like, <sighs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I just could not get into him, dude. I'm it's sorry. very theatrical. Um, but the music, however, to my ears, sounds quite advanced and experimental, and they grasp the progressive edge of things, and they're quite daring. Um, take the drumming in tragedians; it's it's really inventive. Not just blast beats for days, far more jazzy in a way. Mm -hmm. Uh, the instrumental troll, I, I'm gonna butcher these things, so I'm just gonna say troll slogan is forecasting Feldsanger, uh, beautifully. Some of the and that's uh, our buddy that you know checked in with me on my post, uh, Havard Jorg yeah. Jorgensen. We tried to get him, but he didn't, he didn't get back to me. Havard, if it's you're watching this, contact me, check your DMs, please, sir. Yeah, uh, but it's it's 4 a.m. in Norway, right? I know, I know. <laughs> He's a rock star, though. Those dudes stay up at all kind of weird hours. Anyway, um, yeah, so, uh, oh, but here's the best part. Avar, don't be mad at me. Don't be mad, but I have to call you out or whoever was doing this. So we get to, uh, in, in that song, Troll of Skogan, there's absolutely a big whiff of wanted dead or alive. I'm sorry, it's there. Do 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 It's there. Go back and listen to it. Check it out. It's there. It's there. You know what I'm talking about? No, I don't. The descending figure. The oh, the ding 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 ding. That part? No, it's the fucking John. It's. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this well, but it's. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to catch that. Oh yeah, it's yeah. in there, man. It's there. Um, it probably wasn't intentional. <laughs> I doubt it, but I mean, because I can't imagine. I can't imagine that, that they didn't hear that song. We all heard it back in the day. Unfortunately, I mean. Like, I mean, for to be fair, there is a part in Agalox discography that totally unconsciously is a Def Leppard riff, and I'm not going to tell you where it is. <laughs> okay, what song? No. Oh, yeah. What album? Tell Folklore. Okay. I'll find it. Trust me. I'll find it. I can hear those things. I'm sorry. I remember we were we, when we were listening back to Pale Folklore when it was done and out. And is Don it? Hold like, on. Hold on. Don, is, and Don was like, is that Def Leppard? And I'm like, is, oh, is it? <laughs> is it off the first album? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. It's on, no, it's on. It's actually on Pyromania. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say. I wondered if it was uh, uh, wasted. Okay. okay, I'll go ahead and tell you. It's the intro to Melancholy Spirit. That that clean tone, slow. What's it? What's it ripping off? What's it ripping off? What song? Uh, Die Hard the Hunter. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't even think about it because I love that record. Oh, I do too, man. Yeah, it's like 
I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say I'm not a Def Leppard fan, but although that's not my favorite, my favorite's the one before. That. I ain't right. I, that's yeah, my of favorite. course. That's 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 but, the jam. So real quick here, wrapping up the be beginning of. I'm not even gonna try. Ubermentus Cop is awesome. Could be a face warning of Dream Theater intro. Then the black metal uh, vocals kick in, and, and it's the very much the. Um, oh, and then Natan's Magical is a killer, dark, spooky track. It's really spooky, man. Well, that's got but, those vocals. But Garm fucking kills that song for me, man, because I just cannot get into his vocals. Believe me, it gets better. I trust me. I love this guy, but I just didn't love him here. That was the um, one, that was the one song I actually was like, okay, this is pretty cool. He's doing something really out there, and I appreciated that. Well, I will say this: in wrapping it up, I give this a seven out of ten. I'm gonna. You don't have to do this. I'm gonna rank my albums with a number, just because I it's habit and I just do it. But I would honestly give this a seven out of ten. I've heard a lot of other demos that pale in comparison to this. So. And I think the stand the thing the thing, thing that stands out to me is there's the level of complexity in this thing is mm -hmm. pretty elevated for a bunch of young dudes like that, right? Yeah. And you could tell this was not just a bunch of dudes getting together, getting fucking wasted and just shitting out bar chords and power chords. They were they were they were really thinking about the music that they were creating and and they were were really driving towards something, I think. And yeah, you know, obviously rig or garn has always been sort of the leader of this thing, but he had a lot of guys in line with him when the band was more a band in the beginning that they all had a creative vision that seemed very focused. I well, and, that, and it's really rare to see that level of folk of, of completeness in a, in a demo at that stage, because right. it's not like they were around for, you know, I mean, they, they formed, they formed in what? 92? 93, I, 90, 92, 92 or 93. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, you know, and they had like a rehearsal. Uh, yeah. They had a rehearsal and then they had this demo. And it was like they didn't have like a bunch of demos that led up to this sound. It was like this was how they were out the gate, you know. Right and, out of the gate. And actually it says in Wikipedia, and we all know Wikipedia doesn't lie, but uh 1993 they they were founded. So who knows what they were doing prior to that? It was probably a bunch of different interchangeable mm -hmm. guys coming and going while they were jamming. But I mean, you know, as a band leader not necessarily leader leader because it's the three of you guys but you know when you founded agalock and started it your vision was kind of the thing and you you had to connect with other guys that had that same vision or it wouldn't have driven the way that it went i think yeah and you know honestly you know it it, it also impresses me that he was able to wrangle together so many talented musicians. talented dudes so yeah. Because I mean, the line is completely different on the first album, just a year later. Right. Let's jump into that. Let's jump into the first album here. Um, we got Bergtat, which is translated to Spellbound, a fairy tale in five chapters. Yes. Debut studio album by Norwegian. Uh, yeah, all right. Issued on in February 1995 via Head Not Found. The album was recorded at Endless Lid Studio in Oslo in November and December of 94 with Christian Romsa. Romsa? I don't know. As engineer and co-producer, I apologize to any of these guys that might see this and be uh, upset at my Norwegian. It's not, it's not existing. So, um, and so we got, and I'm sure you have a bunch of stuff here to show. So I'll blow you up again, and then we'll go back to. Uh, well, not really. I just have, I just have the the trilogy, and. Oh, you have the so you don't have the actual individual. Album. No, I do. Oh, okay. Um, I have a couple of things I want to let's see. Oh yeah, so I got yeah, I've got the the, the original CD. But I got ninety six, I guess, when it came out, and then right. I got, yeah, and then I bought. Obviously, there's this, the picture disc. Well, not, yeah, right. I got in ninety eight, I think. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't buy the the reissue vinyl uh, stuff that they, that was released by Century Media later. I just. Well, uh, it's just another cash in for the most part. I mean. Yeah, I you know I did, I I should pick up Natan's Magical though because that version was remastered and you can actually hear the bass oh okay and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the bass oh so. yeah 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 actually that's another good thing to talk about like there's the bass you really hear uh, it, it's it's a pretty good driving <laughs> force in the album man. you, you really hear yeah. it moving things forward right so there's my head not found original yep yep um which i got like i said 99 or so um <laughs> Yep. Go ahead and jump into this one and talk about it uh, from your perspective of 
you know, how, what you, what you want to say about it. Keltzinger? Yeah. Uh, no, we're on bird time. Oh, we're still on bird time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, I kind of said what I had to say. I mean, it blew my mind. And I remember thinking when I heard it, I was, I was kind of in between, not really trying, not really knowing what I wanted to do musically. I knew I wanted to do something atmospheric and dark, but I, I, I just didn't have the right, you know, influences. I mean, up until this point, my, my black metal references were Bathory, Beharit, Blasphemy, Bad, Muslim, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I was just starting to get into like Emperor, which was a little too keyboardy for me. Um, Mayhem, which honestly, my first, my first, the th first thing I heard from Mayhem was Death Crush. And I was like, this is black metal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, and I, you know, I liked Hellhammer, that, that stuff that, you know, pre Celtic Frost. Sure. But this was like, you know, 94. Five was were you much of a merciful fate and venom fan? I mean, I don't consider yeah. it a black metal, but well, I mean, I would say that that venom is black metal, but um, are they or are they just kind of like a really speedy the, motorhead? Well, yeah, but I mean, they they were they were the sort of pr pr the I think imagery wise and the whole the whole ambiance of everything. I always look at Bathory's first album as the, first the way black I see metal. it. The way I see it, if it wasn't for Venom, these other bands wouldn't exist as a they good are. Choice. That's a good point. They may not have been able to parlay and, what they were doing into something. Yeah, everything has a lineage. Right. So it's like if it wasn't for Motorhead, Venom wouldn't be a band. Right. Really. Um, or or Tank or or, or Battery or, or Battery. Battery. Because Battery is yeah. whether you it is black and it's dark, but it's also very <laughs> Motorhead too. Yeah. And you know, and if Lemmy wasn't in Hawkwind <laughs> or wasn't kicked out of Hawkwind. Motorhead. Yeah, motorhead, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything happens for a reason, right. I think. Right. Um, Any and I, standout tracks for you that really speak to you as far as uh, well, the second track, man? Um, Solangar Bag Osnid. That has that that chorus where it's like where the it's it starts off with the flute and then it goes into the black metal part, and then that chorus hits, and I'm just like, oh fuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, I really like the last song. Um, the Bergtod in I feel it's Cameroon, uh, but uh, I need I need my friend from Panopticon here because he speaks Norwegian. <laughs> uh, you talking about um, Austin? Austin, yeah, yeah, yeah. He does. He yeah. likes to flaunt that. I know Austin really well. <laughs> I, I know him very well. We've done, in fact, Austin and I did a deep dive on King's X. Oh, okay. Deep, deep dive on King's X. Yeah. And I uh, wish. I wish Havard did join us because I would ask him what the fuck is what up with this photo of the oh base part. Yeah, it's not like a bone, like a meat. I don't thing? know what it is, and I always wanted to know. It was it so like a like a meat thing or something. It's like he's yeah, he's like he's just he's just studying this <laughs> thing. You know, it's funny you brought up Austin, man, because I was actually gonna I was actually gonna hit him up a couple days ago, and I thought you know he would probably love to be involved in this, but. It, it, it's hard to get him to nail that nail down on stuff. I don't know if you know he just put that new album out. And yeah, he's know. he's super busy. And actually, I was trying to get um, Charlie from Panopticon to play violin on my my next solo record, and he's just too busy. So oh really? Yeah. So I'm still up in the air on that. <laughs> oh crap, that sucks. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I'll throw a few things out there. Um, it's notable in that the lyrical uh, content deviates substantially from that of the, the second wave black metal albums. While it is heavily rooted in Norwegian folklore, it features no anti-Christian themes. <clears throat> Unlike the music of many of Uga's contemporaries, particularly Burzum, uh, Burzum, I gotta say it like uh, Mark says it, Burzum and uh, Dark Throne. <laughs> Have you met that guy? No. Okay, all right. Um, the opening track, uh, Ah, uh, Capital Throws, Log V, whatever. Just sounds majestic, like something you'd play while riding off into battle yeah. or while and, climbing <laughs> an unclimbable mountain peak, you know? Well, and here's another thing, and I don't know if you've heard of this band, uh, Back Dis If Yell. No. So this this came out around the same time as Berg Tut, and I'm wondering if they were influenced by Berg, by, by Over or if it was the other way the other around. The other way around, yeah. Because it's very similar. It's got okay. that same kind of flow and those same kind of vocals. And the drummer of this band ended up going on to be the singer of Valdruna. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then, that see, that would have been, you know, I will tell you that if I can get Havard to come on, I'm going to call you. I want you to join us because I think that would be 
super cool, man, to have someone like you that's kind of been there, done that quite a bit, and, and, and met some of these guys to talk about that stuff. It would have been great to have him. I, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, but I know if you see this, please reach out to me. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. Um, so we got that epic, majestic. Garm sounds amazing on that, almost operatic. Gregorian chant-like vocals are soaring. Uh, he definitely honed it in. Really oh, well. for sure. Um, and I like the fact that his vocals don't overtake the music. They, they kind of they kind of mesh very well. And I love that guitar tone, man. I'd love to know what <laughs> Havard is using because it's almost like a it's it's not it's pretty dry overall, but it just has this really fat tone to it. Um, I think he was using a Les Paul. Right, but I'm wondering what effects he was using. Huh? I, there, I was wondering what effects he's using because I don't hear a lot of delay. I don't hear a lot of chorus, but I hear this fatness, a lot of compression, I think, to the yeah. to the notes. And it just sounds – it also sounds like it's multi-track many times, but it probably isn't. Double that probably most, not. and probably not even that. You know? And it probably also depends on what Aismol was playing, too. I mean, the other guitar. Right, 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 right. Uh, <clears throat> so the end of this song is epic, and I hear how this could have influenced Agalot. That song in particular, I really hear it a lot. Uh, I, that's just my opinion. You're probably like going, what? You know, but yeah. I hear. It. Yeah, a lot of people say that. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. The, uh, yeah, where were we at there? Uh, lots of acoustic intros, interludes. Garn's black metal vo vocals rage hard amongst his soaring choral vocal arrangements, which are all over the. I mean, those are really stunning things when he's doing the da 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 da. You know, you hear almost. You really hear like where Bathory may have kind of been listening but i guess well i no, guess battery, or he was before was so I'm, I, that's right so i'm wondering if the other they way were around. trying to take in yeah that, that right that they were taking some of that influence um the gray eyes watch i guess i tried to pull some of the english out pretty unrelenting savage is that the second song gray um, eyes watch well it's, that doesn't have the uh, solen gar bagas need I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. That the chorus of that track, man. Mm. Hold on. I'm going to pull up. I have over up here. I want, to, I want to look at one thing because I don't know which song titles are in. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know what they translate to. And I think I took the, uh, the English obviously. So real quick here. Uh, here we go. All right, so you got um, Lost in the Dark Forest is the first one. Uh, the Sun Goes Down Behind the Hills, that's number two. And then uh, Gray Eyes Watch, or Closing, that's the third track. Um, yeah, that's a weird one because it's, it's it feels like it's two songs. I mean, the two songs are kind of connected by that 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 sample of the girl walking through the... Right, the, wa the, the, the walking thing, right. Which, 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 which Agalog did rip off. We, no, you did rip that off. Yes, I know. I know. Well, we, we did it different. It's like, well, we're going to have somebody walking in the snow. So I put Pale Folklore, right? Pale Folklore? Uh, no, oh, the Vanna. Vanna. Oh, the Vanna. The Vanna. Yeah, the second one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My bad. I, I, I know your discography, but I, I goofed. I wanted to say Pale Folklore. Well, um, and it's funny because the person who, who recorded that for me was my, my oldest friend, Aaron. And I asked him, I remember asking him, I was like, hey, would you like to walk from one side of our album to the other? And he's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, no, 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 just, just, just record you walking in the snow, and we're right. gonna pan it. And you're gonna pan it, yeah. And so he's yeah. like, <laughs> cool. Why not? Um, so the guitars on a voice is calling, which is the the fourth track, um, sound very Blue Dust Nordish, in fact. And that Blue Dust Nordish first album came out in '95 too, but it came out a little before this. So uh, you know, they may have been. You know, that's he's a yeah. French guy. I don't I don't know how adept they were with the international scene. I mean, I don't know. I know that they were I know that the one thing I do know is that they were they were paying attention to a lot of non metal stuff. And they're sure this from non metal stuff. Way more than a lot of the other dudes. Although, yeah. you know, the, the the you've heard this I'm sure, the uh the old wives tale is that when Euronymous was killed, he had Zeit on his turntable. I don't yeah, sure well, he, was, he was way into that stuff. He oh, was yeah, into, yeah, yeah. He was into Tangerine Dream. I know he was into like stuff like software, you know. Yeah. And so was Varg. All so. right. So real quick, I'll wrap here because I know I I don't think we're gonna make the two hour mark, dude. Yeah. 
whatever. All right. I'll, 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 the check's in the mail, I promise. Um, I'll buy I'll buy some more merch, I promise. Uh, so then uh, the track ends with that acoustic and garment whispering and utilizing these multi-track vocals, complete with female backing vocals, and the harmonies to great effect. Spellbound, open, Spellbound is the last song, opens savagely and dances into acoustic nylon sections that elicit sadness and also have slight Latin flavors. There's a little bit of a Latin flavor to the... Uh, of artists playing on those, um, which is kind of cool. Um, while I can't pick a specific track is a highlight over others, this album has an almost calming and soothing cinematic scope to it for me. Uh, it just feels like I'm watching a movie unfold as I listen to it. And the, the acoustic um, track? No, no, no. The whole album has oh, a yeah, cinematic yeah, okay. flow to yeah. it. Like it just, and not only that. Like if you listen to the album and you look at the artwork, it's just so evocative of that artwork. It's like mm -hmm. you feel like you're immersing yourself in that yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah and they nailed it they did yeah. they, they totally nailed it so um um and i would love to i would love to know that the story behind that artwork was it was it something that tanya just had that garm saw or was it something that they had commissioned based on i i you know i would love to know that and i would love to know who has that artwork is does garm have it in his studio yeah. does, does tanya still have it in in her possession you know yeah know. we'll have to if we can get one, I, I don't think I'd ever be able to get Garm to come on my show. But I mean, if we get our, bar, our Bard on, I'm, I'm going to ask. We'll get. We'll ask him those questions. So, yeah. uh, real quick. Um, Stupidly, I never asked him when I met him. Well, you, yeah. you know, sometimes you know how it is. You, you kind of feel a little overwhelmed. Like, yeah, the last time I talked to him, we just nerded out on Talk Talk for a while. Yeah. So. yeah. Oh well, yeah. Who wouldn't? Um, I'm surprised we didn't go with that band, but I'm glad we went with this band because. Talk, talk, maybe down the road someday if you come back. So, um, so yeah, it, to be honest with you, this is a nine and a half out of ten for me. I, I love this album. I listened to it four times in prep for this. I kind of probably should have focused on one or two of the later albums a little bit more. But I just was like, it was like, it was like reacquainting myself with an old friend listening to this album. It was like, this is the album. To be honest with you, John, that's the album that set me up to get into you guys. Okay. Uh, because you guys probably. I'm not kissing your ass or blowing smoke here. I'm being honest. You guys probably were the second band in, from the black metal genre or the folky black, whatever you want to be termed, dark metal, like you like to call it. You guys were probably the second band I got into yeah. as a result of Brickdown. <clears throat> Weird. Because yeah. um, I think I read a review, a review or an interview with you and Don or something, and you guys were mentioning this album quite a bit. And I was like, oh, well, there you go. Um, so I think I think Agaloc was one of the first U.S. bands to take that in, influence and run with. Oh, it. absolutely, no yeah. doubt, dude, no doubt. I completely agree with you on that. So, um, yeah, like Enslaved, this band seemed that they were a few steps ahead of the crowd already yeah. with this album, and yeah. I, I don't know how to put it into better term, words than that. They just seemed, <clears throat> even with their demo we talked about, they were they were ahead of the crowd. So yeah, um, I would I would say uh, yeah, let's move on. Let's move on to. Sanger, Sanger. Sanger. I don't have much to say about it. Um, I just, I was, so I was in contact with um, Luxi Lottinen. He was a, I think he was a promoter and he, he wrote for Istin magazine, I think. And he, he painted the, the original artwork for the first sentenced album. Okay, yeah. Oh yeah. I love that. Album. I was friends with him, um, you know, pen pals. And he, I remember him writing me and saying, hey, I know you like that band, Oliver. They just put out their new album, Keldsinger. And I was like, holy shit, it's been like less than a year. Right, <laughs> At least right. I don't like it, you know? And so I ordered it from a distro and and, and he was like, it's very different than what, than Bergtot. And I'm like, okay. And I, I was surprised. I was like, holy shit, it's all acoustic. Yeah. Like, Which you probably like because you like acoustic stuff, right? Well, yeah. I like the Neil Folk stuff right. back then even. So, sure. you know, I, well, I like Sol Evictus and death in June, you know, those kind of bands, but sure. Kelsinger was actually, I would say the the style of guitar playing was closer to current 93 and that right. it was very, yeah. You know, it was more finger picked, finger you know, pick, nylon string almost. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like very folk like where you're doing a lot of pedal tones and yeah. your bass, your bass it's, line a, it, it, it's a cool record. It's not my favorite over actually the song, the best song from that era was on this comp. Oh really? Yeah, it's souvenirs from Hell Comp. It's got um, a track called Sinan. Sinan. I've never heard it. 
and it's I think it's from that that session. Okay, it sounds like it anyway. Yeah, I've never seen that cop either. So yeah, I'm, it's incredible. It's like th that song should have been on Killzinger, you know. But well, for me, <laughs> you know, what's really remarkable is that they had the balls to go. Yeah, we put a lot of acoustic on our first album, but we also had screams and we had. There's no, there's no death metal. There, or excuse me. There's no black metal scene. There's a lot of multi-layered, you know, big epic sort of chorals arrangements that Garm you really start to see. If you didn't get it from the first album, you start you really see it on this album. Yeah. What an incredible singer he is, right? Right, uh, right. What kind of you know he can he can do all these different dynamics to his voice that a lot of people just can't do. Um, and, and you know, he can go from almost operatic on a lot of these tracks to more of a plaintive sort of you know emotive vocal, and then he can do the, the black metal stuff like nobody's business soon. You know, we're gonna find out. Um, I like the whole album. I really, you know, I'm a finger style player a lot of the time. I love playing my acoustic. I probably like you, I probably play my acoustic. I'm, I'm speaking for you, I shouldn't. I probably play my acoustic nine times more than I play my electrics. Uh, I feel a lot more expressive with acoustic. <clears throat> I find I come up with neat, cooler sounding chordal arrangements when I don't have distortion involved. So, I mean, like when I write, I write almost exclusively on, a, on an acoustic. Um, and these tracks really speak to me. Do they get a little bit samey? Maybe a tiny little bit. I mean, yeah. maybe just a little. But well, I heard that they had actually written the Natten's Magical album like after bird Top. okay and their drummer eric went off to the he had to do his military service and while he was gone they did the keldsinger record like i don't know if it was actually planned for them to have a trilogy or if it was just a just it, happenstance it just happened yeah, yeah it happened yeah, yeah. because of circumstances well that and also that was the era that was the time frame when all that black metal that second wave black metal was kind of hitting mm -hmm. the Market and Kerrang was already talking about it. The you know the bar Euronymous cover and all that stuff like that. So maybe they were just maybe Garm was savvy to know that maybe we need to do this quick just to get everybody to know who we are a little bit more, and then we can just fucking walk away completely from but it. But it, but it's cool that you know it's it's cool that it worked out the way it did because I think they recorded Natans when when Eric came back, right? That, that was in like ninety seven or something. Anyway, um, what was I going to say? Oh, so, yeah. So I've had a theory about Ulver this whole time. Okay. Is that they were never really truly a black metal band. In fact, they were never really truly a metal band. They have always been, from day one, an experimental band. Yes. Now. Which means you can't they're... really pigeonhole them or genre fight. Yeah, and whether, yeah. so whether they're experimenting within this genre or, you know, industrial music yeah. or yep. soundscape music or whatever. Yep. They're an experimental band that just goes and they they dip their toes in different things. Yeah, they and follow they their muse. So, yeah, and they go and they do it and they kill it. They be, they they'll make two black metal albums that are amongst the best black metal albums ever recorded. Right, 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 you right, know? right, right. So I, I do I do really love this this album because it's well, it's pretty short. I think it's it's 36 30, minutes. 35 minutes, 35, 29. Uh, I really love this song. Uh Kvel Inatans Farger, clad in colors of the night. I love the playing on it. It's such a cool, it's just a really cool pattern that he's playing there. And the, the melody lines are beautiful. Um, I like, um, I really like. Um, Olves Black. I like that song a lot. Which one? Olves Black, the, the final track. Oh, yeah, yeah. The final track is really, really cool. That's the kind of epic song on the album. Um, I do like. Um, uh, the one before that, which is, I'm not even going to try that one, man. Drowsiness in the Fairy Mound. So, yes, they do. You could lay, you could argue you're, that. Hey, you're kind of roboting out here, dude. <laughs> am I really? Yeah, you're you're glitchy. What the fuck? <clears throat> just now? Yeah, you were, whatever you were saying just a minute ago, you were just like. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, I moved, I moved the table that I'm on. I have a movable oh. table. Might have missed the uh, MRI now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just saying. Just, yeah. just calm down. <laughs> right. This album does probably. It's probably a little, too one dimensional maybe, ever yeah. so slightly. 
Yeah. But it's still a very, very pleasant listen. It's a great nighttime record to throw on while you're making dinner. or yeah, It's just what? a cool... So me and Don went to a signing back in 1990, I think it was eight, 1998, when the book Lords of Chaos came out. Right. And Michael Moynihan was living in Portland and he did a signing. And so my, my copy is signed by Michael Moynihan. But it, during that signing, they were playing Keldsinger just on repeat. Yeah. And they had like- a good, That's a good vibe for it, right? It was like you had that bookstore vibe. It was like, yeah. It's it interesting because uh, Garm, remarks that Feldsanger was an immature attempt at making a classical album, like a Baroque type album. Yeah. Um, yet he felt the content was strong when it, when it, at the time, and that the other band members at the time, based on their age, their ages, that they were pretty <clears throat> young. And I, again, you're now talking, these guys are 20, 21, maybe. Um, yeah, well, they're basically my age. Yeah. And, and it's like, that's pretty fucking good playing, first of all. Bavard's oh, yeah. a good guitar player, right? One. And two, just the balls to say, yeah, we're not going to do a black metal album. Now we're going to do something completely different, like a broke. Well, it was still within the ballpark of the atmosphere, though. Yeah, true. The yeah. balls came later. <laughs> yeah, true, true, true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not far away, though. Not far away. So, no. um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to put into to, – words how kind of radical for the genre this album was though based on where they were at about where people knew them as from their first album and the demo. Very say again it was very influential on yeah other bands like imperium and sure a lot yeah, of yeah. Metal bands that followed but it, they just they weren't like most of the contemporaries that's really the bottom line as no. you said they were experimental where a lot of those other bands were like well we gotta well, sound like mayhem or we gotta sound like the only other band I would say that I'm well aware of, you may know many more. I'm sure you do. The only other band I think that kind of it was like Uber was enslaved, except for they didn't take it to the extreme. I'd, say, rid of, I'd say Beyond Dawn was was probably. I don't know. I don't know them. So yeah. And, and in the woods, they didn't go as radical as as Uber, but they definitely changed styles with each sure. album. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> um. We have to point out this seems to be a, a, a huge I feel pretty strongly this album had to be a huge creative engine for Avar. He had to have been for, really for, instrumental oh, in writing for, this. For Garm? Or? No, for Avar. Oh, from from Burzum? No, no. This album, Feldsanger, had to be a lot of the creative input had to have come from Havar. Oh Havar. Uh, yeah, Havar. Yeah. Yeah, Havar uh, of the yeah, of the, yeah, the yeah, play. I, uh, he had to have been yeah. A pretty major figure and going, hey guys, I got all these cool acoustic things. Yeah. Why don't we do something with them? You know, right? Because if you listen to his solo material, it's mm -hmm. very evocative of this. A little more complex, obviously, but um, yeah. And his playing, and his playing goes through that whole first era since the demo, all the way through. You know, Nottons. Actually, he's in. He's on the the the, the Blake album too, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so what, what kind of I uh, what did I give that? I gave that a. I gave that a nine out of 10. That's how much I like that album. So that's just me. I give it a seven. I just really enjoy it. It does something to kind of center me a little bit. I, it's not, there's not a lot of albums that do that. Michael Hedges does that for me. There's, you know, there's, there's a, and usually it's an acoustic thing, but um, so we got, um, I just wanted to check one thing. Hang on. Oh, actually I did have a, one other quick note on this. So the opener of East of the sun, West of the moon, Man, that opener is just, it's staggeringly beautiful, those oh, yeah. note choices, man. Yeah. Um, and then, again, it's that kind of, those vocal harmonies and chant like vocals that sound like you're, like you're climbing a mountaintop and you're just reaching that, that apex, that, 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 that summit. You know, you're there and it's like you're just washed over by that kind of stuff. So, um, but anyways, following the success of their first two albums, Ulve signed with German label Century Media. But the third album, Nantes Madrigal, issued in March of 1997, marking the band's international debut. The album showcased a, showcases a black metal style similar to Bergdot, except they're abandoning the acoustic and atmospheric elements of Feldsanger with an intensely underproduced sound. The album has been described as raw and grim black metal at its blackest. The common myth about the album is that the band spent the recording budget on Armani suits, cocaine, and a Corvette. I mean, why wouldn't you, right? I would. 
happens to me. I don't know. Um, Ring, however, has stated that this is not true as a fairy tale, possibly a rumor started by Century Media. Uh, the album has been described as so fast and furious and the vocals so scathing that it's best just to take in the sheer sonic force as reflecting the band's concept rather than trying to piece it all together. So all right, I know you probably have a lot to say about this one. Um, well, it's funny. So yeah, it, CD. I got, you know, and a part of the trilogy as well. I also have, um, I have another version of, of this somewhere. <laughs> oh, shit. Right here. What? I, I bounced you out. I went to hit solo oh. and I hit remove. There we go. Go ahead. So yeah, I was on this. This was the first vinyl edition of it after oh, nice. the trilogy. This, this came out on uh, Listenable, or no, Displeased Records. Did they uh, come out on Century Media Black? Well, it's Century Media. It was licensed to listen. Oh, they licensed it. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. So this was, I think this was the first like standalone version of it on vinyl. Uh, yeah, that inside's kind of wild. The inside uh, pictures are pretty well, trippy. Right? I love, yeah. What is up with Aismo, man? Yeah. <laughs> he looks like a little girl. Yeah, it's <laughs> weird, dude. That's the weirdest you're ever going to see them look, really. But. Yeah, I mean... I remember looking at that that picture and going, "What the fuck? He looks like a little fairy or something." Like yeah, it looks like. Well, it kind of looks a little like Mortise. In a, a way, bit, yeah, yeah. a little bit. Um, so what? What's your what's your take on this? Because I might have a little bit slightly different take than you on this one. So, I was living. So nah, that, I have yeah, yeah. So when I, I was living in New Hampshire when that came out, and Don wrote me and he sent me a promo that he got from century media the little the little sleeve you know version right yeah and he was like hey the new over just came out i think you're going to be surprised by it. it he says something along the lines of you're, you're going to be surprised at the amount of a of clean vocals and acoustic guitars are on it ah uh, <laughs> so i put it on and i thought it was a mastering mistake i was like yeah oh, that's that's unfortunate they they must have fucked up the mastering yeah because it sounds like it's like down a fucking tube like down right. a like a, a you know like they recorded it like from about eight thousand feet away right right so you know i just kind of wrote it off as like oh well i can tell it's good i should just buy it when it comes out because I'm, I'm i'm sure they'll fix the problem right 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 <laughs> i had no idea and then i bought it and it was the same fucking sound and i was like and then i found out later that they, it was intentionally this way and i was just like okay <laughs> why you know because it's like you can't hear the drums really yeah Barely. Nice. It's just it's staticky. Yeah, it's scathing it, guitars that are just like almost sound sped up, and then you've got Garm kind of just yeah going but, insane on it. Right, but it's the most beautiful music, you know. And that's in a way it's similar. Yeah, I think they were trying to do like a Dark Throne sort of thing where it was like you know you've got yeah. this beautiful music, but it's just layered and just muck and dirt and yeah, it's got that. Um, a little bit of blaze, but I hear more like uh, Panzerfaust or um, Transvanian. Yeah, more yeah. Like just For totally, sure. totally raw and fucking just horrible. You right. Know? But really great. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. I, and so I, after, and, and of course, after hearing it after, you know, Bergtod and Kelsinger, I was just like, okay, this is brilliant. That they yeah. did this on purpose. This is brilliant. Yeah. These guys are once again tricksters. They're, yeah, doing your thing. They're, and that's they're, what De Devin says here. He's like, it seems like the order of these first three albums is out of order. Yeah, it does. Right. It's weird. Like, it doesn't seem like it should have gone that way, especially when we get to the next one we're going to talk about in a minute here. Um, yeah. I don't know Nagura Bund. I know the name, but I don't know. I'm sure John does. I was interviewed by the by a vocalist from that band when I was in Romania, but yeah. I'm not a big fan of Nagura Bund. Like, aren't they Romanian? Romanian, yeah. right? Yeah. They're like real almost like tribal at times they're, well their their live shows were cool they'd have those huge horns and stuff yeah and very but as far as listening to them on music or on an album is eh. yeah i haven't i, I haven't listened ever, to them yeah. i'm the same way i haven't they never grabbed me much so yeah. um um any uh particular songs you want to highlight there? yeah um i think it's track is it track six uh i think it's Track six is uh, six. Wolf and Passion. Is that the one? I, I mine, mine. Oh, yeah. Wait. Mine just has the. Mine doesn't have titles. It's just. 
Yeah, they're all hymns, but they there are subtitles to yeah. them in English. Then it's the one that starts off. It's the one that starts off with that gorgeous guitar. That's it's like. Da, da, da. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. That song rules. And in fact, so when Agaloc, uh played Maryland Death Fest in 2014, we actually replaced Over, who canceled. And we had had a thought on the plane, wow. <laughs> so that we should like at the very end of our set do something do, of theirs. Do the feedback and then go tss, tss, da, da, and play that ah. that beginning and then you know then say good night or something. But, but we never. Did. Yeah, doing it. Oh, okay. We never got a chance to like try it out and rehearse it. We just oh. we thought, this would be a funny idea, you know. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. Well, how were you guys? Where where were you at on the the bill for that? You were pretty high up, right? Yeah, we were right opposite of at the gates. Okay, yeah. And while we were playing, at the gates were setting up, and they were the head. Right. Oh, okay, yeah. So you were like just under the yeah, bill, bill under yeah. that. Uh, anything else you want to say on that one there? No, I mean. You know, it's a solid record. It's it's an interesting kind of, I don't know, it, it, it ends the trilogy really well. Because, you know, the cool thing about it is whether this was planned or not, it's a brilliant way to have a trilogy. You've got the first album that encompasses everything. Mm -hmm. You've got the second album that encompasses a, a certain atmospheric element of it. Element, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this third album that has the the, car, the, the carnal element. Yeah, the... the, the the true black metal it's Vitri like the vitriolic part of yeah, black yeah. metal yeah yeah like if you were to merge keld singer and natins together you would have another album like bird top right exactly a little more a little more harsh but but right yeah yeah, yeah. um well one of the things that 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 rig said or Grimes said was that well first of all about the cocaine stuff he's like do you really have that much money no. to buy a black corvette no um people like have this weird vision of what bands like this got back in the days they didn't get monstrously gigantic you know amounts of money even though oh, the labels man. knew that this was a new thing they weren't going to give you five hundred thousand no. dollars or a hundred thousand dollars even probably you know no um they might have gotten 30 grand or something like that to do this maybe maybe and, uh, on the outside on the outside yeah. yeah well here's another thing so in in 2000 i was in la visiting the end records and at the time andreas was working for century media and okay. so i went to the century media office with with um andreas and i met i think his name was marco okay he was one of the one of the executives there and i asked him you know how what was it like when they got that master from over and i told him my story why i thought it was a mistake and all that <laughs> and he was just what like he, yeah. he was just like yeah we didn't know what to think of it we thought we thought it was a mistake too. Oh, it was a fuck up, yeah. And yeah. and then when they said that's how it is, they were like, "Uh, we don't know how to market this." So I'm wondering yeah. if that marketing came from them just not knowing what to do with this. Right. Yeah. 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 Um. So my comments on I'll, I'll, I'll get them to them quick here. Um. You know, Metal Injection had a cool thing about this. They said Kelly Sanger had no electric instruments. Nan's Magical had no acoustic instruments. Bird got had both acoustic and electric. It's like they spliced the elements from, like you said, from Bird Tot into two separate albums. And that's what it was. Well, it's you frustrating because there, there is a moment on the first song where there's a classical guitar. Just for a brief. Oh, yeah, you're right. There was and Agala kind of referenced that too on the mantle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, that, it does say that despite that, there is an acoustic interlude yeah. in the first track. Um, and then commenting on the rumors, uh, well, uh, I'm sorry. We didn't have anything to do with those rumors Rick said about the you know cocaine and stuff. The moment the big labels, this is important here, the moment the big labels picked up black metal, that was the beginning of the end of black metal as far yeah. as I could see it. Yeah. Because they started to exploit the genre by with, with stuff like that, as yeah. far as dumb sales pitches that took the heart out of what it meant, what it was. It became very banal, very processed, and very corporate. I'm not blaming Central yes. Media, but I definitely think that Nuns Magical be a big label was kind of an antagonistic move. They probably expected a pretty up bird top, you know, we didn't want to conform to any business model. We still don't. It mm -hmm. got into the mainstream and people became very adept at playing and producing professional records. As a result of that, it lost a lot of the magic that it held for me. Uh, like the mayhem them, like you said, like the mayhem them. I'm still very much like that. I'd rather listen to old lo-fi recordings and the perfect retro band, you know, so I was part of a, a different scene, a different vibe. 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and he said they, they composed it very quickly. And because I think we spent about a year on, they spent about a year on Kvelsanger. But this one looks like it was only like a couple of months. And that was finally released in 97. Um, so, yeah, I, I like you. I love the <clears throat> beginning opening track. Um, but it's still very listenable. And, and this is a listenable album. You wouldn't think it would. Like, I mean, just for some Joe that picks up, you know, that doesn't know metal or he's just like in the rat or something like that. You give him this album, he's going to go, what the fuck is this? But for those of us that have put the time and the work in to adjust our expectations and our ears, it, it's very listenable. Um, uh, I really love Wolf and Devil, Ravaging Grimness, Personified, Garm Sounds, Evil as Fuck on that one, uh, Wolf and Hatred, Savage, a uh, track that wants to punish you for being born, uh, Grimness Personified, but this actually has guitar lead lines in it. That's the one song that kind of has a lead in it. A lot yeah. of the other ones don't really have leads. Um, the bulk of this album, the problem I have with it, John, is there is a bit of sameness to this one as well. Well, yeah. It's, it, it's kind of like they locked into like two or three ideas and then sort of wrote seven or eight songs around. Well, you know, another thing, I, I, there sounds to be, they're almost, I don't know, I'm not going to say this as a fact, but it sounds like there's mistakes on it too. Like, Oh, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can there's hear. A, there's a part the where drums. like the drums just stop and drums. then they and sure. they go again and it's yeah, like yeah. there's definitely it makes no sense definite editing issues there but yeah. and maybe they were like hey fuck it this is what we're giving them oh well, yeah. yeah yeah i think that's what they were doing so yeah um but yeah the for me i'm, I'm just not crazy about every single song because there's some interchangeability but i'm going don't hate me i'm going seven and a half out of ten i, I mean it's a it, to me I, I feel about Nat and Magical the same way I do about the demo. And that's another interesting thing is it kind of throws back to the demo. Very it's much, yeah. The same scratchy guitar tone. It's got the same kind of, there's a, there's a space between the guitars and the drums that the bass doesn't really fill in. Right. It's the same on the demo. It's the same on Natten's. So it's it's almost as if they fit, concluded their- a full circle thing. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. concluded their their trilogy with a full circle back to their did the Ouroboros. They were like, yeah, yes. we're just going yeah. to eat the, the young there. So, all yeah. right, we're going to get into this next one here. And I got to be honest with you right off the bat, man, when I got this, I was like, what the fuck is oh, this thing? I loved it. I, loved I it. did not, but I have changed my mind. And that's a good thing. That's why it was great to do these deep dives. That's why I love doing these deep dives because it makes me go back and pick something up that I, that I didn't think I liked. So, this uh, it comes out um, December seventeenth, nineteen ninety eight, and we're talking about themes from William Blake's "The Marriage of Heaven and Hell," recorded between ninety seven and ninety eight at Beat Jam Studio, and it's on Jester. Uh, it is a long album. It is nearly two hours long, not quite, but close. I have the uh, the OG. Yeah, yeah, me too. The slip. Uh, I was, and this was was this the first one that came out on his label? I think it was right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it's one. I think it's trick one. Yeah. And so you got a pretty extensive booklet in here, um, and with all the stuff and you had the vinyl. So, well, I've got the original pressing of the vinyl too, which I'm actually right. gonna because it's got a mistake on it, and the the layout is kind of shitty. Yeah, but that one's pretty valuable, I believe, isn't it? It's pretty. Yeah. Well, I hope so because I'm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's pretty valuable. I was looking yeah. at. I was looking at. All their vinyl is fucking valuable because a lot of it's either short printed or especially the OG presses, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so let's get into yeah, this. I have, one in here. Box. I have it in a box with a bunch of stuff I'm selling. So no I actually I actually thought that the reissue recently on Peaceville was a like much better. better. Presentation. The mastering's better or what? Everything. I mean, okay. the, the design is better. It doesn't have the mastering mistake that the other one had. Because there's on the other one, there, there was a song that appeared like twice or something. It was on the vinyl. Yeah, on the, on the vinyl. Well, so this album blends electronica, industrial music elements, progressive metal, avant-garde rock, ambient passages, following Blake's plates as track indexes. Uh, I don't know who this guy is. Steina Grittor? Grittor? You know who that is? Steina Grittor? Uh, Isan, Samoth, and Fenris all feature as guest vocalists. The shift in musical direction also caused discontent between rig and german label center media oh yeah i did <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Did. resulting in the band being dropped from the roster and rig subsequently forming 
his own label, Just for Records. So uh, I heard that from the horse's mouth, actually, when I was. Oh, really? Yeah. From him. Mm -mm. Oh, from Century Media. Oh, Century Media. Yeah. Well, does the same guy still own that or who owns that now? Well, I don't know if the German guy still owns it or not. I mean, it's a German label and there's an American office and I don't know how things have changed in the last 20 plus years. But when I was there, it was it. It was located. The U.S. office was located in a house. Ah. It was a house that they yeah. converted into office spaces. And yeah, I don't know yeah. if it's like that or what. Do you remember? I'm trying to remember. Peter's gone, but there was a um, label. It was Red Feather? Red? Red? Shit. They put out stuff like Unholy and a lot of Finnish Death. I can't remember the damn name of it. Anyways, that was in a guy's house. Yeah. In Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Lemoyne, Pennsylvania, which is literally right up 40 minutes up the highway from here, 35 minutes up the highway. I was like, really? I can't remember. I'll, I'll look up the label. Um, Are you thinking of red distribution? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that literally was in a dude's basement. Yeah, that was mm-hmm. his. Yeah. And the original relapse, John. Yep, yep, it was. Was in Millersville, Pennsylvania, which yep. I went to school at Millersville University, and I lived literally right around the corner from the, the, the place. And I went into it before they went to Philly, before they moved down to Philly. I went in there one day, you know, oh, cool, it's a record store. Like, but I wasn't into the death stuff. And they had like all the early autopsy stuff for survival. Yeah. I'm like, what the <clears> fuck <throat> is all this weird shit? You know, so uh, all right, get into this well, one. Tell they me. Moved to Portland, too. Relapse. Yeah. Relapse. Oh, they have a Portland office, too, or what? Yeah, when they own like two pizza places in Portland. I didn't know that, really. Yeah. yeah. I think, but one I think of- the main. The main what warehouse is, is in Philly, though. Yeah, I think one of the founders like moved to Portland, and now you're right. Here. You're right. You're right. He did actually. So that's true. I think, but I think he might have sold out though. Now I think that oh, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, Marty would know more about that. But um, yeah. I get into this album. I'm gonna grab a beer, so I'm gonna blow you up. Okay. Okay. I'll be right what you, back. What do you want me to say about it? Do you want me to just give my yeah, opinion? Just get into it, man. Tell me all you all your thoughts. I'll be right back. Two seconds. All right. Well. <clears throat> When this album came out, um, you know, by this point, I was curious as to what they were going to do next. And so when I got the copy of it, I was once again spellbound by the artwork and the presentation of it. And uh, the fact that it was two CDs and basically it was, you know, I put it on and it's basically this this electronic rock, like satanic rock opera (laughs) in a way. It was like. I've often said that it's the best Electric Hellfire Club record, or, or, or it sounds like GGFH, which I know that Garm was a fan of, um, and it's just I loved it. I thought it was the perfect thing to, for them to do next. Um, I was so glad they didn't stay within black metal or metal in general. Really, uh, I, it was I don't know. I know a lot of people have a problem with it, but. For me, it's one of my it's one of my favorite older records to this day. I mean, I actually prefer it over some of their newer, newer releases that are maybe a little bit more sophisticated. But it's just it's to me, it just stands the test of time. And there's there's some really beautiful moments on it. Um, I don't know if Jeff's coming back, but uh, I, I yeah, I, everything about it. It was just I loved I loved the artistic vanity approach that they took you know uh yeah it was just flying in the face of of metal at the time and that was that was perfect for me and i i felt very much like you know in line with what they were doing with my own my in my own headspace and as a musician and uh and an artist uh even though what i was doing was still rooted in the metal scene i liked that they were they were going in a whole different world so yeah, I mean it was a like you said, this is the ballsy move right here, right? I mean, this is going yeah. like full on and this it, is going full on, hey, major label, fuck you. I'm doing what well, we're doing you, what we want. Did you hear any of the stuff I just said? I heard some of it. Okay. So like I said a second ago, I think that this is probably the best electric electric hellfire record. Hellfire, ah, hellfire club. Oh record. yeah, there's it's, there you go. There's a name. It, it's 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 the best. It's the. It's like the best album they could have done. <laughs> well, okay. So this is interesting because I, I'll be curious about your thoughts on my my takes here because 
you know, to try and break this down song by song is impossible. You just can't. Um, it, it really, it, this is an album you either gonna you're either gonna sit down and you're gonna listen from beginning to end, or you're just not gonna listen. That's yeah. that's my personal take. I don't think you could get into this thing. Go, oh, track four is really groovy, man. I like that. Or track seven has a good guitar riff. It's so schizophrenic and crazy. Oh, yeah, you you hear you hear GGFH, you hear Leibach, you hear elements of Keltsinger, you hear you know. I hear elements of Skinny Puppy. Yes, Frontline Assembly, Front Two Four Two, um, Front Two Four Two. Um, you know that when I'm listening, I'm like. And you got to understand, John, like at that stage, the the evil stuff I was listening to, the harsh stuff I was listening to <clears throat> was Skinny Puppy. It was Frontline. I was really. Diamonica Loss. What's that? Diamonica Loss. Uh, I mean, now, I don't know. I don't know her that well. It's the most terrifying music ever recorded. I, 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 yeah, I, I've struggled with her a little bit. I need to go back and try it again. But, but you know, Same. you listen to stuff like, you know, now, <laughs> like when you first hear Rabies or you first hear um uh um last rites yeah last rites or what's the one um Good Art Park? no the early one with the, oh, the, oh, oh, shit. the blue the blue cover one well that's that's the one i was thinking i was too dark park um, no it's it's um it's one with uh, assimilate on is on it damn it i'm blanking i'm blanking anyway when you hear those albums man they're kind of frightening because of what's yeah going on around they're they're just they're disorienting right i mean you they're doing so much cool now i listen to i love skinny puppy i love them to death so it's like when when i hear the stuff that people go man i you know i'm like dude that's fucking awesome because that was bold that shit was bold like they took what spk was doing and moved it yeah they moved the mark they moved the mile markers yeah um and and the early lust more you know that that Mm -hmm. that kind of thing so um, but this album, it has everything in it. You, Electric Hellfire, man. I can't believe. Yeah, that that's. I used to love that band. I don't own anything by them anymore. But there was a time I, where I was. I thought they were terrible, actually. Um, not a great, not a great band. Yeah. yeah, that's why I say that this was like the best album that they could hope to ever make. If they yes. made an album, that was good. yes, yes, <laughs> that's perfect, man. That is perfect. Um, yeah, just, just a couple quick notes from my perspective on a few things. Like I said, this is very, very, very different from Natan's, obviously. The electronics, the spoken word, the voice of the devil is pretty... The voice of the devil is one track. is pretty uh, genty, almost genty and riffy. Uh, Proverbs of Hell is like Twisted Square Pusher, man. I hear Square Pusher here. That's the one that's almost like hip-hop. It's like a... Bon- yeah. bon- 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 and what I also hear, man... I hear a lot of warp record influence here, like yes, yes. Apex. Like the, the second uh-huh. once he got out of the ambient thing, I hear Apex, I hear Autecker. Uh, Autecker, uh fucking plaid. Yep. Um I definitely we hear more coming up. Massive Ford Attack. Towards of Canada, huge influence there. Um Massive Attack, yes, certainly mezzanine for sure. Um, so the thing that you take from this album is that Garmo's a sponge, man. He's listened to a lot of stuff. He's not He's yeah. not locked into just one thing, right? And I paid attention to the stuff that he would name drop in interviews yes. because that's how I that's how I learned about Talk Talk was from Garm. That's how I learned about the Norwegian progressive rock band Thule. No from, kidding, from Garm. You know, just name dropping that stuff. And and I think Landberg. He he mentioned Landberg. Landberg. Oh, that the Swedish band, right? Yeah, the you know, and it's band? like, and so and then and then a whole host of of electronic stuff. I mean, the whole thing with Coil. So, okay, I got into Coil in 1990 because of the Pathological Compilation. I don't know if you ever heard of that. No, I know. It was a compilation that was put out. I don't know who put it out. Um, I guess it was Pathological Records put it out. But um, it had Carcass, it had Napalm Death, it had Godflesh, and they had all like these unreleased tracks from those bands, and that's why I bought it. Okay, right, but right. But there was a song from Coil on there called Disclaim, Contains a Disclaimer. And to this day, it's my favorite Coil song. Oh, I and, and, I, and I remember listening to that going, holy shit, like, forget about Carcass. <laughs> forget yeah. about Godflesh. What is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, that, and that's the thing. Like, Coil's a, <clears throat> a niche band, obviously. Yes. But but they're, and they're kind of like over. They're kind of yes. like over. And that's a lot the of point I'm getting to is, yeah. you know, 
So when I saw Dets Fart Alver, that documentary, and I see the the coil logo on his leather jacket in 1993. Yeah. Like holy shit. I mean, Coil only had like three albums and a handful of of other you know EPs and stuff at by that point. Yeah. There's a kid that's like he's paying attention to the good, the really cool, obscure shit. Yes. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. at an early age. And I could and that and it wasn't easy to find that stuff. No. Unless you knew exactly. You know, Unless you knew where to look and found the right scene people to start talking about. Yeah. So uh, real quick. Um, <clears throat> uh, the one other thing I hear on here, I don't know if you agree with this, but I hear a lot of ogre in Garm's vocals on this album. I uh, Maybe. I don't know. Ogre, ogre from Skinny Puppy. I don't, the way he's distorting the voice. I hear it, man. Yeah, I hear it a lot. Maybe. Even when he's singing more in a clean voice, he's got a little <laughs> bit more of that kind of like that sort of ah, nah, nah, yeah nah, yeah nah, nah, nah. right it, you can tell he's doing something different with his voice to get out of the sweet spot yes he's almost trying to sound <laughs> harsh a lot on this album um uh so the the song of liberty plates 25 27 uh that's one with fenris and samoth and isan mm -hmm. joining in and then they do that track and it's so over the top it's an over the top closer and there's 20 minutes of silence. Yeah. And you're was, sitting there waiting. And you're yeah, like, was the popularity thing at the, at the time. Was the whole the silent track to the, the undiscovered. You know, every every Devil Doll yeah. album had that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> fucking typo negative did it, you know. Yeah. Um, Agalock did it. <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. Um, and, it, it, you know, it was, it became a thing, kind of a weird thing. But, um, but then the ending is sort of a super wet, synth out guitar that sounds super cool drenched in all kind of reverbs and delays it's just this swirling sort of massive notes that you hear um you know this is not a singles collection like i said you can't really sit down and go oh i'm gonna hit track four and track six and track eight you have to be immersed in this album right you really have to yeah. give it it's you gotta give it its birth and, um, you know, like I said, I hear a lot of Skinny Puppy, Frontline, Industrial. Uh, mm -hmm. I did not get into this album at all, John, when I got it. And I got it when it came out. I'm like, man, this is fucking weird shit. Like, what is this? And I liked Industrial, so it should have really appealed to me. But I think I was expecting another black metal album. And they totally went left turn. Well, you know. You know that episode of South Park where Randy Marsh just he discovers porn on the internet and there's that scene of him in his chair and he's just covered in cum. <laughs> that was me the first time I heard this record. No way! Oh man, I was, this is everything I wanted. I, I want to hear. So this is really a, a kind of a pivotal <laughs> album for you then. Yeah, I thought by, by that point, yeah. So I re-listened to it, I, and like I said, I, I, there's um, what's the other thing I had in here? Uh, hang on one second. Oh. Plates 21 and 22 are really killer. Mm. That's the heavy, dark, and, and yet still uplifting, but there's a lot of great riffs on that one, man. There's some really killer guitar riffs on there. And there's a lot of guitar on all of this, but it's sometimes mm. buried densely. Sometimes it's very processed heavily. And so, but it's still there. It's just not breakneck speed like that. It's not obviously, right? Um, so I, you know, I had I remember when I put this on two days ago, I'm like, man, this is going to be a fucking chore to go through. I can just tell. I'm just thinking this, right? Because I'm never... remembering back. And I got to tell you, man, I was kind of blown away by it, man. Car recency bias, whatever. This album is sprawling, wildly creative, super inventive. And it's not really original in terms of some of the, the points that they reference, because they reference a lot of things that were happening. Time. Like I said, some of the bands you mentioned, Liebox, another good one. Um, well, it's funny. There's a track that when they when they started playing live, they did play one track from this album, but it was such a weird deep cut, and it's on the DVD. Okay. Uh, they play the song that reminds me of Liebox. It's the one that's uh, it's like the last track on disc one. Yeah, the, the end track with the really stoop, super distorted vocals. Yes. Yep. 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 It's like, why would they choose that track? But it works really well in the live situation but yeah you can when we get to that we'll show that real quick so uh yeah so i give this a nine out of ten man i'm shocked by that like that is the one album there's one album here that really jumped way up for me one album that i thought i didn't like and i confirmed i didn't like it and i have another a feeling one, one that is uh, 
What's that? I think I know which one that is. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be interested to see if you get it. All right. Metamorphosis. Yeah, the EP, I have it here. If you don't. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got it. Yep. Yep. Uh, Love that's, it. That's Love what it. Jester. Love yep. it. This is amazing. Especially this is the album that they just totally said, hey, all you metal dudes, fuck off. Yeah. It even says it right under the CD. It says it right there. Oh, does it? <laughs> yeah, they actually were. were well, like, I forgot that. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and read it. Oh, it's not obviously not a black metal band, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, actually, it's a note. It's a note to basically their. To the black, black metal fans. Yeah. Saying, see ya. <laughs> yeah, see ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. Um, right. I love this fucking EP, man. It well, Gnosis, is, Gnosis is, is, is a great song. Ah, I love them all, man. Um, the first you know, track this came out uh, September 27, 99. Uh, again, it's on Jester. It's about 25 minutes long. Um, yeah, I, I just fucking incredible album, man. Who's this Great. too? What's that? Around, this is a compilation. Uh, it was the Ooks Forum of Contemporary Art, and it had a, it had a track from. Okay, I don't have that. You no. Know. Um, you know, Trying to read here and catch up. Okay, so this showcased Oliver's new electronic musical direction that will become more readily apparent by the next album, which we'll get into in a minute here. Uh, what's the first track on that? I can't. I can't see in my room. It's fucking dark. The argument. Oh, metamorphosis. Oh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm on the wrong. To album. me, to me, this is this is the beginnings <clears throat> of Oliver 2.0. That's what it is. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's. I think that they made that very clear. I mean, even. Even the, the the last track is a prelude to the next album. Yes, it is. Um, I, I there's no weak tracks on here. I hear, I literally have. I hear Future Sound of London on here. Yes, we have That's Explosive it. on there. That drum, yep. drum beats. I hear like D and B, a lot of D and B on it. Mm -hmm. um, I hear. Oh, and this is when he brought. Did he bring Tori in before? He brought that in. He, he brought him in for the last album, right? Tori. <laughs> I Vil think so. The Zacker or whatever it is. Yeah, I think he's in on that one. Will Will the Zacker? I think it is. Um, yeah, I, I, man. I also hear freaking. I hear Flavor of the uh, Week. You know that on my Frontline Assembly, Flavor of the Week. Yeah. Ninety-seven. I hear a lot of that on here. Uh, I hear um, a little bit of um, shit. What was that? Juno Reactor. A little bit of that too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a little yeah. bit of too. What's that? Orbital. I hear about a bit of them. Yeah, yeah, orbital. Orbital. That's yeah. That's what I was trying to think of. Yep, yep. Um, and yeah, I just oh man, this shit's just crazy good, man. Oh, yeah. Wolves and vibrancy gets into. Um, I think of wolves and vibrancy. We get into lustmore Andrew Lyles, nurse with wound territory, man. A little I, bit. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, definitely hear the nurse with wound. Man. I'm a huge nurse with wound nut. Uh, can't afford everything, but I love them. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff. Okay. Uh, I give this a nine and a half out of 10. I love it. So, all right. Getting into Perdition City. And here, man. Yep. I got the, I got the, I'm thick just, version. what's that? I got the thick version. Oh, what's that? What's, what's got this in it? This was the first version that had like the extended booklet. Oh, like a 30 page booklet or something. Oh, in shit, it. man. I thought it I had the original. It comes in this thick, like, oh, wow. Well, you know, <laughs> I thought I had the original. I thought this because I got it when it came out. I don't know. Maybe I, did you get that from overseas though? No, I got it from the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe I missed. I don't know. I bought a lot of shit from the end, but I'm gonna just say it straight up right here, right now. This is my favorite Uber album. With not me. I love this album, man. I love it. And when I, I read, like, when I, I like it a lot. I feel I listen to it again, John. I was like in fucking heaven. Yeah, I feel about this the same as I feel about Keltsinger. It's kind yeah. of a 7 out of 10 because it starts off strong, but it kind of teeters out. You know, about, you know, it's like you've got like five really solid songs and then the rest is just like, man. Really? <laughs> you know? Man, I love it. I yeah. love it. I, I, maybe the one argument would be the last track. The, um, no well, all the stuff, track. There's a bunch of songs. There's a few couple of songs before that too. That like there's one that like references the psycho theme and that's true. They're stuff. doing a lot of samples in there, yeah. And it's just like I don't know, it just it kind of loses steam for me. 
Well, this came out um, in Mar March 26, 2000. Yeah. Uh, on Jester, and it was um, produced by Wizacker, Wiz Wizacker, and uh, Auden Strike, whoever mm -hmm. that guy is. Uh, it was recorded and produced by Rig as well and Tori, mixed uh, by that guy, uh, Tori, again. Beep Jam Studio and Master at uh, Auden Stripe, Stripe Audio. Uh, this continues experimentation heard on themes from William Blake, containing elements of trip hop, jazz, ambient, uh, atmospheric, moody, combination being described as atmospheric, moody, and cinematic in scope. The album received positive reviews upon release, in, with Frank noting, This ain't rock and roll. This is evolution on such a grand scale that most bands wouldn't even be able to wrap their tiny little minds around. That's a great quote. I think that's a really yeah. good quote. Yeah. Um, maybe it's a little pretentious, but it's good. It's great right. saxophone in that album. There's a, some really good saxophone playing in it. Yeah, I love the sax on it, dude. I yeah. love. I'm a. I'm a total, you know, slut for saxophone. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, my one of my fa my my favorite Tears for Fear song is uh, the Working Hour. Ah, it's it's great. Great, saxophone. <laughs> great man. I mean that's that's the kind of saxophone that just blows your hair back, you know. Yeah, and I'm a big and I'm a big Coltrane fan, although I don't yeah. own everything because a lot of it's pretty intense. Um, but uh, all right, so what do you got on this one? You just kind of shot your wad there, but not well, over okay. I I have some very distinct memories that connect with this record. Um, when it came out, well, it came out in what two thousand? Yes. And we were working. So Don and I were hanging out a lot. We were discovering a lot of new music together. You know, we that's when we discovered Godspeed You Black Emperor and Oh and this, yeah. And this came out and we were we would go driving around and it was the perfect music to drive around at night in the city. You just you just stole my line. You stole yeah. <laughs> exactly what so I'm obvious. gonna say. Yeah, it's so obvious. And it especially yeah. the sketchy parts of Portland. I would just go drive around in like North Portland, you know, <laughs> and there's like strip clubs going by and <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, it's perfect it's, for that. It's, yes. Yeah, it's perfect. It was a yep. perfect soundtrack for that. But like I said, I mean, those first five songs or whatever, I don't know how many songs were on it? Eight? Eight. Nine. Yeah. So up until the point of I guess Future Sound of Music. Future Sound of the Music. Yeah, after that, it just kind of man, it kind of just drops off for me. You know, it's like, it, that'd be the point where I just kind of turn it off and put on something else, you know? Wow. Okay. I mean, it would have right. made a really stunning EP. Well, I can't argue that you're right. That that's yeah. true. Um, but it's a good record. I mean, I no, I mean, no, no disrespect about it. It's, it's a great record. It's just, well, I mean that first song, man, lost in a moment. Oh my God. Oh yeah. It's just so and, epic. Especially, yeah, especially the 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 almost Morricone or Morricone part with the, yep. with the vocals. That, yeah, 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 yeah. It's so badass, man. And it's it's very film noir. I mean, it's, it's film, noir. Film, film noir, film noir, soundtrack music, exactly. Yeah, I've got pure cinematic grandeur for this song. Yes, it's a perfect yeah. song. Uh, yeah. Almost all the songs are dystopian, dark and menacing, sinister, stygian, like they might harm you any minute. Uh, yeah. This music is. I, this is me being grandiose, but I said this is music to murder to if you're a psychopath. Yeah, it has that vibe, right? Yeah, um, I mean the second half of Porn Piece is awesome. Yeah, it's almost like a rap. He's like, well, it's not, it's not rap. It's like it's more trip hop. Yeah, well, it's it's more like yeah. There's like a sort of beat kind of beating it kind of. I don't know how to. I don't know how to describe it. It's it's kind of got. It's in the same. I put it in the same category as when Rush attempted to rap. Ah. <laughs> uh, it's in that same kind of category. It's not rap, but it's it's got that kind of rhythm yeah. and blues kind of thing going on. And yeah, I, just, I love that. I love that song, but I love that song, but I could do without that rap every single time. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you almost know. but you almost could not hear it if you went to a show and they cut it out and be like, "Whoa, what happened there?" But I mean, um, in terms of the over, I mean, it works so well in that in that city kind of. You know, I hear DJ Shadow in this. I hear oh yeah elements of Dr. Dre's like. This album that came out shortly. okay i'm gonna throw a couple other names at you i think you'll agree so i hear boards of canada a little sure. bit of boards yeah. yeah i hear plaid and bola i hear some yeah. bola Port i hear, I hear Alt said alteca we said uh, apex we said here's another one how about boron de club of gore yeah but weren't they after no they were before were they yes okay. i looked maybe, i maybe. made sure okay. just the sax that late night sax vibe that yeah that yeah. deadbeat film noir going in that basement, you know, bar where there's, you know, a couple of hookers and a bunch of perverts and, 
you know, one dude smoking butts endlessly and you just right. hear that sax playing with that guy that's up on stage that never makes any money and drinks yeah. all his money away and, you know. I don't know if yours has all the photos, but uh, the, photos, I don't, the photos really match the vibe. No, do they? Yeah, I mean, stuff like that, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I have them. some of them. I don't. I mean, mine has a pretty good book in it. Yeah, you got... All that stuff. There's all. Those. Okay, so you don't have a booklet. Yours folds they out. They wrap it around. It's a okay. wrap around. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, you, it totally. I guess the second issue. I'm. A re, a re, a re, I know it's not a reissue because I got it when it came out. I don't, this was a special edition. Uh that yeah. must have been it. I must have just grabbed the the, the 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 basic one. But um. I mean, my version of Blood Inside is the velvet version. So you know. Oh, well, we're getting to that. We're almost yeah. there. Um. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to tell you uh, straight up. I don't feel like you do that it's as weak at the end, although I do think it is front-loaded a little bit. Oh, yeah. Um, I I would give this a 10 out of 10. I love it that much. It's just – and like you said, uh, and you stole the – literally stole <laughs> verbatim what I was going to say, which was this is the perfect driving late at night album in a city or in a desert. If there's nothing around and you can fucking peg that – thing at 85 90 100 maybe if you're out in wyoming or wherever the or, well that's not desert, yeah. arizona or wherever and you can just roll like a summer night mm -hmm. with the windows down or if you got a convertible you yeah. crank in this thing man you are living large i think that's yeah. me you know yeah i mean you you got to have a cool car <laughs> well, i got a shitty toyota i don't have a cool car like you i've got so. i've got a cool car <laughs> yeah you do have so. a cool car I, i've seen your car I, well i haven't seen it i know what you have you got a a six? Yeah, I have an A6. Okay. And my, it's parents, <laughs> my mom had an A6 and I was going to buy it from her. She's like, I don't want you to own this car. I'm like, why? And she's like, because you can't afford the, the bills. I'm that's like, true. And that's at that time, I she was right. I didn't, I was in a post divorce. I had no money. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I had some, some stuff. I had some work I had to do on it recently. And, it, you know, the bill kind of brought tears to my eyes. <laughs> Make your butthole pucker up a little. I yeah. know. I know that thing. Um, so, yeah, real quick, let me just run through. Um, this album, does, and here's why. This album does shit to me mentally, physically and spiritually, that very few other albums do. And it's no doubt, for me, this is a top five album maybe of ever. So that's how strong I feel about it. I don't know if it's nostalgia that's making me say that. I don't think it is because I can tell you, John, when I got this album, man, it never, ever came out of my CD player in the car. Yes, I'd throw the mantle in or I'd throw in Cynic or, you know, whatever. But this album was always with me all the time. Yeah. And it would always be my, you got to hear this album. You know, people get in the car that I hadn't seen. Buddies of mine were going to the show where I'm like, you got to hear this, man. And most of them be like, yeah, it's all right. But I'm like, no, what are you missing? Like, what's, what's wrong with you? That kind of thing, you know. Um, so, yeah, I literally was mind blown when I got this. And I... Just the year or two before that, I'd really gotten into the Boards of Canada, and they're one of my absolute favorite, 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 favorites. Yeah, me too. Time. Yeah. Uh, Music has the right and Geo Gaddy, man. Fucking A. Just insanely good albums. Um, again, driving albums. Another, you know, mm -hmm. great driving album. So, um, but yeah, I'm going to give this, actually, I'm going to give it a 15 out of 10. Can I do that? Is that it's my show. I can do what I want. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> All right, That's silence like, teaches you how to sing. So this, yes, I don't I, have this. Okay, I have. I've got the. I've got the combination one, and I've got the two. Okay, I mm -hmm. ordered the combo last night. You can't yeah. find the other ones; they're too damn expensive. Yeah. Now they. Okay, are. I think they were what one thousand and two thousand copies, something like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I really only listen to this one because it's both of them together. It's yeah, like, it makes kinda, sense, right? Yeah. It makes sense, yeah. I just have these because that's what they, that's what. And I don't out. know if you hear what I hear. I'll be interested to hear what, what you think about these. Go ahead. Well, I, I don't have anything to say about them. Oh, really? Just, you know what I mean? Really, they're really nice kind of background music. You know, I just. Okay. I'm not as, I'm not passionate about them. I think they're really interesting atmospheric pieces um they make what do they yeah. remind you what do they remind you oh fuck you know i haven't listened to them in a while it's it just reminds me of older trying something well here's what <laughs> i hear here's what i hear okay i definitely hear the instrumental side of david sylvian 
Well, I know that David Sylvan is a is is an influence on. on yeah, that. I mean, you hear that Ryuki Ryuko Sakamoto. That, I'm not a big fan, but I, okay. I know who yeah. they are. But I hear that I hear that vibe. So, you know, the first one was released September third, a one. Uh, there's a lot of glitch in here, so I hear finesse. Oh yeah, finesse. I hear. Uh, I don't know if Tim Hecker was around before this, but I definitely hear some thing, Tim Hecker that hazy, gauzy sort of thing. Yeah, well, I, I mean, that scene that he's a part of certainly right. was around, you know. Right. It's, yeah, it's still, like, it totally has that Scandinavian sort of atmospheric, glitchy, electronica thing that, that was right. going on in the early 2000s, for sure. You could, even, you could even maybe point a little bit to, like, stuff like Biosphere a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and also um, some of the other glitch stuff, like, I, I think there was um, – was, was Birchfield <laughs> – Birchville Cat, did they do glitch stuff? I'm thinking they did, but maybe not. I don't know. I, it was the Australian stuff, which was Venez, mm -hmm. obviously, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you got Teaching in Silence, and you got the other one, Silence. Uh, Teaching silence is the same. Singing, so I did just order that because I'm like, well, I need to have this. So I'm mm -hmm. going to give that like an 8 out of 10. I I, I dig it. I like Found Sound. Basinski is another one. William Basinski. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I can definitely hear William Basinski. Yeah, and I just saw him two weeks ago. Oh yeah, he's great. Yeah, I saw him when he came. He to was so cool, man. He was awesome, man. He's funny as shit too. In between, he really is. Pieces. He's like a total character, right? But he reminds yeah, I me mean, of Daniel Menchi in his in his personality. Daniel Menchi, which you, I, 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 thank you for reminding me. Yes. Yeah. He would definitely be a guy. Andrew Lyles, if you know Andrew Lyles, does some yeah. weird stuff like this from time to time too. So, um, and also. Eno, of course, we didn't, you know, the big one, Eno. Yeah. And then I kind of hear some talk, talk. Well, Just okay. In, in the spacing and the. So when I discovered Talk Talk, it was when Garm was talking about the inspiration for these EPs. Yep. And he was talking about how he was listening to a lot of quiet music. Yes. Like Talk Talk. And I was like, huh. <laughs> so Those later Talk Talk albums are, yeah. it's more about. And, and I think he mentioned, guitar. and he mentioned Portishead too. I think. Yeah, well, that may ah, that's a good one too. I, and mean, I hear that. Yeah, I mean, you know, like talk, talk, and even Portishead to a degree, it's about what they're not playing versus what they are yeah. playing a lot of the yeah. time. And 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 the the titles are apropos because they're talking about silence and how to mm -hmm. kind of hear what's going on around you. Some of this stuff you hear like industrial hum, like of like uh, like you could envision like a. An industrial complex, but way far away. It yeah, just can kind of glean a little bit of sound from, right? Right. There's one of these that has like a bell. I think yeah, that's like, the. Um, I uh, love that track. I forget what I had, it had a note on it here. Um, Is that on Silence Teaches or thing? It's like it's like the ding. Yep, yeah, that's the, the one. Hello, piano. Yeah, I'm trying to find my notes here. I said. Um, Darling didn't kill. Uh, yeah. That didn't might be kill yeah. you. Is so sneaky good. And the third, uh, the third track, sort of slithers and groans its way around the track. Ghostly pops and clicks, ebbing. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> I love when I can't edit my own writing. Uh, synth and subtle vocal effects, ebb and flow. Pretty haunting, but cool at the same time. Um, the last track, the last track on the uh, the, the second one. Uh, reminds me a lot of Talk Talk. That's the one that I was. That's the one with the church bell. That's it. The last yeah, song. Yeah. Um, it's like they. And here's why I said it. it's like they hit their Talk Talk, Eno, Finez, Basinski, Biosphere, Apex Twin, Ambient phase of experimenting. And lots of found sound, oh. tape manipulation, scissors and tape. They actually were record. They were recording them cutting pieces of paper with scissors, and then glitching it and making it weird. Right. So I, I dig it. I, I really dig it. It's it's not an everyday listen. It's not even something that you would put on maybe but once or twice a year, but it, it's one of those maybe if you want to chill kind of things, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Moving and on. I, Blood and Scott. What? No, no, no. It's like, actually, that kind of is a good good oh. bridge into the, into the soundtracks. Did I miss one? Oh, I missed one. Yeah. Lycanthropin. Yeah. Sorry. Well, Lycanthropin. There's Lycanthropin. There's Fidnigger. And then there's Riverhead, which came later. That's later. But, yeah. I don't. I don't have any of those. So okay. you show this your... this one is the best one. This one is gorgeous. That's Spid, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. This yeah. one is incredible. 
Yeah, I got some notes on both of those. Yeah. So what? This one, what eh. <laughs> it, it's kind of an ambient. It's ambient, right? Yeah, yeah they're both kind of ambient, right? I mean, I have the DVD of the film, so which I don't it know. Works, if it works with the film better. It does. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen the film? Do you have the DVD? I've not. I've not. No. So. Okay. Yeah, I've not seen any of their films. I got to get some of that shit. So. Well, yeah, and then they also did a soundtrack for a Norwegian film called Uno, which I I, I rented and checked out. Oh, I did. That wasn't in their discography, though. Strangely. Yeah, but they're listed as part of the okay. soundtrack. Well, I believe you. Um, and you know what's weird? I read an interview with with Garm, and I I always wanted to, I meant to ask him about this, but there was a rumor that they were going to do. A, a Lars von Trier soundtrack at one point. And then True. I don't know what happened with that. What's he do? What uh, Lars von Trier, the director, the film director. Yeah. What's he, what's some of his films? Uh, Melancholia, Antichrist. Oh, Breaking okay. The Waves, yeah, yeah. Which that, I, were, that makes sense. And this was shortly before Antichrist ha came out. So I was wondering if maybe they had been in discussion with doing that soundtrack. This is a good, this is a good comment by Embers. I, I notice he's you, you've got John song title as your uh, as your uh, avatar. Yeah, album. but it's it's yeah. a good thing. I think it's safe to say it's one big fever dream. That's a that's a really good. Concept. It is. Yeah, it is. It's it is like, yeah. And on that note, I do have something to say about Blood Inside when we get to it. That all right? We're almost there. We're almost there. I was just going to mention about Lycanthrope, and that came out um, November twenty sixth, two thousand two. Jester. Um, you know, it's the original soundtrack for the short film by Steve Erickson. Yeah. Um, and there's a cool interview with them on that DVD, too. And that's their first foray, right? Into That was their first one, yeah. Right. Um, it's kind of a continuity of the two silences, kind of. It's a little more a little more form, formalized, I guess. It's mm -hmm. not so much space. Because he doesn't, they don't have, you know, sprawling 20-minute, things to put behind stuff but um mm -hmm. to me it's very moody and atmospheric a bit foreboding claustrophobic at times as well theme three i really love the, the long one the seven minute piece that's mm -hmm. probably the best piece on there for yeah. me um that song actually is kind of weird because it's got that propulsive sort of low-key sort of propulsive motion sort of vibe to it with the, mm -hmm. the synth pulses and then you have that continuity of textures uh, that that sounds sort of alien and yet welcoming and warm at the same time. Deep five builds and has an almost proggy uh, keyboard line that's insistent and very tangerine dream like. It's yeah. definitely starting to see you get some sequencing going on here. Mm -hmm. I give that a I give that a nine out of ten. I really like that one actually. Um, did we? I didn't. Did I not? Which one was the other one you had there? Oh, Sved Sved's a little bit further down, isn't it? Yet I uh, they came out in two thousand four. It's, it's yeah. before Blood Inside. Because we missed one thing, the EP. Well, we also um, missed this. Yeah, I have that, man. I I listened to it once. I don't like it. I don't like it very much. It's all yeah. it's all other um, interpretations of music. I'm, I don't enjoy it at all. Yeah. And then the, I think the EP you're talking about is this. Yes, 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 yes. We got to talk about this one a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, Quick Fix of Melancholy is the fourth EP. Uh, came out a winter of 2002. Uh, I'm sorry. August of 2003, actually. It was recorded in the winter of 2002. And it's on Jester. All these are Jester, anyway. Uh, until we get to, what's the new thing called? House of... House of Mythology. Mythology, mythology right. I don't know. Did, I don't know what that is. Did, I know it's in England. I don't know. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a, a licensing sort of arrangement or something. Yeah, I don't maybe. know. Yeah. I've, I wanted to have... See if I get some of my solo stuff on that. On that would be a good label for you, actually. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. But anyways, quick fix of melancholy. Um, precursor to the album Blood Inside. It showcases the band's ability to seamlessly combine ambient, electronic, and orchestral elements. In an interview with uh, Modern Fix, uh, Garm said, uh, it is our way of trying to get back into writing songs or something resembling songs, which makes sense. Uh, and also find out where we wanted to take things. I think after all our work with film, which is very kind of aesthetically fixed, you know, we ended up making Blood Inside. So this has four tracks on it. Uh, Little Bluebird, man, uh, is beautiful, man. I yeah. love that song. It's so haunting. Yeah. Uh, it's just gorgeous. Um, Doomsticks, 
a little too happy for me to be honest with you. But vowels, holy shit, vowels. Okay, yeah, I didn't get that. That's the track. Did you also hear Doomsticks? There's a little nut, Nutcracker Suite in there. Yeah, there is. It, 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 yeah. It, it, it's there if you listen hard. Yeah. Uh, and it's like if they did the Nutcracker Suite and All Tecker came in and fucked with it. It kind of reminds me. It actually kind of reminds me more of the of the Norwegian band When. I don't know them. Yeah. Okay, would they? They. Yeah. They're they're a favorite of mine. Um, yeah, you're gonna have to school me on some of these, John. Some yeah. of them I missed. You know? But they did they did a they did Pierre Gint's. Uh, oh, okay, entire, yeah, yeah. They did it in a sort of they remade it in this kind of like electronic way. Right. So that kind of I I get a little bit of I hear a little bit of when there. Yeah, vowels, man. What a fucking track. Oh, dude. Holy shit, dude. And cool. See, okay. Amazing and, sequences. Sample the strings. Are awesome. What's that? And, and here's the thing. He's doing a lot of this with the vocals. He's doing some experimentation with his enunciation and his the way he sings. Yep. It, it kind of takes me back to the demo a little bit. You hear a little bit uh, of the... Yeah, but doing, a little bit easier on the ears overall. But he's doing it in a more mature yeah. and, you know, better way. You know but, what I hear on this a little bit? I'll be interested if you know this. I think you will. I hear some breakbeats on there and Jungle d and and I hear Venetian snares. I hear something that maybe you'll agree with. I hear cloud busting by Kate Bush. Yes. Yes. Especially, especially the end with the dun 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 dun. Very dun, dun, much. Dun, dun, dun. I didn't even pick up on that one, but that's perfect. Yeah. And then the yeah. last one, what is it? Etilane or whatever it is. Uh, that's kind of a dub, weird, jazzy noise thing. It's, well, it's all a right. I don't, I don't love it. I don't it's love a try. It. It's a remix from, uh, from Keltsinger. Right. It's okay. I mean, yeah. It's beautiful in, in, in its sort of in, in its complexity, I guess. Um, and it really kind of points to where the album coming up is, is going to go. Um, um, I give I give us an eight and a half out of ten. I have a really cool memory with this EP because, you know, it came out shortly before Agalock's first tour back in 2003. And, you know, I got this copy from the end because it came out on the end. Okay. And we were on the road and between LA and Phoenix there's I guess it's right outside of Palm Springs there's a bunch of windmills yeah that's, that's that what whole, I was talking about that's that's the area I envision doing like Perdition City in right okay but anyway so I'm like looking out the window listening to it and that part at the end of vowels comes on that 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 dun 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 Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. yeah and yeah, then, yeah. You know, then when it comes back and it's like dun 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 yep. dun 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 Yep. I'm like watching these windmills in the distance go by. And that's been etched in my mind. Every time I hear that, I just, I see those windmills. <laughs> this, Isn't that the cool thing about music, dude? Yeah. It brings you to some of those moments where they'd be lost otherwise. You know, right. if you didn't have that, that moment with that music, you'd never remember that. You'd be like, yeah, yeah, I kind of remember that drive. But. Yeah. And the, and the synchronicity of just it being, you know, Agalock's first tour and I'm, yeah. and I'm, and I'm still being inspired by the band that inspired me to, to make that band yeah 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 it's, it's, that's it's, awesome man i love yeah. that shit. love it yeah um svid nigger 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 i don't know how to say it sorry i'm not saying the bad word i'm, I'm just trying to uh, original motion picture is an original soundtrack album by norwegian blah 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 anyways uh this came out uh, just don't say the uh the u the Ameri or the english version of that yeah i kind of did a little <laughs> bit there and i didn't try to um september 15 2003 it comes out when did it come obviously out? huh when did it come out September 15th. Oh, day after my birthday. 2003. I yeah. didn't know that. Uh, it's Oliver's first score for a full length feature. Yes. Like in like Trubin was like it a was mini. Short. Yeah, it was a short. Uh, the controversial Norway Norwegian film Svid Najir. I don't know what that means. Do you? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. we, don't, we don't want to say it. Okay. The songs are lush. I'm going to get misquoted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't want to do that then. I have a feeling that I know what it means. Yeah. I didn't look it up. Uh, the sign, they didn't do a translation there. Songs are lush and dense, generally laid back, but sinister, at times more musical, orchestral, while other elements are more minimal and atmospheric. And I did listen to this one. You know, To me, it's pretty stellar, deeply gorgeous at times. Amazing how they went from black metal weirdos to with Vardnat to this in a 10-year span. Shows how eager they uh, Garm was to never stay stagnant and to continue to push boundaries. This is an amazing piece of work. I got to get this one. 
I, some of the piano melodies on this album are fucking like, wow. Yeah. You just know. like, oh I my know. God. Like, I don't play piano. I can play the keys. I can dick around and make some noise. But I yeah. could never come up with those. Like, well, it's big- it's they do it. They it it has the style of piano playing that I really like. Yes, and, and it was utilized. We did it on uh on uh Sawilla Rune. That really, the the piano droplets. Yes, it's kind of yeah. like the talk. It's the talk talk thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, this is lush and beautiful, man. I this is like a it's like a nine and a half out of ten, man. I I love this one. Oh, it's, it. it's my yeah. favorite of their soundtracks. Yeah. 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 Um, anything you want to add to that that I didn't override? Oh. You on? Well, actually, you know, I wonder if did that movie ever actually come out? Because I can't find it. Anywhere. I don't know. I can't find it online. I can't find it at Movie Madness. Well, you've been trying to get a copy of it. I just wanted to see it, you know, because it's oh, on, oh, like on Uber or Hulu or something like that. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, even, it's not on YouTube. It's not. I so I'm wondering if it. If it never got released, or if it just it was just released in Norway and just kind of swept under the carpet, or I don't know. I, I mean, yeah. I never saw it, and I quite frankly, I kind of forgot about it until we started doing this. Yeah. And this is not yet, but this is where I start to tap out a little bit. And I'll get into that in a minute, but it's coming up like real quick. It better um, not be. It better not be with shadows. <laughs> no, no, no. No, 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 no. Uh, let me explain. We're almost there. Um, yeah, this this album, I can't really even pick a song out because it all inter- it's all interwoven. It's very flowing, like a stream of consciousness piece of music. And it's it's a gorgeous, gorgeous album. I, I mean, these guys, it's just amazing. Like I said, that's why I said it's amazing in a 10 years span of time. They went from what they did as a black metal band to this. <laughs> It's I know. Like, it's just bizarre, almost in a weird way, right? Yeah. All right, so now we're at Blood Inside, right? Okay, so yeah, I've got I, the only version I have is is this version. I don't uh, have that one. I have the, the Velvet Box version. Yeah. I remember that box. Yeah. Um, I did not. I almost, I almost so sold this because I fucking hated this record when it came out. This is where they lost me. Guess what? This is, this where, is where they, they lost. Me. Yep. Yeah. Is, is, that that you, is that what you're going to say? Uh, yeah. 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 I, uh, Jason, I, was, I was hoping revisiting that like Blake, uh-huh. that I was going to get it. I still don't get it, dude. Yeah. Jason from Agalock fucking hates that record. I, I just do not like this album. Now this came out June 6, 2005 on, um, it was produced by Ronan, Chris Murphy. There's a couple producers in here uh, and it's again on Jester and, Man, I don't know, dude. Like, I'm gonna get this out of the way. I gave this a six out of ten because it's over. I really didn't even want to go that high. I just don't get this album. And I bought it. Yeah, when I originally got it, I would have given it a one out of ten. No kidding. I, I fucking I could not stand that record. Well, when this came out, I was like, man, I'm done. I I I don't I don't want to hear something like this again. Because well, and that's the thing is, I expected a full length version of this. Exactly. And then I got this fucking thing. Yeah, and it's <laughs> and it's all right. So I got a couple notes. Dressed in black, sort of down tempo, building layered electronic thing, almost operatic rock track that builds to this intense crescendo. It's artistic and psychedelic. It's an artistic and psychedelic mindfuck. Christmas is an interesting track, but feels so over the top. And that's my whole context of this thing. Everything's mm-hmm. over the top, like so over the top. That it's not really musical in a weird way. It's not even fun to listen to. There's right. no there's no reference points of song structure and melody and and it's just like there's too many. Lyrics. It feels like there's like several songs playing different things at the on same the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Blinded by blood, though, I do like that song. Uh, that's the yeah. gorgeous opera female choral vocals are amazing. Garm sounds crazy on it. I love uh, for the love of God. Which one? The second track. For the love of God. Yeah, I don't have any notes on that one. I, love that. I like that track. Here's the thing, though. Okay, so I hated this record. Never listened. I almost sold it. I, I wasn't. I didn't listen to it for years, until I got the DVD of them. Where is it? It's this. Uh, the one with the bird on the front. The bird. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't have that. I got to get that. Wonderful show, by the way. Yes, yes, yes. This, this is where how was you- that? That was in Norway, though, right? In 
I think so, yeah. Bergen or Oslo? It was in, yeah, somewhere. Uh, what does it say? It's Norwegian, yeah, National Opera. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. So, but yeah, this this is how you do a, DVD, a, live, a live DVD. Okay, I'll yeah. grab it. I'll it's, grab it. It's amazing. And here's the thing. That that performance of those songs from from Blood Inside made me go back to the record. Oh, because really? Okay. Live versions make more sense. Okay. It's less layered. It's more stripped down in it, and you get the visuals to go with it. And like, there's this there's this this moment in the live show where the whole venue is black, and you just hear it's dark, and you just hear a phone ringing. Oh, really? For like a while. On stage it, or out of yeah, the audience. Basically, the, the screen is off. You don't. All the lights are off, okay. and you just hear a phone ringing, and then it just explodes back. Ah. Into the, and I was just like, "Okay, I got to revisit this record." And what now, was it for that second one? And now I like it a lot. You like this album? I like it a lot now. Okay. I can't go there, dude. I just. I, I would say it's a nine out of ten now. Wow! Holy yeah. shit! Wow. It's amazing. It's amazing how your mind can change. After, well, after it, it did with me for Blake, so maybe it's gonna happen here. If yeah, give it watch watch the live versions. Remember Please. when I said to you that they kind of lost me in a place. Is this the album you were thinking of? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we were we were in sync at that point. You've just come yeah. around on it. I have. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did want to say that "Blinded by Blood" is for me the best track on the album, and it, there's a singer on there, the female singer. I. I, I couldn't find her name because uh, they built a chorus of female voices on there, but it's there's also like, huh? There's also like a male voice who sounds, he sounds African-American. It sounds like, yes, almost, yes. He sounds like an old African-American yeah. dude. Sort yeah, of like sounds like a like, Right. And it's, yeah. it's, 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 yeah. And I couldn't find his name in there either. On no. the production of, I didn't look in the CD cause I don't, uh, well, you know, I do own that. I didn't look. I should have looked. Um, but I, the one thing I wanted to say was, maybe you'll laugh at this a little bit, but um, there's uh, in The Truth, the song The Truth, that is so unhinged and strange. Yeah. I hear I am the walrus in there. Oh, yeah. You can, you can kind of draw a straight line from that era of the Beatles to this yeah. record. It was yeah. their experimental Beatles record in a way. It is. It kind of is. So, yeah. like I said, I gave it a six and a, I gave it a six and a half, but I really didn't want to go that high, but I did because it's over. But um, and you know the other thing is here's what I said here too. I said um, your call has some beautiful female vocals and some weird ass lyrics, and the operator is over the top weird. Operator you know saying it's like I love experimental music, but it I, <clears> this is like kind of controlled chaos it's bungle level shit right it's bungle yeah. level stuff it and that's really what, is. and that's the thing is i told jason i was like dude it's this is like mr bungle it's their bungle album i swear it is right and he's like no it does not sound like mr bungle oh i think it does i disagree we're on the same way <laughs> all right so you said you know you, you better not have jumped out of shadow um i jumped out before shadow right not because of shadow me too i, I remember this album coming out and i remember it getting crazy good reviews but i don't know at that time i was veering into other things at the time yeah i don't even i couldn't even tell you exactly what <clears throat> but i was veering into other stuff and i will tell you john i may have listened to this once upon a time way back when but i don't think i did because if i did i would own it now i have it on the way it didn't get here in time i ordered it a couple days ago and I actually ordered it on vinyl and yeah. which was kind of expensive well there's this version which has been reissued right that's what i was looking for the cheaper one. you know i never got the original wood sleeve version because yeah one i didn't like the artwork i like this artwork more oh, i love that artwork man. and so two cool. and two i was still reeling from blood inside that exactly. i didn't want to, I didn't want exactly. to give them a, a chance i didn't even buy the cd because i'm like man i fucking well, hated that last oliver yeah, I got the CD from the end because they were it, it's out it's on the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I remember well, I mean, you know the story I told you when we interviewed. I came to the end through you guys. You guys yeah. were the guys that got me into going to the end. Bought a lot of shit there, you know, Opeth and Anathema mm -hmm. and all the special editions that uh what was his name again? Andreas? Andreas, yeah. Andreas would do. It's like he did like the cool um 
the, the double CD with the 5.1 and the 7-inch for uh, We're Here Because We're Here. Um, you know, he did a lot of cool little neat sort of uh, releases, like um, when when uh, Watershed came out. They did, like, a special edition with vi double vinyl and the, the, the case-folded CD. So I spent a lot of money with that. The end did that? Oh, yeah. That's well, weird. I don't know. He was distributing. No, he was distributing. He was distributing it because he was yeah. so against special editions. Well, I, I, had to, I had to fight him. All, like, it was an I'm pretty battle. sure he did the anathema thing, though. You, you had that the the double. No. It's like a booklet. It's like a ten inch. Or well, maybe no. it's a seven. It might be a seven inch. Um. Anyway, look. So this comes out October first, two thousand seven, recorded in Oslo at Ambassador Ambassador. Should be ambassador, and it's produced by Oliver. And it's on uh, Jester and the End, mm -hmm. licensed to the End. Um, so, man, dude, <laughs> this album, holy yeah, fuck, it's it's, it's it's my favorite one. It 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 literally. Well, here, brought me to tears. How much I love this record. There it is. Uh, uh, my camera. <laughs> oh wow! Oh nice. <laughs> Where is it? There it is. Yeah, oh, wow, I got that's part of your sleeve. I didn't know that. Yeah, I got that tattooed. When did you get that? You just got that recently, right? Uh, I got it. Okay, so when we did our last interview, I got this tattooed two days later. Oh, that's brand new. This this is yeah. Okay, but your sleeve though, you that's my sleeve's been it been a work in progress for. Oh, you've been working on okay. last year, and actually, on the ninth, I'm gonna have the whole bottom done. Okay. Too. So, um, I've got a couple, but I'm. I think in my old age, I might be scared of the pain. Now. I'm not sure. I like um, it. I, I, I miss it. <laughs> it's an interesting pain. You can't explain it. It's a day by day. You just, it's like being stung by a bunch of bees, but not exactly. It's like weird, you know? Yeah. Um, especially if you got a good tattooist artist that knows how to kind of mitigate the pain a little bit. Yeah, my tattoo artist is really, he's really cool. And like, he'll put on like a movie or something and, and while he's doing it. So I'm just zoning out watching a film while he's inking me, so. Yeah, I'm curious if you know. Hang on, I'll show you something. There. I'm moving on to the next step. We done with blood? Oh, we're on shadows. Yeah, we're just, on shadows. We're just yeah, yeah we were. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about this. So, I don't know. Do you know this? Do you know what that is? Uh, it looks familiar. Marillion? Uh, no. You don't know Marillion? I do. Oh, I just. Not, man? I never was really a fan. Not, so. not your thing. Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, he knows you know. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, let's see, it was voted the best album of 2007 by Sonic Frontiers. It won an Oslo Award for Album of the Year in 2007. Rick commented in Terrorizer magazine, lyrically, the album is very simple. It's the basics, life, love, loss, and of course, death. Yes. It's, it will, it's been a humbling record to make. It's kind of beaten us down. People will not, no doubt, say that's pretentious, but that's not how... It felt when we made it. Uh, the lyrics are always the biggest challenge. We have these writers, writers' nights sometimes. Yorn, Savarin, and I, where we go to my parents' cottage with some to drink, some music, and just dedicate ourselves to writing, which is cool. I, li I like that. Um, this album also features contributions from Pamela Kirsten of Theremin on Theremin. Matthias Eck on trumpet. That guy. I love that guy. Oh. I, I thought it was fucking Nils Peter Molliver, but it's not. It's Matthias Eck. Um, and who else? Austrian White Noise musician Christian Finez is on here, adding electronics. Uh, described as supplemental shimmer and helping Uwe to correspond with their vision of sci-fi. So go ahead. Tell me what you... I want to hear your thoughts on this before I tell Damn it. I actually, before I give my thoughts on this, I need to go back to Blood Inside for one okay, second. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we were in Denver... Dude, if you got a piss, just let me know. Just go. Okay, all right. Um, so when we were in Denver in December, uh, you know the writer Jeff Wagner? You know, I know Jeff. Yeah, love him. Yeah. So I guess... Wrote the Faith Warning book and the typo. And, and he's working on the Voivod. He's doing the Voivod thing. Yeah. Yeah. He interviewed me for that. So yeah. Um, anyway... So we were sitting, we were standing around or sitting around in the, in the hotel lobby trying to, we, and we were discussing stuff and Hunter was there and the other canvas Solaris guys were there. Jason was there and Don, and we were all kind of hanging out and we were, we were talking music and it, it came up, blood inside came up. I don't know who brought it up. And of course, Jason had his 
fuck that album, you know? <laughs> and I told, I told Jeff, my, my description of that album is this. This sums up that record. It is, it sounds like Paul Stanley having a nightmare about Bach. About what? Sebastian Bach. Ah! Not the singer, the, the Johann Sebastian Bach. The, oh, 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 Bach. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds like to me. It sounds like a fever dream that Paul Stanley would have. Because a lot of the vocals kind of remind me of Kiss. A lot really? of the, there's a lot of that. Ah, okay. Yeah, I hear uh, kids in it. I'm gonna listen back to it. I'm gonna go yeah. back to it just to just to kind of because I only listened to it once and I, I just yeah. I struggle to get through it, dude. I'm just being but then there's but then there's like a Bach piece that they they reference in one of the tracks. Yeah, um I, I noted it up there yeah, by the it's it. in the video. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, and that's what it that video perfectly sums up the vibe of that record too. You know the video are you, for it's not sound. about the live video or the no, video no, the, for the not song. sound video the song yeah 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 i mean that that video just sums that record up the I've, not seen, record. I've not seen that oh, you should I, check it out i'm gonna go back to it I, I i need to go back to it to confirm because i was shocked at how much i like blake 20 years later almost yeah. right you know i was like i was like man i'm actually grooving on this i was right. talking to actually maze of torment my buddy Devin. He doesn't like that album very much. And I'm like, dude, this is better than you think it is. Go back and check it out. He's like, nah, that album sucks. Too long. Drags, blah, blah, blah. He's not an industrial guy, though. So that's going to be a hard sell if you're not an industrial fan, you know. Right. Um, or, or electronic. But, um, yeah, I, so what about, what about. Okay, so back to Shadows. Shadows. Well, Shadows, here's an interesting, my, my thoughts on Shadows. So if you're having, if you're consistently happy with life and you're in a good mood right. the album is just beautiful it's just a beautiful record but if you're depressed it's like fucking suicide <laughs> but in <laughs> a good album. way but in a good way no it's not even in a good way the song what happened oh my god fuck the strings yeah. that swell and go yeah oh and there have been times in my life since that album came out where you know i'm like super depressed and i can't listen to it because it's just oh, like i can see it yeah, yeah yeah it just takes you into a too black intense, hole. too intense in the yeah. that, vortex, that vortex yeah but like when when things are when you're having when you're having a a good a good life or whatever good you feel good it's just a great record to put on and it feels it's just a nice beautiful record so it's got this double it says the double-edged sword with that yeah record. well what i what i said was this album is achingly melancholically beautiful yeah, and and it's damn honestly, man, it's damn near a masterpiece. That's what I put. Um, it's, it's it's one of the best albums ever recorded in the history of man. I mean, <laughs> you know, unlike Blood Inside, it's much more minimal than Blood Inside. Yeah, and you don't have all the space. You have much more space. And if right. anything, it's a talk talk album that doesn't sound like talk talk because it's just there's wide open sort of swaths of slowly building things, yeah. right um you know yeah. you get you get most of these melodies the rests and pauses in the melodies are so evocative of sadness and loss yet they often sometimes feel uplifting so that's what you were talking about if you're in a bad frame of mind it's the sadness and loss thing and you get like like a suicidal vibe if it's you're just, in yeah. a good space it's uplifting it's beautiful yeah. and you know I, I said definitely influenced by talk talk here Finesse, obviously, because you got that minimal glitch. Well, um, and Don, Vigil in particular, Vigil in particular. Yeah, well, Don made an interesting point. Is it's This is the album where they eclipsed Coil. Because it's basically, they made a Coil album that's better than anything Coil ever made. Yeah, uh, that might be, might be. I don't know Coil's, that's why I didn't want to go Coil with you, because I'm only dipping my feet in in the last year or so. I don't mm -hmm. own enough. I've got Love Secret Domain. I've got Music for Night. I've got Horse. Uh, that's about it. So I'm kind of trying to, you'll have to guide me where I need to go next on that stuff. So, um, um yeah, okay, but I'll talk to you privately, but, um, let you, let the children play is stunning for the vocal arrangements, man. It's stunning. It's fucking amazing, man. For a three and a half minute song. Yeah. Funebrae is epic about pain or release. Um, the solitude cover, the Sabbath cover, deeply spiritual, man. It's better than Sabbath. 
Hey, it's way better than Sabbath. For for uh, three fifty three song, it's just brilliant. You know? yeah, like music is another one. Which it's one? So, like music, it's so simple, but just yeah, so perfect. Yeah, it, it's gorgeous. Um, stunning, somber, reflective, exercising the releases from pain, sadness, depression. This album is about loving life. I think it, ultimately it's about loving life and acceptance of the great unknown, which is death. I think I see it as almost a reflection of life, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, so. sort of. Yeah. 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 Interesting side note about this. So I have a, there, there was a, in Mo, there's a, a German magazine called moon dance. And in, I want to say 2000, I guess that issue, they interviewed Garm and it was for the Blake album, but he was talking about how they were working at the time on, on another sort of like a follow-up to Keldsinger called, songs of the wretched or something like that and they just were yeah. like they wanted to do an album that was like Keld singer but more sophisticated and more modern right and more or more like a, like a soundtrack and i'm wondering if that was the sort of the, the 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 beginnings of what became shadows of the sun yeah i think i i think i did read about that you're right there was something that they abandoned and they kind of then morphed into what well, the sun. they also abandoned the the string and the string ensemble version of Natan's Madrigal, which I would still fucking love to hear. Yeah, they recorded yeah. it, but it, they never released it. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. I, I we, we forgot to mention that. Um, man, dude, uh, this album is you know, <laughs> I I love Perdition City. It is my favorite, but this probably is right. No, this it, it's neck and neck for me. I get it. I get it. Yeah, if I. I mean, if, if I had to choose one over album, I would be this one. This is the one. Okay, yeah. yeah. And that doesn't shock me at all, knowing you the little bit that I do and knowing, but knowing your career arc and knowing the type of music that you play and like to write, it, it makes yeah. complete I mean, sense. I'm going to spend the rest of my life wanting to make an album as good as this one. Yeah. How about that shit, right? And I'm not going to, and I'm not going to succeed. You <laughs> might, you might, you might, you might. So, you never know, you like, might. The one, like thing you don't, the one thing you don't have that they do, though, they have an advantage over you. You know what that is, right? Uh, no. <laughs> the, go the government helps them. Oh, yeah, sure. The art, the art endowments. They got, they've got money from the government. And they, not and they've got access to, they've got access to a studio that they can use all the time. Right, right. They have right. access to lots of, inst of musicians. I mean, I'm having a fucking hard enough time getting a violinist for my solo record. Right. And they, you know, they have access to all that stuff all the time. So Right. And their their reputation in Norway is pretty right pretty eyebrow. So they're gonna be able to pull pretty much anything anybody they want. We ready to jump on again. If I was to tell somebody to come into Uza, that might be the album I might start with. I would tell them to check this out. Well, there you it's go. I, I haven't seen it. So yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the well, you get this the audio and the visual. You get kind of the the whole yeah. package of everything well, right and that's and that's a point that's a great point is over so my favorite bands were always the bands that were a full a complete package they had the great yep. music great yep. lyrics great image great design great everything the live performance they they clicked all those boxes and yeah, that's now, like like i went an amazing to, band i get that I, I went to you know i've seen rush who put on an amazing production you've seen them many many times yeah. one of the very best live bands you're ever going to see and mm -hmm. as much as people want to shit on Kiss, they still put on a spectacle. It's not something I'm into anymore, but they still, they used, you know, in the early days, they were the spectacle band. Nobody was doing that, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then you get to bands like, say, um, Iron Maiden. Maiden don't really go overboard, like Pink Floyd, I was thinking. Oh. Where you have, you know, the pig flying in, the plane flying in, and it's a whole... It's a whole spectacle of everything. It's in yeah. it, Roger Waters, same thing. We love him or like him or don't like him at all. He puts on a stunning visual show along with the music, right? Porcupine right. Tree, my friends, right? They knew from the early – dude, I saw them in the early days when, you know, it, like before IA came out, before New Century came out. And they were, just a, they were just a band on the stage. You know, they didn't have much panache to them. And then they moved forward, and now they're – Playing to fifteen thousand people the last tour, and they've got this mega production that's over the top. So, you know, there's something to be said for that. And I would think you probably would love to have a production like that, but you don't have the budget for it, right? 
Well, I mean, we do our best. <laughs> right. But I mean, if you had the, if you had an unlimited budget, like maybe I would think that. Well, Lisa okay. Gets a pretty big budget to do those shows. Right. You know, and you know, it's like, and that's kind of the challenge for us is, you know, how can we put on a great performance with limited means? Right. And like, you know, we've been discussing doing the mantle in its entirety. And I'm just like, I don't uh, want to just go up there and play it in front of banners. I want to have, I want to have three fucking film screens at three times, you know, and I'm, right. I'm, I'm researching like short throw projectors that I'm using for my own solo stuff, how I can incorporate that kind of visual element to our music. Right. We'll probably, we'll probably hire another guitarist just to fill it out more. Fill and it out, right. Right. You know, and it doesn't take a lot of money to do that really. Um, but you're going to give the audience a great, a great yeah, a, a performance. You just walk away and go, wow, that was yeah. insane. And keep in mind when Ulvik come over to the States, they don't do a United States tour. They do a, a fly-in. They do like New York, we, Chicago. What's yeah. that? Yeah. They, they do what we do now. Right. Because for them, they can, they can afford to do those one big shows. I, I think they did. Did they do Radio City or was it Beacon Theater? They played Irving Plaza. I know that because we played it. Well, Irving Plaza is not very they, big. He did two nights. And that's not a very big venue. That's like eleven hundred. Is it two? I thought it was eleven hundred. I don't know. We played it. We sold it out, and it was like two thousand. Okay, I've been there a bunch of times. Saw yeah. Killing Joke there. Saw a lot of bands there. I just yeah. didn't remember. Oh, yeah, venue. cool venue. Yeah, it's it's kind of historic, right? So, all right, yeah. let's move on to War of Roses now. This is Move. another one. I do not own this. I thought I did, but I can't find it. Um, I love it. I and love it. yeah, dude, here's one. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought this was another Blood Inside album. Like as I'm approaching this, I'm going, man, I kind of remember that being like Blood Inside. And I just, nah, this is a killer album, man. <laughs> the first song reminds me of Fate's Warning. Uh, February? Yeah, the first the first track. Really? Yeah, it's got that kind of like well, I mean, it's got that sort of like almost progressive rock, progressive metal kind of tinge but to it. But it's more synthy though. I mean, it's got a lot more synth going, right? Yeah. Um, Maybe it later. Came out April twenty fifth, two thousand eleven, on Jester. It's uh again, it's over uh, John Fryer, Jamie Gomez, Arellano. I don't know who these guys are, but uh, obviously they're probably producers in in of some notoriety, but. You know, to me, um, I, I was shocked by this album. Like, I really thought it was going to suck. How did they get away with that? <laughs> is, I can't tell. Oh, young girls, Two naked girls. <laughs> yeah, you it's know? kind of the it's kind of the Scorpion Virgin Killer thing. I mean, right? are, are those his kids? Could be. Oh, yeah, that's it. Well, they they things are different over in the Scandinavian countries, probably. <laughs> Uh, you wouldn't yeah. get the way you wouldn't get an American label doing that. Yeah, I'm reminded of the controversy that Nirvana is dealing with now. Yeah, or you think know. about going back, go back to fucking Scorpions and Virgin Killers. Holy shit, man! Yeah, um, crazy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, what what are your thoughts on this one here? Well, you know, it's interesting. There's there are a lot of moments on this record that remind me of Kate Bush's The Dreaming. Ah, oh, yes. In, in atmosphere and also in some of the songwriting. Yes. Um, and my favorite song on here is Island. I love that song. I have to look at my notes. I somehow dropped way below where I was at. And yeah, it's uh, lost second one. to the last track. Yeah, I'm getting there. Hold on. <laughs> I don't have a. I don't have a. Uh, I don't have a, a mouse for my Mac yet because I have to get the. Uh, the little plug in with the, the, the mm -hmm. oval, yeah, I know, yeah, That's annoying. Um, good old uh, Mac, they love to fuck you with their proprietary shit. So, which song was oh, uh, Island, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, this album gets off to such a strong uh start with February MMX, Nor Norwegian Gothic, man. I mean, it's yep. kind of that's kind of a massive attack song, yeah, the ambient, yeah. The ambient vibe of it, and. Attila from Mayhem's on it, which is kind of weird because I don't really hear him. Do you? Not really. Not like pronounced. He's, he's, he's probably doing his his more normal not, voice. He has normal like experiment. Not that, not that, uh, 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 yeah. that, that weird operatic thing he does. Yeah. 
I, I gotta say, man, that's a beautiful song. I love the first song so much. It's a little more EDM overall. This album, yeah. Uh, Stone Angels sounds a lot like Current Ninety Three to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I gotta say though, Providence, man. Oh my God, dude, that yep. song is so achingly beautiful. The, the oh, female yeah. vocalist. Oh yeah. It, I mean, it just ah, uh, it just. Could have stood a little bit of trimming, maybe a tiny little bit, but man, it's it hits so fucking hard. That vocal, the vocal performance on that album is great. Or on that song, September Fourth, cool, kind of a pop song, man. Kind of a foreboding where we're going soon, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I England, another cool track. Kind yeah. of defies most conventional heavy rock normalcy of writing, you know, of how songs are written. And then that last track. It's kind of a dark ambient track, more or less, right? Well, yeah, it reminds me of there's a there's a current ninety three album or it's an EP called "I Have a Special Plan for This World." It reminds me of that. Yeah, and a little bit of Basinski in there with or or even current ninety three's Faust. It reminds me of that a little bit too. Yeah, yeah. Just the uh, name Tibet, David Tibet, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just that you know the narration with the the noises in the background and you know yeah, i think it's a little long for me it could have dropped yeah, or no no song. that song yeah i could have gone with it being like seven or eight minutes as opposed to almost 15 that's my only that's my yeah. only negative about the album and i'm giving it a i'm giving it a nine out of ten man i i i was blown away by because i thought it was like blood inside it's not it's not i have a weird the, the title kind of bugs me. Oh, the War of the Roses. Oh, he's, the ta he's talking about the War of the Roses, the Lancaster. I know, I know, but yeah. it's just, it's the fact that it's just, it's Wars of the Roses. It's just, oh, it doesn't, Wars it doesn't flow very well in my in my mind. Oh yeah, Wars of the Roses. I didn't notice that. Yeah, yeah. But that's one I got to get. So I'm definitely going to pick that one up for sure. Um, and I do like. I really do like that Norwegian Gothic song, man. Yeah. Super ambient, um, and it's just got this weird. It sounds gothic. It sounds gothic. It's really cool. Yeah. All right. So you noted the Norwegian National Opera, uh, yeah. DDD, which came out uh, November twenty eighth, two thousand eleven. Recorded July thirty first, two thousand ten. It's about two hours long. Came out on Jester and Casco. Casco being mm -hmm. uh, the U the U UK label. And right. they put out they put out Wars of the Roses too. Oh, they, oh, they did. I missed yeah. them. Okay. I think they put out Teller's End as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, they did. The director was what's his name? Erlen Gertsen. Oh, let me get back to that. Gertsen. Um. And they had a uh, they had a performance by somebody who used to do performance art for Coil. Um, oh wow. Yeah, uh, you'd have to see it to, to know what I'm talking about. It, it, it's it's bookended by this this performance piece by oh god, what's his name? He he recently passed away actually. Um, but anyway, he he did a lot of performance stuff with Coil as well. Well, I think you know, I think something we got to talk about though is during the first 15 years of their life as a band, they mm -hmm. never performed live. That's mind blowing. Well, they did. They did one show in '93. Well, that's right. They did that. What they were the they were kids as a they band. opened for they opened for Beyond Dawn. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Okay. But I mean, other than that performance, that's true. Um, I mean, it's well, they it said the exception of the single show in Oslo in '93 where they played songs from the demo. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of crazy that it took them. I mean, and I I'm surprised, like. I'm surprised you didn't tell me you didn't fly over for that or something like that. I wanted to, but yeah. Yeah. Cost. Yeah. Cost and that was flight. also, that was in the height of me doing my own touring. So I figured that we would just run into each other eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't have that. I'm going to definitely pick that up. Let's talk about childhood then. So I had the distinct pleasure of seeing, of watching them debut these songs at Roadburn in yeah. 2012 to a very, yeah, to a very, a uh, huge confused, audience. yes. And I loved it. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Um, even though you are 10 years younger than me, I, I gotta believe that I'm a sixties kid, right? You're a seventies kid as far as being born. 
Well, I'm more um, of an 80s kid. Well, I'm right. But I mean, I mean, as far as being born, you were born in the 70s. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was born in 66. So a lot of these songs were just coming out when I was born. And I got to tell you, man, this fucking album, it is so good. Oh, yeah. I, I love it. And now, could I name drop every single song or no? Of course, I know Bracelets of Fingers from the Pretty Things. That's awesome. Uh, Everybody's Been Burned by the Birds. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great song. Oh, my God. Today by the Airplane. Awesome. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, I Had Too Much to Dream Last Night. Awesome. I love the original, but I love their interpretation. Uh, I, You know, another one I really, really love is um, Magic Hollow. Yeah. That song yeah. is gorgeous, man. Yeah, really good song. I, really, there's not one... Here's the thing about this. Usually covers albums, you can kind of go, eh. And, you know, I, do I really want to hear I don't, Jack Black do, or not Jack Black, what's his name? Jack, whoever, the dude from the White Stripes. Jack, what's his name? Oh, God. Uh, what is his name? Shit, Jack White. Jack White. I said Jack Black. Jack White. <laughs> <laughs> got a little buzz. Not a it's big one. His nemesis. <laughs> nemesis, right, right. But Jack, yeah, do I want to hear Jack White do like 10, you know, no. But the thing with Uber is they take these songs and they they shape them into, they some of them they stay really true to, but it's just they overize them, you know? And they're, yeah. and, they're and the and every, every song here kind of has this sheen to it, like this magical kind of feeling as you're listening to it. And for me, as a guy that's, you know, came from this decade, the 60s, it's really kind of special. I, I love this album, John. Yeah. It took me a while to get into buying the, you know, buying it. Cause I, I just, I'm not interested in, in, um, covers records. Cover albums. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing, but and it's I, worth owning, right? It's worth owning. I picked this up at Roadburn in 2016, I think. Okay. What's that? Um, seven. It's a seven inch of them playing. I think it's live versions maybe, or maybe it's, uh, no, this is actually, uh, no. Okay, so these are studio versions, and it's got a song called "River River Reverbation Doubt." Is that on right. the album? Is that yeah, on the yeah. Oh, so. Okay, so she yeah, has just two tracks from the from the album on a seven inch. Well, that's pretty cool. That's a nice little collector's item. And you, you said you were at Roadburn, and they played this whole album. Well, they played it not in order, but they played all the songs from it. Did yeah. they really? And then they did that was their whole set. Yeah, and then they did an improv jam at the end. Ah, oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And I think that that how many guys like, play live with them normally? Huh? How many guys are on the the ensemble? How many guys? Is it? I'm trying to think. Um, I think five. Yeah, five or six people. Really? Yeah. That's when, crazy. I, saw in 20, when I saw them in 2017 doing the Assassin Assassins album. They had they had just one guy playing bongos. <laughs> Well, that's very that's in very addition to drummer in yeah. addition to garm with the timpani you know so it's very very dead can right i mean you know that's what I, yeah and that's what i told yeah. him yeah um yeah I, I love this album i'm gonna give it a 9.75 out of 10. Uh, i yeah. love it that much i'm like mind blown by how good it is and i bought it a while ago and i kind of listened to it once i don't know what was going on but i was like yeah i'll get back to it and i never went back to it and then thanks to our deep dive i put it on Last late last night when I got in from horrendous, I'm like, man, this is fucking incredible, you know. Um, all right, moving on, we'll get on to um, Mesa. Yeah, what is it, Mesa? What does that mean? Do we know? Uh, could it mean? What's? Well, let, let me see if I can find out. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what in this context. I don't. Know I'm thinking it's, it's like time periods. Could be. I mean, it, it, it's it's kind of a title that reminds me of something Arvo Parrot would do. Yeah, <laughs> you know? here we go. Here we go. I got it. The dictionary defines. Oh shit! Where'd it go? <laughs> I'm thinking of I'm I'm thinking of Meza in terms of cuisine. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. So my mind kind of went blank. It's got to be Norwegian, right? Well, isn't it kind of like a? Here we go. I got. It. Here we go. 
to chant. Kind of here. To chant. That makes sense. No, it's, like, it's like a mass. It's like a yeah, like a mass. That yeah. was uh, that was the word I was trying to think of. Mass. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. To chant. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um. Uh, as Embers is asking, what's he saying there to you? I don't know. I don't see it. He's saying that you have to talk about and discuss dissections with John. Well, we kind of did. Maybe we can do that very quick at the end. No. Well, you know what I about? There's nothing to talk about. It's a it's a masterpiece. Moving on. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we did. We talked about it we in the interview. It. Yeah. You gotta you gotta go check out the interview with John and Don. I think we talked about that more after Don left. Yes. Because uh, we talked about the Reformation and we talked about how Don is not a guitar geek nerd. He doesn't know shit about what he's playing. Sorry, Don, you don't. But just being honest, all right. Well, he makes up for it in skill. He does. He definitely does. I'm the opposite. I've yeah, got a lot yeah, of right, right. And I suck. <laughs> All right. So let's get into Mesa IXVIX. Came out October 8th, 2013. Recorded uh, September of 2012. Comes out on. Uh, Old Ulver is the uh, producer. This, to me, this is Ulver's chamber orchestra album. Yeah, well, that's and, exactly what it is. And it's, it's fucking stunning album. It's, it's incredible. It's, it's stunning. It's up there with Shadows. It is. It absolutely is. It's kind of like a partner album to it. It's like a sister album to Shadows. Yeah, in a, in a different kind of way because you don't have a lot of the electronics going on. No. But you, it's just, it has that same vibe that if you're in a good place, it's incredibly uplifting. If you're probably in a dark place, it might be a little bit... It might get yeah. you in the fields. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, um, in, it, there is elements of, once again, Arvo Parrot. And I hear it in, in some of this music as well. And I know they're fans. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a lot of contemporary classical. I hear that in this. Yeah. You hear Mahler. You hear Holst. Um, Gorecki. Those are the things yeah, that. You hear Gorecki for sure. Influencing them. Nurse with Wound. 70s Kraut Rock. Ashra Temple, you know, Audubon from uh, from um, Kraftwerk, John, and even John Carpenter uh, scores. But here's an interesting one: Tin Drum, Japan. Makes uh, sense. You all know that? No. Oh, John. Uh, I gotta school you on the fucking Japan well, stuff, my friend. I don't know about everything. <laughs> you uh, yes, you do. Now, come on. All right. <laughs> I got to get you into Japan. You'll dig them a lot. Um, oh, the Terry band Riley also. Terry, band uh, Japan. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I know them. Yeah, that's Tin Drum. That's their oh. masterpiece album. That was their last. Oh, album. Oh, I thought, gonna, I thought there was a band that you were. No, talking no, about. no, the last album, Tin Drum. I okay. was like, how do you not see? You do know everything. See, I knew you would. <laughs> um, all right, let's get into this one real quick. Uh, I'll give my thoughts, and I'll let you go. You go. Um, man, the opening. <laughs> well, the opening song as Syrians. Pour in, comma, Lebanon grapples with ghost of a bloody past. It was named after a news piece by Reuters concerning the flood of Syrian refugees into Lebanon following the ongoing Syrian conflict. This is going back 10 years almost now with, uh, what was his name? I forget the Syrian leader. Um, I can see his face, but I can't. King Assad? Uh, anyways. That sounds about right. Um, yeah. Th this uh, pro. Uh, I'm sorry, hang on. Refugees in London, Lebanon following the ongoing Syrian conflict. However, Christopher Rigg has stated the appropriation is uh, not any more or less political other than an indication of concern. We live in troubled times. The song itself has a distinct Middle Eastern feel to it, and we, uh, it was appropriate. Uh, uh, and we couple with the sounds of vultures and war, the title seemed both appropriate and well contemporary. But we have no ideology for sale, only our sadness. Which is, you know, this guy is a pretty brilliant guy, man. Like, to make a statement like that is pretty fucking heady. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking about a horrific global political problem like like this, we have it now. We have it now going on. It'll never end. It's, it's no. the trail of human suffering that we like political leaders and money, money, the accumulation of wealth with just certain people, this is what they do. This is mm -hmm. who they are. And 
So this song, man. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I don't even know what to put into words. I, it's, it's one of the most strikingly amazing things Oliver has ever done, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I think it's just that palpably human. It's it's mind blowing. The use of space, shadow, light, nuance, subtlety. The overall dark melodies are mind blowing. It's a monster song to open the album with, and it's a statement. It's a statement. Yeah. Of this is. You need to, you need to fucking pay attention mm -hmm. to this, because what we have to say is important. And I, it's again, it, it, <clears throat> if you don't get this, you're really not human, in my opinion. I, that's what I feel. Uh, if you don't get this song and it doesn't strike you and hit you hard, you're not a fucking human being. That's just how I feel about it. Um, I, I don't even really need to say anything about the rest of the tracks because that song is so fucking incredible. Yeah, you should buy the album just for that song. Absolutely. But it does it does get better. Son of Man is incredible. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, the last Mother of Mercy is incredible. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, I don't know. You say a word or two about it. Well, no, the, the thing I like the most about this record. I mean, you've said everything about the, the music, but the design of this record is is gorgeous. I mean, this booklet, the minimalism. It's just, you know, and like, you know, it's just like the minimalism of this, of this design. My first over album. Brilliant. Yeah. So it just, it, it encapsulates the, the mood and everything of this record perfectly. Um, that's really all I have to say about it. But, I mean, it, but it's, would you agree it's a sorrowful record though, overall? It is. I would say that side B isn't as much. Right, it goes into jazz territory on 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 the second beat. And a little bit, a little bit, yeah. I mean, but the first side of the album is just it just yeah, it's that's world it. weary, man. It's world weary. It just makes you it makes you connect with parts of yourself that Maybe. if you can't connect, you're a fucking psychopath. There's something wrong with you, you know. And that how many bands can really pull that off, John? Well, how and many bands do it all the time, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing that really struck me about Over that. That's really interesting is the, the, the way that they've managed to put out a re something, a record, an EP, whatever. Almost every, every year. Every year. Yeah. I mean, the creativity that's involved. I mean, granted, they may yeah. have, you know, they, they, they have access to a studio that they can constantly right. work and stuff. That helps. Right. But still, it's just like, I mean, I don't have that much creativity. <laughs> no, and, and that's the thing. It's like. You have to tap into that, man. If you if it's there yeah. and you don't exploit it, it goes away, right? Yeah, um, you do have to show up. You have to show up. That's a good way of putting it. You got to show up. Yep. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I tell you, this album, it, right there with Perdition and Shadow, it's the top three for me. Um, and I like some of the stuff that's coming up. Uh, one in particular quite a bit. But they're they're rather different from this uh, going forward a little bit, yeah. I think. Um, and so I'm trying to move quick for you here. Um, yeah, this, I don't have much to say about this. Yeah, I don't know it. So I don't really, I'm not going to comment, but. It's got look, one track that's really cool. The first one has the uh, has the trumpets, right? I think so. Yeah. It wasn't the but, yeah, it's, it's kind of a drone, dark ambient album with a lot yeah. of like glitch and stuff. It's more, just, they're more exploring that side. And obviously with Sun, you, if you know Sun, you know. That's another band that has a niche and it has a thing that it does, but they're fairly courageous too when they get outside the box, whether it be yeah. Sun One with the Black album or <clears throat> Sun Two with the more droney thing or, or the Altar thing with Boris, mm -hmm. um, which I saw actually. I saw one of those two shows. It might have been the only show they did. I can't remember. Um, well, and Sun and Over go all the way back. Um, if you if you Oh, did yeah. you? I didn't know that. Well, yeah, I mean, Stephen O'Malley, my old buddy O'Malley, he had the Scent magazine and interviewed Olver in the second issue. That was the first Olver interview I ever saw. Oh, and okay, was, I didn't know that. I mean, I remember when I w w was talking to O'Malley back in '94. He was asking me, "Have you heard Olver?" And I was like, at the time, I I was like, "No," yeah. but that was right. That was right before right Shane. Before, yeah, right yeah. before. Do so, you um is Steven is he still in Paris or where is he at? Yeah, he's in Paris. Oh, he lives over there. Okay. I mean he's I, I would say he's more of a citizen of the world. He doesn't he doesn't stay migrate. 
He's like, well, no, like he's, Jazz Coleman. I think he's migrant. based he's based in Paris, but he's always traveling. He's always doing stuff. Ah, so. That's nice if you can do it, man. That, that's definitely nice for you. It's exhausting. I mean, I was doing it for a while, and I don't know. I like burned, to it burned you out a little bit. It burned me out. I mean, yeah. with Florian especially, but I don't know. I like to. I like a. I like a little bit more balance. I like what Agalock's doing right now. You like a home base. Yeah. yeah. And you're older too. I mean, you know, like. Well, he's my. He, He's one year older than me. Yeah, it's uh, but I, I get well, and some people are like that, man. I mean, yeah. Jazz Coleman still doesn't own a home. He just floats. Really? Go, yeah, he doesn't own a home. Well, now that Jordy died, maybe he should buy one. <laughs> yeah, did you see his? Uh, did you see his text? Uh, his message to Jordy on his Instagram? No. Oh man, Ooh. we dedicated our set in Denver. To, I saw that. I thought that was fucking yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, uh, Jordy. So unique. What a big influence. No, nobody ever sounds like has ever sounded like that. Yeah, and nobody ever will. So they might I don't as well, think so either, man. They might he as well ran stop. stereo. He ran stereo on the way he well, we won't get it. We'll talk about it privacy. Well, that's that's one of the things that influenced my own setup too. Is oh, that, is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. How how many times did you see him? Well, I, we we played with Killing Joke at Roadburn in 2012. Oh, yeah, that's right. That was Were that they was the headliners? No. That was the lineup of my dreams, because it was, it was Agaloc, Disembowelment, Over, um, Killing Joke, and yeah. and Voivod headline. That's my, right, I remember that one when I was younger. What a fucking masturbatory and, and, and dream. And Ohm was there too. What's that? <laughs> and Ohm was there too. Ohm from uh, Om, you know, yeah, OM. yeah, J Jason Reuter and uh, the guys from. Um, Who's in that band? I'm trying. It's I Jason. Know, I, from, I didn't watch them because I was, you know. Yeah, it's it's Jason. Ready for it. It's Jason from uh, fuck Steve on Till's band. Yeah, it's that. That band. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm trying to remember who's on guitar for that. I can't remember. Anyway, um, yeah. Okay, so the Terrestrials album. John gives it a kind of a thumbs up, mostly. I never listened to it. You know. So it's not super gripping. Yeah. No. No, I I kind of I listen to it as much as I listen to the Riverhead soundtrack. It's it's like that or, okay. or like themes. All right, well, we'll, we'll, yeah. So I, that's one I'm not. It's one I'm not rushing out to grab. Um, no, no. And and I like Sun. I have a lot of Sun, but I just don't. Um, I I prefer them live. Yes, yeah, like, that's an Al Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I prefer their live albums to their studio albums. Uh, who's that? Son. Son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, have you seen him live? You've seen him live, right? Yeah, a couple yeah. times. Oh, man. I thought I was going to actually shit myself on there. <laughs> like, I'm like, <laughs> the way the fucking music was so yeah. intense and loud. And I didn't take, uh, you know, they, and actually when I saw him, they had Attila because it was for Monuments and uh, Dimensions. Yeah. And he was wearing the fucking mirror suit with the red lasers up pointers. It was like, what the fuck? Like, I wasn't high. I wasn't even drinking back then. I'm like, right. I felt fucking stoned when I walked out of that place because of all the smoke. Yeah. And, yeah. I, all saw right. them, I saw them three times. Yeah. I've only seen them once. Only once. Um, they did, never came around a lot. Like, so. All right. Let's go to real quick here. Let's get to. Do you want to just skip right ahead to the Assassins? Or do you want to do. Yeah. I mean, there's. Focus have, on the main albums. Yeah. They have another album called ATGCLVI, yeah. blah, 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 blah. I don't know anything about it. It's a live album, but here's the cool thing about this record. This is actually a really interesting concept. So what they did is they did a tour, and they played a lot of they they basically played improv sets. Yeah, right, right. And then they took all that material and they recorded each show, and they took all the material and just spliced it up and turned it into music. Oh, cool idea! What a great. So record. it's all live sets, but then it's they created live. something different out of yeah. it. Yeah, really. Wow. Awesome. So I've never it's even worth, seen, it's worth checking out. I've never seen that album before. That that kind of caught me off guard today. I'm like, what is this thing? I missed. Yeah. I must have looked over. So I'll look into that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, worth. Basically, it. uh, they just say it's um, music called for multi-track recordings made at twelve different improvisatory, as you say, free rock live shows. The band uh, performed in February of fourteen. Later edited and enhanced. By Daniel O'Sullivan, I don't know, I guess a producer. The album has been described was, as ultimately a piece. Uh, what's that? He was the guitarist in the band. Oh, okay. 
It says basically ultimately a piece of work that exists above and beyond any conventional live recordings. Yeah. Rather a hallucinatory travel log as potent and experienced to bear witness to as yeah. uh, as well as a concert. I'll have to look into that one. Um, yeah. that, that's one I probably need. Riverhead, anything to say about Because I don't know anything about it. I can't it. even, yeah, no. I've listened to it maybe twice. Yeah, that it's came out December 16th, 20, uh, December 9th, 2016. Uh, yeah, 42 minutes. House of Myth. Now we're, we're seeing the House of Mythology. Yeah. Is that the last one too, I think? Yeah, last one. I think that might be the first one that came out on whatever House of Mythology is. I don't, I'm not really sure. Terrestrials came out on Southern Lore, which is mm -hmm. Greg Anderson and uh, Stephen O'Malley's la label. That, um, all right, so we pass by Riverhead, you know, approach with caution. Uh, then we get to 2017. We're almost there, dude. Uh, the assassination of Julius Caesar yeah. uh, comes out April 7, 2017, recorded. 2016. I can't find my copy. I have it on CD. Yeah, I got it on vinyl and CD. Is that a slipcase CD? I think it is, isn't it? No, it's just. No, I thought it, all right, I thought it was. Uh, it was recorded at Subsonic Society in Oslo. It's out on the House of Mythology, which I guess. There's this. Came, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to talk about that briefly. Because yeah. um, that comes after. Uh, yeah. Man. Another fucking killer album. That, I had a weird. My, my first impression of that album was actually seeing it live because when it was released, I was on tour. I was, I was on tour in Europe with Pelorian when it was released. And I remember Steven telling me the guitarist of Pelorian telling me, Oh, the new over came out and I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, I love to hear it, but I want to like, I want to sit down with it. I don't want to like listen to it casually on the, you know, right. And so, but that was when we played Roadburn was that year. And so they were doing that album that was the premiere of that album. And, okay. and so I got to see those songs for the first, hear those songs for the first time, seeing them live. And what'd you think? I loved it. Uh, I, I have a distinct memory of hearing the song, uh, so falls the world and just thinking, this is incredible. Yeah. You know, this is, yeah. this is, you know, um, so, but we should say this is back to a more synth pop sort of vibe. Well, this uh, is like their tears for fears record. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> keep stealing my shit. I gotta go. <laughs> that's why I keep, that's why I jump in front of you because I'm gonna say that many, many times, in fact, here. Um, you know, Nemoralia, badass synth pop track, man. Well, and here's the game. everybody says that they, this is their Depeche Mode album, and I talked to Chris backstage at Roadburn about that, and he said that he does he's not even a fan of Depeche Mode. He doesn't listen to Depeche Mode. It was not an influence, and he's sick of people saying that. Kind of like when people would say that Agaloc was an Opeth ripoff, and I can't fucking stand Opeth. Uh, so, man. <laughs> I never I never thought you guys ripped off Opeth. I think... Um, we were I, ripping off In the Woods and Over. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I hear that more. Um, yeah, I hear that more. Like, if anybody was ripping off Opeth, it was it was Paul and, uh, and November's dude. That, that's clear. But in a good way. Because I love Paul, he's a great dude. So, but they they did take some guidance from Opeth, there's no doubt. And you know, like we said, that very first Bergton album, I hear Orchid and Morning Rise in there a lot. So there's I I don't. <laughs> I do, man. I do. I disagree. Maybe with you want to hear it? <laughs> maybe I do. Maybe. maybe. Are you a fan of Opeth though? No. <laughs> really? Oh. No. All right, you gotta explain that live now. Come on. I have nothing to explain. I, uh, <laughs> I, I listen. I remember hearing or Orchid, thinking it was pretty decent Swedish melodic death metal at the time. Well, it's kind of like Maiden. It's kind of like Maiden with a little bit yeah. more black and metal -y then, vocals. And then I heard Morning Rise, because Don Don was a big fan, and there's some great moments on it. But it's just, I don't know. There's just something about their sound that never. Never corresponded with me. So it never worked when we got to no. uh, Still Life or Blackwater? Oh, or? God, no. Um, wow. Um, you heard it here first, guys. First guys. Not, and here's the thing. I respect the hell out of Mikel. Sure. And, and we, I think him and I have lots of similar taste in music. Yeah, yeah. And that might be why there's some similarities in our in our music, is we're, we're drawing from the same sources. But I was never an Opeth fan, ever. Well, and I'm I, still not. I will say this. Um, I never heard Opeth in Agalon. Never. 
So when, when Pale Folklore came out, everyone was just like, oh, this is just no. a poor man's version of Opeth no. you know, by an American band. And we're it pissed no. us off. It's like, tell us, tell us we're a poor man's in the woods and we'll be like, okay with that. Yeah. A green carnation or yeah, I, I'm not, not really a big fan of them either. There's no <laughs> way. There's no way though. That's not, I do not hear Opeth in your music. Um, interestingly, that's funny. Maybe just because you had acoustic guitars. I don't know. But so did so many other bands. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I mean, Dissection had acoustic guitars too. Well, let's, let's, that's true. Let's get back to assassination. I, I have some. Yes, that's a much better thing to talk about. <laughs> so we're back to synth pop. Nemoralia, super badass synth pop track. Vocals yeah. are killer. The whole chorus is a massive earworm. It's almost dark pop, dark disco, actually, in a weird way. Um, I don't like to, the song Rolling Stone. What's that? I don't like the song Rolling Stone. I like it until the end. No, that's my favorite part. You like the glitchy ending part? It's too long. I think it's too long. But I hate the fucking chorus. I like it, man. I think it's good. Um, but but it's okay. It's it's okay. But so fall the world, man. Oh, dude. Oh, what a stunning. And Southern stunning. Gothic. I mean, those two songs together. Oof. And Garm's voice on it is insane, oh, yeah. man. The production is oh. just smooth as silk, too. Uh, I say magical the dark piano melodies diving uh, driving the song along the chorus is just gorgeous almost gospel like it has a gospel vibe to it yeah like like pop gospel in a weird way. um or synth pop gospel well, this, yeah. album, this album reminds me of what shadows of the sun would sound like if it was more upbeat and had more, more upbeat yep exactly upbeat. And it, like for example southern gothic yeah that gurgles and bubbles along Mm -hmm. Almost like a here you go. You ready? Almost like a Simple Minds or Tears for Fears song. Absolutely, it's hella damn amazing. And then we get to Angelus. Good song. I love that song. It, that Melancholy. song leads up to my favorite song. What's that? That song leads up to my favorite song. Honestly. Okay. Uh, melancholic and pulsating, truly mesmerizing. Garm is stunning as always. The vocal lines are captivating. Especially the chorus, it's just so uplifting and human and fragile. And then we get to Trans Vibration, which wow. is a lush pop dance floor song. Love it. If it was 50 more BPM, it would remind me of Human League or something like that. It would just have yeah. that, you know, almost like that, don't you want me, baby? It has that vibe to it. It's but. so silky smooth. The chorus is great. Everything about it is great. And it rem I have a really wonderful memory connected to it that mm -hmm. you know every time i listen to that song it takes me back to that my my hotel room in yeah. South brazil isn't that great uh, that's so great. yeah because i yeah when I, I i did a solo set in sao paulo brazil in oh, 2017 wow. um I, I played with enslaved and soul Sapphire and latest Scret. it was part of a festival in, in oh, wow wow uh, killer and my and i you know i got my own my own hotel room because i was a solo guy so right. and i just remember listening to that song and watching the sunset over the city and it just fit the vibe so perfectly. And Sao Paulo is massive. Like it's like New York city. Yeah. Right? Oh, or bigger, actually. I think it's yeah. bigger. Yeah. I think it is bigger. I think but it's I mean, like 35 million. In there or something. Yeah. And then, but then it's funny. Cause it's like, I was, I was getting ready to go out that evening to, to explore the city or at least mm -hmm. that district that I was in. And uh, I remember listening to that song like three times while wow. the sun was setting. And then I got out, I went out into the streets and I went to a cathedral nearby where there was this, this guy with an acoustic guitar singing and there no was, a, and it just, it, it was, it was like very much like, you know, over and it was an older yeah. experience. And then across the street from this, this cathedral was this esoteric shop that had like bones and weird, like religious. Oh ideas. yeah. It was just a, such a magical experience. And I just, I, whenever I hear that song, it transports me straight to right back. Yep. Yep. When you're and, out, when you're out publicly like that, do <clears throat> especially in a country like that, do people look at you a lot? Like, no, not not really. That you're just another dude. No more than people look at me anywhere else. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh, I, I was gonna say something else. I can't remember. Fuck. Oh, you were saying it was such a magical night and going out. Yeah. I whatever. <laughs> well, you got you. Come back to it. Um, yeah. So trans uh coming home. Probably the most weirdly challenging track on the album. Uh, it's a, it's a semi misstep. I, that's the one song I didn't like. Fall in love with. I like it. Don't love it. It's very unorthodox in structure. 
but it's experimental, maybe to a small fault. Uh, then the, the the version I listened to had Nemoralia live, which I didn't. I'm like, this sounds like, and then I'm like, oh shit, it's first track over, but it's live. Right. I, this is nine point seven five out of ten for me. It's amazing, it's amazing. Album. Um, yeah. And then we got over Sick Transi Gloria Mundi. I wish those songs were on this record because this record's too Dude, short. This, this, it's so good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, man. The first song, Echo Chamber. Uh huh. Ah, oh, yeah. really cool, shimmering pop, uh, synth driven song. Great vocals by, vocals by Garm. And the story is about the opening. I guess he opened the, and, and actually, I hear uh, Echo Chamber Room of Tears. Was easily standalone as a fitting counterpart to the former record. In the model of Nemoralia in 69, it represents a vast series of dense oblique references. And I guess the Room of Tears was alludes to the private papal quarters of the Vatican, where a newly crowned pope is afforded time to contemplate the suffering of the world. How's that for fucking heady yeah. material to write a song about, right? Yeah, hey, who the fuck writes a song about that, right? So I, know, I just realized what I was going to say. So that same night that I, that I had that experience um, was the same night that I heard that Harry Dan, St Harry, Harry Dean Stanton had died. Oh, really? One of my favorite actors growing up. Yeah. I love him too. And, all that. and yeah. so that, so I had that kind of in my head when I was yeah. in the streets and I had the music of Oliver kind of in my head and it kind of hit oh, hard. It's, yeah. It's yeah. a, and and I and it and it fits with the with the themes on this record, you know, of death and religion and you know, all that, you know. So yeah, you know, John, in that, that that's the great thing about really important music, man. It kind of it brackets our lives, right? It does. For guys Rush, like us. Huh? Rush is that way. Dude, you know, I, it's man, kind of my life, basically. I could tell you nine million stories about singular yeah. rush tracks like right. what i was doing when i was listening to that song driving to this place or doing that yeah it, yeah it is it's so important man uh and I, I wanted to mention on here i'm really curious to hear what you say about this i'll let you go first because you'll steal everything from me again uh but what i wanted to hear you talk about was bring out your dead sequencer driven electronic overdrive kind of Sounds like I can hear Nemorali in it a little bit. There's little sort bit, of yeah. shades of it. And then uh, it's pretty, but it's a cool song. It's a cool song. A little redundant. But how about the cover? Here's the funny thing. So when I heard that they did The Power of Love, I thought they were doing the Huey Lewis song. The power. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or, or we could even do King's X. Like, the power yeah. and, and when I heard, And when I thought that, it just made sense. I could I could hear them doing that. So yeah. But then when I heard the song, I was like, "Oh, it's um it's that one, Frank. It's that version. The, the yeah. Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Yeah, and it is fucking amazing. It's, it's I, great. That Frankie Goes to Hollywood record is amazing too. It is, dude. I love, I love that album. Man. It's like it's it. like a poppy version of Coil because it's very gay, but it's oh. also very. It's just it's got this vibe, you know. Yes, 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 yes. amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that Power of Love is super understated darkly lush piano garms killer voice the chorus is so incredible the only thing i think that i didn't like about it, slight little thing was they do a backwards guitar thing where he's you know it's like wah, 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 and i felt that was a little odd of a choice but that that's what they do oh man it's a nine out of ten man like these tracks should have been on that album i agree uh, i think they were okay. unfinished that's why they didn't put them on and then there's something called drone activity. Do you have that? Yes. I don't have that, and I don't know anything about it. So, uh, it's this, right? Yeah. Is that live or is that studio? Or what is it? Live. It's so it's a it's it's a live thing that they did for I think the Red Bull Academy, and that's what it was. Um, September of last year, we received an invitation from Red Bull Music. Yeah, so they, it was. A, it's a show that they recorded for Red Bull Music Academy. Is it? It's an improvised set or what? It's it's a mixed thing. It's I mean, yes and no because I think there's elements from other. There's there's pieces. There's bits and bobs from some of their other albums interspersed into the. Okay. Music. Okay. So it's. I think it's a mix of improv and non-improv. I don't listen to it that much. 
is it something you'd recommend or is it for collectors only? It's worth a listen. I don't know if you'd want to buy it, but it's worth a listen. And just, that. and I don't have the new, I don't have the latest live album. I, I'm waiting for Second Avenue to get it. I don't have any of the live stuff, so I'm just being. I'm I'm a I'm a poser. All right, so we get to Flowers of Evil, dude. We're almost there. This? What about this? Oh, what did I miss? This is another live album. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I don't generally go too deep on lives, but go yeah. ahead. If you want to this talk is the that. hexahedron. This is a very droning record, but then they have a. There's a version of. Um, I think that's on this. Or it might be on Drone Activity. There's a version of the. They do a performance of the last track from. Uh, from Perdition City. Oh. Yeah. But what's weird is, is it shows up, it's on here, but it's not part of the title. <laughs> so, wow. it's, yeah, it's in it's on one of these. I, I think it's on I'll this. have to look into some of those. I, I mean, do you feel, do you feel uh, that the live stuff is necessary if you're not like a super live guy? Like, I love to go to live shows, but I'm not, well, I'm not a guy that listens to a lot of live albums, man. Not what they do, but what they do is they, they, imp they do a lot of improv stuff. Okay, so, so it's not like it's just off the album. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I they're, have, not just, yeah. they're not just hooking a Mac up and letting tracks play. Right. Okay. It's like, you know, if I were to do live albums of my solo stuff, I wouldn't just play the songs and record them. I would do something interesting. Okay. You know, that's gotcha. that's what they're doing, you know. It, it right. reminds me a lot of, like, the, the live coil stuff, you know, which are yeah, hitting. Yeah, I'm, again, I'm coming up short on that because I don't own yeah. any of that stuff, so. Um, yeah. yeah, so there you go. John's saying they're probably well worth at least investigating to see if you want. Yeah. So let's get up to 2020. We're almost there. Um, yeah, we've got Flowers of Evil. I have it on CD somewhere here. Um, right here. Yeah. And um, this is the album I hear people say is their Depeche Mode album. I don't really hear that. I don't really hear that. Though. No, but it's, if you, I mean, I heard it from the horse's mouth that it's not. So there yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, if I would ever luckily get Chris, uh, you know, get Chris to join, I, I, uh, I will know never to bring that up. Well, hey, he, Chris, should, wouldn't you? he should be up anytime now. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. Right. He may be watching. Who knows? He may be watching us going, these guys are fucking idiots. Anyways. Yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, and by the way, Andrew Mills says, oh, yeah. "Thanks for what you do, and so happy for your success." Oh, I remember that guy. He was a he was a tape trader of mine back in the day. Oh, nice, nice, yeah. nice, nice. All right, so this album comes out uh, on August twenty eighth, twenty twenty, and uh, Subsonic Society recording, and it's happening House of Mythology and all the producers. So, uh, this is the twelve studio album. Uh, it was mixed by Martin Glover, Martin Glover, Youth of Killing yep. Joke, yep. which is interesting, uh, and Michael Rondal. Uh, the album was officially announced, da, 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 and they had a, a Russian doll and Lisa <clears throat> Valentine's Day. The second single, Little Boy, was made available on April 4th. The uh, album cover I just want to mention is uh, from a 1928 Carl, Carl Carl Theodore Dreyer, yep. who did Vampire, right? You know, Vampire. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, La Passion de Joan of Arc. So it's Joan of Arc, The Passions of Joan of Arc. The Passion of Joan of Arc. I don't yeah. have this, and I haven't seen it. I've seen bits of it. I heard it's really intense. It's, it's brilliant. Intense. It's brilliant. Yeah. And I love Vampire. That's one of my one of my favorite. Uh, what's, yeah, what's weird is this is a, a, a shot, a screenshot from one of the, from the movie, but they did some, they did something to it because it's not, I don't know. It's it's not exact. Okay. When I saw the movie, I was like, "Oh, there's there's that Ulvers." Oh, were you trying to find the spot? Yeah. Yeah, but then there's like there's I think I think this space here had some stuff uh, in it. Probably they probably uh, white uh, photoshopped it out. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. So all right, give me some thoughts on this one here. Well, this is the first time that they didn't really do a three or a one eighty. That's a good point. Very good point. Yep. But you know what? I think in a weird way, it's, I kind of see this album and the assassinations album as a pair. I see them very similarly, similarly to swans, their bunnies albums, the white light from the mouth of infinity and love of life. How white light is like an incredible masterpiece. 
and love of life kind of feels like leftovers. And I kind of feel like this is the leftovers. Exactly. Exactly. I, you took it. You took my exact thoughts again. Yep. By the way, I just got the four album uh, LP set of uh, songs for the uh, blind or no soundtracks. Yeah, soundtrack, soundtrack, soundtrack for the blind. Yeah. yeah. For it's my first time into the Swans. I've known about them for years, but that's oh. I hear that's the one to get. I don't know. Uh, no, get White Life from the Mouth of Infinity. Okay. Do it now. <laughs> do it right now. Hang yeah. on one second. <laughs> All right, we'll do that. I will grab that, but um, I will seven, wait. <laughs> seven, uh, yeah, can, uh, it will. Uh, we'll do it. I promise. Um, I, I, I'm I'm easily manipulated when it comes to uh, buying albums. Uh, Devin says Love Flowers was my second favorite. Machine Gun Peacock. Yeah. Uh, we're getting there. I, I agree with you, though. This is exactly what I said. Um, I said that it's a follow-up on from Assassination in that it probably bears the most resemblance to its predecessor, which is what you said, basically. Uh, but for the first time, I don't really hear much progression or experimentation with the sound. Like maybe these tracks were intended for Assassination, but ended up to whatever, you know, whether they weren't ready and whether they, they yeah. had to produce something and get something out. This sounds like leftovers from that album session. And I, I don't know how they work. You know how some bands will write like 20 songs and then they whittle it down to 12. Right, right. I don't know if they do that. Um, I mean, we don't. They might write 50 but, songs. We yeah, don't. but, you know, maybe they just, I don't know, maybe they, they felt compelled to just get this out as soon as possible to make their own personal deadline. I yeah. don't know. Um, I the, like the I like the album. I don't love it. It's not. I there's think, a couple of standout tracks, but it's Apocalypse not. Apocalypse 1993 is really good. What what's that? Apocalypse 1993. I like that one. I like Hour of the Wolf. Yes. I like Machine Guns and Peacocks because it's the most catchy, and I like Little Boy. But the rest, man, I just. I like a thousand cuts. That's a good song. It's all right. I don't love it. I, I don't love it. I mean, this I, is like their presto, right? <laughs> <laughs> ah, nice. Boom. Yeah, I'm excited. You know my favorite. <laughs> I know that's your favorite. And I really, that's when I started kind of like drifting on Rush, if there was such a thing. I bought everything, but I was like, eh. But you know what? I fucking love Presto now. I love it. Oh, love yeah. it, love it, love it. Incredible. Uh, the Past <laughs> one of the, the past is one of the greatest songs ever. And Chain Lightning's killer. It's a deceptively um, melancholic record. It is. Yeah. It's very melancholic under the surface. Oh, stuff like um, um, the whole side B, the title track. Yeah, what's the song? Oh, the wind can carry oh, available light. Available light. Oh, such Anagram, a beautiful song. Anagram is great. Anagram's uh, great. What's Anagram, the last song? Anagram. Hand over fist. Hand over fist is right before the last song. Available light's the last song. Oh, available light is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, I do love that album, but it took me a while, man. I had to kind of come back to it. like, yeah. But I love Scars. I love, uh, what's the uh, painted? Da, 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 da. Oh, War Paint. War Paint, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a good album. It's a really good album. It's um, very what, synthetic sounding, but that's a Rupert Hine yeah. production. So yeah. you get that you get that 80s, that early, late 80s. That was right. 89, 90? That was 89. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's interesting. That's your favorite album. That is really cool. Well, it... It, it you know it can't I, I heard it during a part of my life Another that's place. very it's, it's very nostalgic. Yeah. Um that and Roll the Bones are very nostalgic albums for me. And they were the and Roll the Bones I have a tough time with. Those, I like I love Ghost of a Chance. Those are my love interest it. albums though. Yeah, that that's how it works. I came in on hemispheres. Right. That's where I always go. Very well. Counterparts too. What's up? Counterparts is Counterparts is, was a was they didn't come back, but I mean, that was a really comeback album was um, a vapor trust. But I mean, uh, no. yeah, no, uh, no, well, yeah, Neil was they, away lost they, they fucking lost me with vapor trails. It, it no, took, no, I said the comeback album was vapor trails. Oh, oh, I thought you meant their, 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 their return to form was, yeah, was, no, 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 I don't like good. that album very much. No. I like the remix, but not the original the remix. The botchable remix is better. I like, um, what's it called? The second song. I don't know. <laughs> Arms, armor, armor and shield. Maybe. <laughs> Things armor and shield. I, I like. I love Earth Shine. There's a couple oh, tracks that I really like. Armor There's and shield on, on shield. Snake and Arrows. Oh, you're right. Ghost Riders on there. I love. Yeah, Earth that's Shield. great. Yeah. Um, Earth Shine is great. Earth Shine's great. 
Nocturne, is that on there? Yeah. Yeah, it's on there. Yeah, Nocturne. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tweener album. I don't love it. I just, you know. But we'll have to save that for when we redo the uh, Rush oh, when you When you interview Getty and Alex, I'll ask them why they never played Available Light Live. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, oh, man. That's that's a good question, man. Because at least I got to see the song "The Pass" and "Presto" live. So that's I great. got to see them both. Yep, yep. Um, I saw two shows on the Presto tour, like back to back. I never. They had, uh, the, big, they had the big giant bunnies that inflated. Yeah, I um, was. I was what fourteen, fit thirteen. <laughs> but you met, you brought up uh, Ghost, and the one thing about that album that it has, it has one of my top five favorite Rush songs. Bravado is one of the most beautiful songs they've ever written. Yep. It brings me literally to the verge of tears every time I hear it. And the drumming, the, the way the drums oh. are made. Oh, dude. And just the just that guitar line, simple but so effective, man. Isn't it funny how we can just flow right into a rush discussion? Yeah, when we're trying to wrap up all over, right? All right, so let's let's get to the end of um assassination. I again I this is um I gave the what did I give this? Hold on, let me look. This is Flowers of Evil. Or Flowers of Evil. Sorry, yeah, yeah, we missed. Uh, I gave this a seven and a half, man. I just yeah. didn't feel a lot of inspiration in this album. I'd say it's a six. I mean, it's I like Perdition City more than this, but it's in the same area for me. Bite thy tongue, John Holm. What? You know my you know my love for Perdition City. <laughs> And my it's buddy, uh, my buddy Nick just got said, "What's that?" It's got five great songs on it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I would argue that. But uh, my buddy Nick just dropped things like Jeff talking about Rush. This never happens. Yeah. Good point. It never happens. Um, all right. So we're are we at the last one? I think we are, right? Well, we're at the last one I have, which is this. Okay. Yeah, and I have it too. Just got it, and actually was listening to it behind us. I don't the actual albums. Yeah. And I gotta say, man, I didn't even know about this till we dove into this uh, a week or so ago when I started diving in. And I had no idea they put this album out. And so I'm looking at it, I'm going, what's the deal with this? Like, what, what the hell is it? Yeah. And what it is, essentially, uh, came out uh, October 31st, Halloween, yep. 2021. So literally two, two years now we've gone with that from Deviant Lab, or it was. Uh, recording Deviant Lab, House of Mythology over producing, and it is the 13th studio album by uh, Uwe. And it, uh, it's heavily inspired by soundtracks from the 70s, 80s, horror movies, with five out of the 12 songs on the album incorporating music from the soundtrack to John Carpenter's 78 film Halloween. Uh, man, what'd you think of this? Like when you first I heard it, I know that most people don't like it. But I, love, I it. love it. I love it. Great. And I love horror film soundtracks. So maybe that's why. But I think I like this seems pretty brilliant. And I like the minimalist packaging and everything. It's just it's great. I like it. Yeah. And what, what uh, any tracks jump out at you? No, not really. I kind of listen to it as a full piece, you know. I really like, like Boo Sackcloth, man. That's the one where he's got the very warbled twist. Yeah. Oh, it's like, yeah. and then the really haunting sort of piano melodies come in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I really like Achilles Milk is really cool. Actually, the last four songs are really killer. Um, I didn't take of notes. course. Of course, <laughs> Aileen Howell is what? That is the theme for. Yeah, that's the theme from Halloween. But they twist it and fuck it up, right? Of course they do. They do weird shit to it. And yeah. it's super cool. I'm trying to think they have. But they say they have five, like that, da, 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 da. and then you hear that ball, ball, ball. But he's just doing that one little. Da, da, da. Is that the <laughs> is that the part where he comes out behind the hedge? I think right. Yes, I think yeah. so. They yeah. we do that section, and it's fucking weird and cool as hell. Um, <clears throat> what I, I I gotta be honest with you, it's a nine out of ten, maybe even higher if I give it a few more listens. Um, I give it an eight. You know, always, always undercutting, John. Always undercutting. Well, it's not, 
Yeah, I'm yeah. very good at giving out big numbers. I always I don't do. see it as a major release for them. I don't, I, you know, they say it's, it's the 13th album. I wouldn't consider it that I would just, I see it as, as a side kind of EP almost in a way. Right? In a way yeah. It's, it's just a side little playful thing that they did. I don't, I don't see it as an album. They did release recently a single. Oh, really? You hear that? No. When? Uh, like I want to say last week. Oh, Maybe. recent. Yeah. Oh shit! No, I had no idea. Well, it's called Ghost Something. Let me let me look it up. Um, I, was, I was talking about Alien Howl, where they take the main theme and then H. Boo Sackcloth, super wicked cool, evil longbows, menacing and intense, heart quickening. All of their original track tracks could easily fit on the movie or any horror movie, despite them not being in. I mean, none of these individual songs are like scary, scary, like evil, scary. But they just set up this ambience, this mood of kind of building dread, maybe, right? You know, that's kind of what I gathered from it. And so, what's yep. the song called? What's the thing called? Oh, the new one, the new single is called Ghost Entry. And, and that just came out. Yeah. Uh, they we'll mention anything that. about an album coming or what's uh, that means an album's coming, I would assume. Um, it, well, they did it. It's, so, they did the song called Ghost Entry, and then there's an Autecker re, remix. Ah, well, that makes. Total sets. Total so it's sets. true. It's a true single. I hope it's coming out on vinyl, like a seven inch or something. Like a seven, yeah, yeah. Um, it came out December sixteenth, I guess. Yeah. Wow. So I gotta hunt that. Did you hear it? What'd you think? Yeah. It sounds like a continuation of what they've been doing. It. I think they've reached a point where they're 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 comfortable in their in their sort of eighties pop sound. Okay. You know, so maybe well, they're not a bad thing. I yeah. I don't. Yeah. They, that's fine with me. Yeah. Um, maybe they're doing a trilogy of that sound. I don't know. Or maybe they've just kind of hit a wall and that's just where they're comfortable right now. It could be. That could be. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, at this point in their career, I think the, the, the most surprising thing they could do is make a black metal album. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be weird? Cause that's because they've done years it. later, practically. Or right? if they or did like a full on like rap album or if they did like a country album. All these things that I don't want them to do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I do not want to hear a rap album. I do not. I could go for a trip hop album again. Yeah. Not a rap album. Um, and, then, and if they wanted to do some sort of like Mer Americana kind of like type of album, that would be interesting. Like a Calexico or something like that? Something like that. Or like, yeah. you know, but or a collaboration with somebody. But I mean, what are, what are they going to do now? I mean, in the yeah. book, we didn't talk about the book. Do you have it? No, I do not. So pull it out. Let's talk. You you give me your thoughts on it. I gotta I gotta get it. Yeah, then we'll get you out of here. Uh, gave, gave up your whole night to me. I appreciate it, man. It's 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 kind of hard to get to. <laughs> Is it like a hardback book? Ah, uh, no. Okay. It was it was behind a bunch of equipment. Oh, I got you. <laughs> got some amps stacked in front of his bookshelf, so. Uh yeah, so it's this wolves evolve. Oh wow, it's amazing! It's amazing. Well, I'm gonna blow. I'm gonna blow you up here. It's a beautiful book, absolutely beautiful book. And when when did that come out? Twenty twenty one, I think. Oh, so it's recent. Then. Okay. Yeah, and it's it covers their whole career. It's fantastic. Who, who wrote that? Who wrote that? Let's give them a plug. Okay, so it's the over story by, edited by Tor Espidal. Well, what it is is it's a bunch of interviews. Okay. But they're recent interviews that have oh. spanned where they, you know, they'll they'll talk about an era and then come back and talk about another era later. Okay. Then, I mean, there's like a there's like pictures. Sure. Of the studio where they recorded Bird Tot. Oh no way. Yeah. Oh, look at that shit. Endless studio and there's Havard. You know. I, I gotta ask you, what's the name of the book real quick? Wolves Evolve, the over story. It was it was released by House of Mythology. So it's yeah, it's just it's edited by Tor Engelson Espidal. Okay, okay. So it says uh, we've, been, we've been talking about making a book, the over story for years. First our 15th anniversary, then for our 20th anniversary, and now after well over a quarter of a century, the time has come. There it is. What um what did that cost you? Remember? I don't know. Like Forty bucks. 40 bucks, 50 bucks. I don't know. Okay. Well, I was just curious because I'm, I'm, 
I mean, it's it's over. So basically, it's me throwing my credit card at whoever. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna give me the book. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to look for that, man. That yeah, I'm, I I didn't even, wasn't even aware it was out there, man. Um, John, what do you got going on, man? Like, what's happening right now? What's happening on the, the solo front since we talked? Anything or? Yeah, I, mean, I, I was doing some tracking. I've got my guitars out. Um, I'm I'm kind of stuck right now because it's like I'm I'm trying to figure out this string situation because I've got this piece that's real. It's like a 15 minute long harmonium layered harmonium piece that I want either cello or violin or viola. I'm fine with either or all. And I keep getting, I keep like having people like, will will agree to do it. And then they, yeah. then they, they're too busy and they, they can't. And I want to have, I want to wrap this up before Agalock plays in, in San Francisco in February. You know, that's kind of my timeline. I want to have this finished. I mean, Hold on, was that announced or no? The Agalock show? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm doing, I'm opening solo. Wait, when was this announced? Is this recent? Like a month ago? Maybe. No, because you didn't even bring that. I don't even think you talked about that on our interview. It wasn't announced then. Okay. Where are you playing? It was announced shortly, I want to say shortly before or shortly after the Denver show. Where where are you playing? We're playing at the Regency Ballroom in San Francisco. Oh, nice place. Nice place, yeah. And so it's it's going to be me opening solo, hopefully. (laughs) And then the band Dawnbringer is playing. And then we're doing, we're headlining. Oh man, nice. And so that's what I'm, we're just kind of preparing for that. But at the same time, I'm trying to wrap up this third album that I've been working on for two years now. Is this Uh, a continuation on from the second album, Blood and... Well, it's the third part of the trilogy. The trilogy, right. We we talked about it in the last interview. Right, right, right. And it's kind of the funeral album that will bring it back around to the you know, it's the third album, the final. So you'd like to hire people that you know rather than going out to like uh, a union hall and pulling in. No, yeah, I don't want to. I, I mean, I'm trying to find some local pe- players that I know and I've worked with before, like Uta Plotkin. She she plays she played viola on Where Shade Once Was. Okay. I, you know, she's busy. Um, Charlie from Panop- Panopticon, he was going to do it. He's yeah. too busy. You know, so it's just like, you know, and his girlfriend plays in the Keening. I don't know if she would be available. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I'm trying to find somebody. <laughs> and I, and I, there was somebody I was going to, who agreed to do it until I, they found out that I was going to, my plan is to have them record a bunch of stuff right. and then I'm going to chop it up and yeah, do, you're gonna edit it and do things. Like one, right? and, they were, and they were not cool with that. So really? Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's not your project. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah. You're getting paid. What the hell? Yeah, you're getting paid. You know, it's, so, um, yeah, anyway. so I, I got your links down below and I got Agala, I believe I, let me, hold on, shit, what did I put down? I'm just, let me make sure because, oh, I can't see it. I, I know I have your personal links, Bandcamp and all that stuff. I'm not sure if I put Agala, I probably put Agala's Bandcamp or no, uh, Facebook and, and Facebook and the yeah, Instagram yeah. And, and the, the website, but, um, uh, yeah, I, and that reminds me, I gotta get in the order and get some stuff from you. It's, it's not that I didn't want to. It's just yeah. Okay. I actually just. It's funny because I I just sold another whiskey and rust today. The box. Yeah, somebody bought it. I gotta send yeah. it off tomorrow or something. You got a, You got some left, right? You said. I got about thirty left. Uh, yeah. And I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna take them with me to San Francisco, so I might I might sell them all that night. Well, no, I'll get one. I'll probably order I'll one tonight or tomorrow, but um, you have to sign it say this is this is from john hall the guy i'll say, I'll say guy, much obliged no no you'll say five the guy that ranks perdition <laughs> city as a seven <laughs> well you know it could it, drop to a six we'll see <laughs> ah, you're fucking stabbing me in the heart man um just can i ask the question or should i not about what? Agu- about Agu- what about it we're planning to write, planning no. any kind of writing. No, no, I can't even find a fucking cellist. <laughs> no, I'm saying, are you guys talking at all about writing new material or not now? No, not now. Okay. <laughs> all right, okay. We're, we're happy with everything we've done and we're we're fine with playing the odd odd show now and then, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, you, you really don't think maybe you, you probably you might not write ever again. Look, it okay. Agalock will make another record. 
but it has to have a saxophone solo on it. See, and see, nobody's going to. Now, now I see the problem. Exactly. <laughs> now I see the problem. Um, yeah, man. So, uh, like, I know I kept you here for three hours and 45 minutes. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> didn't, I cho- Don, didn't Don warn you? I chose I chose a wrong band because they I, I was looking yeah, at a lot of shit. And I'm just like shit. Yeah, if we did not talk talk, we'd have been done in an hour and a half, right? I mean, we not, if we're talking our, about, not if we're talking about the laughing stock, that would have been two hours right there. Wow, well, I was gonna <laughs> say we just shot our load and then got to laughing stock. Um, like I'm almost afraid to ask you, but would you consider coming back to talk about Fields of Nothing? Well, here's the thing about Fields, it's all about the first three albums with me. After that, I don't care. You don't like Morning Sun? I heard it in a car in Germany once, and I thought it was okay. You don't like Zune? No. God, no. Too metal for you? It's just, it's not the same band. They ended after Elysium, as far as I'm concerned. Man. Man. Same way about Bathory, actually. They ended after yeah. Twilight and Gods. I don't care what people after, say. after Blood, Fire, and Death, kind of yeah. And I feel the same way about no, no about after Twilight of the Gods. The Twilight, they, yeah, yeah. right. Twilight. I feel the same way with Swans. It for me, they ended at Soundtracks of the Blind. Whatever this thing they're doing after that, I don't care. And you know, the same thing could be said about Agalock. I think there's a lot of people who who'd say no, they ended after Serpent Ashes. Ashes or after Ashes for that matter. Yeah, I but I don't believe that because I really do think the last album was really really good. <laughs> Really, at its moments, yeah. Um, I would say though, Elysium is one of the greatest records ever. Fucking, it is. It is. It is a mind blowing fucking record. Like just ah, it's it's like it's up there with you know <clears throat> the best Tears for Fears albums or the best um, well fuck the best Talk Talk albums. It's, it's just yeah, stunning, stunning album that. I had kind of forgotten about, and I got a box set with all the stuff, you know, the first four, and then the, like a B size sort of thing. Man, I mean, we can, yeah, we uh, can we can talk '80s Genesis, but then we'll have to hide a body after the afterwards. Oh, uh, dude, I I don't I don't I don't want to see your fucking face for Genesis '80s. I hate that shit. That's hate my fa- that's my favorite era. I fucking hate it. We can't do all that. Right. Then, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it right now. I'm gonna say it right now. I've never said this in any interview. You're gonna get the honor of, of all right, all right. this is a this is an exclusive people exclusive information, and it's good that it's at the at, at nearly four hours because no one's gonna see this. <laughs> <laughs> um, the song and the album that got me into music, period, in terms of like wanting to explore music and why not say illegal alien, man. <laughs> no, no, no. Right. It was invisible touch. Oh my God, John, man! I I used to I idolize saw, you. I saw the I used to idolize you. I, so I was. It was 1986. Uh huh. Uh-huh. And up until that, I point, remember it well. Yeah. Yeah. Up until that point in my life, I was. It was all about motocross and and art and painting and all this stuff. I didn't. I was in karate. I was like. I was a kid that was doing other things. I didn't care about music. Right. And but my my sister is a rocker chick. She was right. into like. She was into the stuff that you're into, like Dawkins and yeah, um, you know, whatever. And so, yeah. she, I was, I, I remember this well. When, okay, I was sitting at the table drawing or painting or something, and she was watching MTV, and the song "Land of Land of Confusion" came on, and it was, it was literally one of those moments where it's like I'm doing my thing, and I, and I look up, and I get up. And I was just infatuated with it. The song, not so much the video, because the video is kind of dumb. But the song, I was just like, this is incredible. Like, what is this? Wow, wow. And my sister was like, oh, it's just some radio garbage, you know. But I was just, I was. Your sister was 1 million percent correct. I'll just say that. (laughs) And then, so, and so, yeah. And then after that, I I asked my mom, we were at, you know, remember when grocery stores used to have cassettes? (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. And we were at we were at like Safeway or something, and I you wanted that I, album. I, I was like, "Can I get this record or this album, this tape?" So the only time I saw Genesis, even though I go back into selling England and probably, mm-hmm. um, I, I I'm trying to think. I think the first, probably the first time I ever heard them was Watcher of the Sky. So Foxtrot, right? Yeah, um, and 
I I go up to Duke and I quit. Although, what's the black and yellow one? Is that just Genesis? The one with the shapes? Yeah, the one with Mama on it. Is it Mama? That's just Genesis. But the that one with the okay. And the one is really good. Abacab's okay too. I, I, I don't I mean Duke is where I stop as far as what I own. Duke is great. But I can and listen to the other stuff. I love and then there were three. I love that yes, album. That's a great record. I love that album, especially the big hit that kind of like catapulted them yeah. into the invisible touch thing. That was follow you, follow me, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love that song, man. Here's um, the thing about Genesis. I prefer the Phil Collins era for Genesis, and I prefer Peter really? Gabriel solo. Yeah, you know, I I've never really stuck with Gabriel after the first four albums. Oh man, so is such a it's a masterpiece. I, it is, it is. I I'm not. It's got Kate Bush on it. Yeah, that's true. I'm not denying it is, but something about those first four Peter Gabriels, it was like when that was kind of oh, done. I just I just. He did a I film mean, score that was really good too. The Passion. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Passion of the Christ. Yeah. No, 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 no. Before oh. this was like '81. Oh. He did a he did a film score. I tell you, man. Salisbury Hill, tricky fucking yeah. guitar song, tricky guitar song to play. Um, and I and I like a lot of Phil Collins' solo stuff too. I don't know virtually any of it, like other than "In the Air at Night," which I admit is a fucking landmark killer song. It's got a cool. Although, although when I hear that song, all I think about is Miami Vice. It's like yeah. Crockett and Tubbs doing their thing. But I will tell you that the only time I ever saw Genesis was on the Invisible Touch tour. Damn. I would have loved to have been there. <laughs> that was it. That was all I saw. And it, it would have been great if that was my first show. <laughs> you're not going to love this, but my buddy and I were there. He gave me a free ticket. And I was kind of like, yeah, I'll go a lot, whatever. And we're, we were at Veteran Stadium, which is no longer there now. It uh, was the baseball field. I don't, I guess it's where the Eagles play now in Philly. And um, and we, uh, we were sitting pretty far back. Like they were kind of like, not nosebleeds, but pretty nosebleeds. And he started saying, man, I'm not feeling good. I'm like, dude, if you want to go, I'm too old. Oh, we left like, I don't know, midway through the second set or something like that. Did you I at did. least see Tonight, Tonight, Tonight? <laughs> is that a, is that song on there? Yeah. That album? Is it? Yeah. We might have. We might have. I saw Abacab. I was happy with that. Oh. I think they did, um, they did watch her. Did they do Land of Confusion? No. Well. You probably missed it. They probably encored with it or something. I'll tell you. Hang on a second. Because they did a long, long ass fucking set, dude. Like they have a lot of material. I think they played like three hours or something nuts like that. Well, it's like Rush, you know. They they would play three hour sets. Yeah. How many times have you seen Rush now? By seven. Seven. Yeah. I got my first Rush show was ninety seven, on the Test for Echo tour. Okay. Yeah. I've seen them. I like that record. I know you don't, but I no, like it. I don't. I I love the title track. I love Driven. I love Totem. I like. I don't like that song. Man. I like um. What's the instrumental? Resist? Not resist. Oh, I love Resist. Oh, Resist. Yeah. Resist is awesome. was, What's the other one? Limbo? Is it Limbo? Yeah. Limbo. yeah, but that was the one time. That was the tour that they played Resist as the song on the album. They didn't do the acoustic version later. Or like. Oh yeah. Later. Well, no. When I saw them, they did the acoustic version. Yeah, Eddie and Alex just come out and play, um, which so I never actually. Well, I probably saw him do it later because I've only seen him like fifty sometimes. So it, was, it wasn't many, but I go all the way back to nineteen eighty. So yeah. I want I want to just tell you the set list. Just show you here it is right there exactly spectrum. All right, so they open with Mama, Abacab, Land of Confusion, That's All, Domino, which is a good track. Great track. In Too Deep. Ugh. Oh, love it. <laughs> the Brazilian. I don't, the, rem I don't remember that. Look, look, when you're stabbing someone to death, that's the song you want to listen to. Which one, the Brazilian or the other? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's funny. I'm actually thinking about stabbing someone. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, follow You, Follow Me. Tonight, Tonight, great Tonight. Song. Another great song. Home by the Sea. I do like that song. Mm. Um, Another great one. Second Home by the Sea. Fucking great and then, and then they did uh, Throwing It All Away. Oh, yeah. I like that song. Then they did the, the Cage Melody, which uh, medley, which was In the Cage, In the Quiet Earth, Supper's Ready, Apocalypse in 9-8, Invisible Touch, Drum Duet, Los Endos. I like Los Endos. 
and they close with turn it on again wow 19, 19 songs what a great fucking set list but here's this is the one you got to hear and then we'll, we'll end this thing um yeah whenever i bring up 80s genesis that's usually when the party ends <laughs> <laughs> i can keep going i'm just saying that uh, yeah I'm, you, you probably need to call it four night. hours and i don't think anyone's watching anymore <laughs> no we got 11 people watching man um hold on i'm sure they're sorry <laughs> wait what am i looking for 1980 uh, all right here we go what, what was 1980 permanent waves right yeah yeah this set list will make you jealous we'll see i'm telling you it's gone up it was before rush got good <laughs> what <laughs> yeah right Sure, man. <laughs> Whatever you say, dude. All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Rush the Palladium. Fort I mean, it's no, it's no show of hands show. <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah, you're right. It's not. Um, thank God. Um, oh, nah. Wait, no show of hands is um. That was eighty nine when that. Yeah, right? that was. Oh, that that album's great, great. man. With that has fucking marathon on it. Mystic yeah. rhythms. Yeah, I saw that tour. Hold on, I'm trying ah. to find the um here it is. I'm almost there. Hold on. Can I do it by date? Can you do it by date? I think you I don't know. You gotta hear this set list though. I would love to tell you exactly what it was, but I may I might have smoked a little of uh, that wacky tobacco that night. And um there. Right. So, and here was the weird thing. Um, they had this band that was supposed to open. It was called Mist. It was like a local. It was like a local band, right? And as it turned out, instead they had Max Webster. <laughs> you know Max Webster? Yeah. Do you like them at all, man? I love Max Webster, man. Well, it, it, we're thinking of the same guy, right? The the drummer. Kim Mitchell. Kim Mitchell. Oh. No, Kim I'm Mitchell's a guitar player. Max Webster was the name of the band. Oh, we're not. Like, about, you don't know Max Webster, dude. No, no, wait, are we talking about the guy who played like drums for the Tonight Show or something? Or no, that's Max. Um, Max Weinberg. I'm Max thinking. Weinberg. No, Max Webster. No, I don't. The know. name of five guys is Canadian. No, I, no, I, they I, I, did. I, here's how you know. Getty and Alex did Battle Scar, the song Battle Scar, mm -hmm. with the Max Webster. Do you know Battle Scar? Bust the busters, steal the stealers, make the healers feel the way out. They did that with Max Webster on Universal okay. Juveniles. That was the, the album. Man, that band was fucking cool as shit. I can't find them. It's okay. I'm sure it was a nice show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to I'm trying to flex here, John. I was more impressed with the Genesis set list. <laughs> you, what that I went or that I then I no, saw that door. The set list in itself was sounds like. What was the last time you saw him? Did you see him on the final tour? Rush. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, where at in Portland? Yeah. Portland. Yeah, I mean I'll that say. dude. Dude, that was emotional for me, man. You know, and but, it's funny too because it's like they didn't say that it was going to be their last tour, but I knew it was. Yeah, I I knew it too, and, and you, it was you like. Just, you, if you paid attention to the video stuff in between, especially the last video that they right. showed after they finished their set and then there's that outro video, I was like, yeah, this is it. I'll never see him again. Man, dude, yeah, I, I got to tell you, man, I was like fucking super emotional that day. I, when we, I got to take my son for the finally, mm -hmm. and that was super special. And like, it just was, it was so intense for me because no band means more to me than that band. There's just, right. I, it can't happen. It's just not, it's not possible. And I'm almost there. Finally found it. Okay. Um, and it was, it was a struggle. And the best part of the night though, was hearing Jacob's ladder. Cause I had, they'd not played that for yeah. since the permanent waves tour. Yeah. I'd never seen that live. So yeah. And it was like, what? All right, here we go. Got it. February 5th, 1980. So, 2112 Part 1, The Overture, The Temples of Syrinx, Discovery, Presentation, Soliloquy, Grand Finale. So they played all of everything but the um, 
the little interlude where he's like uh, talking about cave. what's that? The interlude where he's in the cave. No, it's the interlude where he's because it's parts one, two, three, four, five is missing. It's the one where he's where he goes into the I stand the top of spiral stair and oh, the that. Little confronts me there. Uh, I don't know why they kicked that out, but and then free will, by tour, Xanadu. Spirit of the Radio, Natural Science, mm. Passage to Bangkok, The Trees, Cygnus X1, the whole Cygnus X1 from Farewell. Oh, from it from Farewell. Okay. Yes. Then they did Cygnus X1 Book Two, <clears throat> Prelude. Then they did Armageddon, uh, Part Five, Cygnus. Then they did the Sphere, the very ending. Oh, I love that song. Yeah, and then finally. Closer to the heart, beneath, between, behind. Jacob's ladder, working man, finding my way. Anthem, Bastille Bay, and in the mood, and they ended with a drum solo of all things. It end with the drum solo. Well, they but then they came out and they they coded uh, working man at the end. So oh, it was yeah. kind of like a sort of a semi medley. That was my first show, dude, and also the first time I think I smoked weed, and I was like. <laughs> That was a pretty good show, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, here's the bad part about though. After the show, all kind of people gave me money to get them shirts. This is back in the day when actually the shirt was about the same price as the ticket because my ticket was eight bucks, yes. oh. and, the, and the shirt was about seven. Okay. Imagine those days, right? Yeah. My last time I saw Rush, my ticket was eighty dollars. <laughs> my last time I saw it was one hundred and forty because there you go. I bought a <clears throat> floor seat that was fourteenth row, uh, or yeah, 14th row. But here's the deal. I'm walking out, naive kid, my second show, because Kiss was my first show in October of 79, with with uh, no opener, and Priest was on the tour right before that, and Priest bounced out the show before mine. Uh, I'm walking along. I've got, like, a big, you know, three or four shirts on my shoulder. Some dude comes running by me, grabs all the shirt, and goes. So my mom had to pay all my friends for the shirts. They never Let's never do that again. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've ever done that since. I've put in my belt loop or I wait till the very end and yeah, I stuff them in my pocket. Or John, I want to thank you so much for this, man. It means, really means the world to me. I, I, I can't thank you for, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I thought maybe Don might have warned you. Well, Jason warned me, actually. What did he, what did he Jason, say? Jason was like, oh, so it's going to be an eight hour, an eight hour video. And I'm like. Knowing you or knowing both of us? Knowing you. Oh, knowing me. Maybe Don said something to Jason or something. I don't know. So wait, Jason's watched my stuff then, apparently. Well, Jason knows of your stuff, yes. Okay, all right, okay. Well, we, we half of that, I mean, you know. Well, it's a long discography. It is, it is, it was. And, um, and thankfully, don't... there's not there's some elements of that discography that are not really mentionable, you know? It's just like where we could talk a lot about some albums and then other yeah. albums yeah, it, it exists. Next, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, I would say that about eighty percent of their stuff though is very much worth. It having. is. Um, they, you know, every not every band can literally knock it out of the park unless they do one album and it's a classic. That's about it, right? Yeah. And how many of those bands exist? Not too many. Um, well, but, and, and this is a, one of those rare bands where I like everything they do from the beginning to end. Even the stuff that's not as good as. The great stuff, it's still pretty good. Yeah, like we couldn't have the same discussion about Entombed. It would last two albums. And exactly. then I could come out. For me, exactly for me, the yeah. same thing. Now, I will warn you. If you want to talk about Rush in the future, you must set aside many hours. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I, I'm more about eras anyway. It's like, for me, I've got my special era of Rush, and it's right. not the 70s. Meh. Nah. <laughs> Not the seventies, not not the 70s. no hemispheres. Well, I love hemispheres, okay. and I love a farewell to King. Oh, okay. You know, a lot of people rank twenty one twelve super high. It's kind it's of a not, mid, it's a middling album for me. It's I have it down with Fly By Night and the first. Well, album. I don't have it that far down. <laughs> well, you I mean, know, I don't like Caress of Steel that. I, I like Caress of Steel the most out of the See, first. I think that's the weird album, the outlier album. It's right? dark. Yeah, I love it. And I love Yeah. Fuck, man. I, I, it, 
that I could talk a lot about that. I mean, Twenty One Twelve has like some great moments, but the whole B side isn't that great. I mean, Twilight Zone's pretty good. Yeah, something for nothing is cool. Yeah, um, I do like Lessons. It's kind of a cool when when you actually listen to the songs isolated. Uh -huh. They're good, but the problem is you got to go through the first twenty minutes of the album, right? This this conceptual thread, <clears throat> and and let's be honest, we've heard it a lot. Yeah, kind of once you hear it a lot, you're kind of, you know, like I'll, I'll be blunt with you, man. We did the Agalock deep dive two years ago. I hadn't listened to Agalock in quite a few years. I think you, this isn't something that's going to shock you, um, but when I did, I was like, wow, like man, it just. If, if I was to sit down and force myself to listen to those albums three times a year, I wouldn't find them as special as I do. Now. Okay. So, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. That's where I was going with that. So when we sat down with the, and did the deep dive, it was like, wow, man. Like I totally forgot how fucking killer ashes is. I just was like, man, I thought this album was that way. I don't. <laughs> I'm glad you feel that way. I don't. <laughs> I love that album, man. And I just, I just finished the book for Ashes, the design. Right. Of and Wait, they, when, uh, is the mantle one? When's that coming out? It's in production right now. Okay. I can't can't say it. Yet. Yeah. I don't know when it's going to come out yet. Is the other one going to follow Actually, quickly on or a while back? A while back. Here, here we go. We got a test press. Got the test pressing for the mantle. Ah. There is it. There is the camera. But And that's remastered? Yeah. Yeah. Who did the remastering? Uh, the same guy who did the Japanese versions, uh, Patrick Engel at Temple of Disharmony. And that was your decision or was it the label's decision? Yeah, it was my decision, actually. Okay. You like uh, his work? Yeah, I really like the way that the Japanese and Chinese versions sounded. Um, now this is a German pressing, so it's a little different. I don't know, but it sounds good. I mean, I approved it. So I can just go ahead and throw this in the trash. <laughs> well, no, you intended it to me. I'll, I'll uh, just throw it to me. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, yeah, man. Like, so John, awesome to have you on. I, I can't thank you enough. I, I worried a little bit when you said the two hour thing, I'm like, should I tell him now? Cause I just didn't see us with this many albums and oh, things I, getting through it that quick in two hours. I just, no, I didn't think it'd be four hours, but you know, whatever. We got to talk about Genesis. So there's we got that. to talk about Genesis and Rush, and that's important. And um, I, uh, are you the only thing to ask quick is you're doing the San Francisco date. Are there any, any rumblings of something out east? Yeah, we're we're trying to not to to figure out what we want to do about New York. We're we got a couple of offers from venues. We're not we're unsure if we're going to do two nights at a venue or one night at a big venue. Okay. But I want to do my solo set for that too. Okay. I've never done this, my solo set out back East really. So say that again. I haven't really done my, my solo set. Yeah. Or right. Or anything. So, you right. know, I'm just kind of piggybacking my solo stuff on to the Agalog. Oh, the Agalog. Yeah. Well, That's it makes, makes sense. Right. It makes yeah. sense. I mean, whether people like it or not, it's only 20, 20 minutes of their life. So whatever. Um, <laughs> and if they yeah, do what? Like it, cool. What? Run something by me one more time, because and I I'm sorry to be ignorant, but what are the uh, the trilogy you're working on? Can you give me the two titles of the first two albums? The last place I remember, and Cast Iron Blood. Cast Iron Blood was one of those things. Yeah, yeah. and then the new one. I mean, I mean, it's it's like ninety percent finished. I'm just waiting to figure out this string section situation. Are you are you self releasing that through? Yeah, yeah. Okay. but 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 Eisenwald's going to release them on vinyl. All three as a package, as a box, or what? No, no. But oh, but same. they want to manufacture them together. So I have to finish the third album. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or he, you know, so he can, yeah. Yeah. Are they going to do variants, or are they just going to do black? If it wrote up to me, it would just be black, because, I mean, I want it to be kind of vintage looking. I want you're not, you're not a big fan of the colored vinyl thing? Well, no. I mean, it doesn't fit with this concept. Okay, it, yeah. Well, yeah. Although blood rust, rusty red would kind of work. That would like be okay. Rusty, I mean, rusty brown. There is a color of of red vinyl that's so like it's like a deep dark red where it's like yeah. it looks black until you almost, look at it. Almost like black. scarlet. Yeah, scarlet. Well, I mean, yeah, it's it's black until you show it up, up, up until you put it up against yeah. the light, and yeah, then yeah. it's like you see this redness. That would be okay. 
Yeah. But I don't know. That's a discussion we'll have once I'm done with this third album. <clears throat> All right, man. Well, good luck with that. I hope I hope you find somebody that can help you out. I don't actually know anybody. That well, I know a lot of people. It's just they're busy. And they, you know, like I could ask Thomas from Dornenreich, but he's busy and he's in Austria. <laughs> It'd be nice to have somebody local so I can. Yeah. Oh, session. so you can direct and work with yeah. them directly. Yeah, yeah. What like do you have people fly stuff into you at all? Like via dropbacks for you know, or do you want you always want to work with somebody um, close by? Well, the best case scenario is to work with somebody, you know, yeah. one on one. Um, I can do something with some, you know, doing it like say this way and directing them. It's not it's not my favorite. Not way the same thing. thing, right, right. No. I mean I could ask Misha Cayenne, who played violin on my last album. She's up in Seattle, but I didn't have to figure out how we're going to do studio stuff and if she would come down here. Or Where do you go down? down? Do you have a local studio you use all the time? or? Um, no, nah, not really. I, I mean, I might do some stuff at Jason's and my friend Tattoo has a has a kind of studio. So and then all I got you guys my, live there. All You, Don and uh -huh. Jason all live in Portland yeah. area. OK. Yeah. All right. But I mean, previously I was recording with Tad Doyle, but he does, he's closed his studio from bands recording there now. So oh, no shit. Is he still doing Tad at all or no? He's got, no. what's that other project called? He was uh, doing Brothers of the Sonic Cloth, but he's not doing I that I saw either. them. I saw them open for um, Neurosis was a band. Yeah. I remember, yeah. He's doing uh, soundtracks now. Wow. No kidding. Yeah. Good for him, man. That's awesome. Yeah. He's got some really great clients lined up, so. All right, man. I'm gonna cut you. I'm gonna let you go because I've kept okay. you way too long. Thank your girlfriend or your wife or whatever. I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's your girlfriend. Um, thank her for uh, giving you up for four hours for this insanity. I'm sure she'd thank you because she has four hours to herself. Well, there you go. That's a good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we. I hope uh, we stay in touch, and I'm hoping that you get out east if I'm well enough to get out. Um, yeah. Hard to say. We. We turned down playing Philly. <laughs> oh, you son of a bitch! You. Well, Why? It was, we're at the Decibel Festival. It was what? The, you know the Decibel Festival that DSI yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. We, we got offered that, and we were like, no. We got. Okay, we I gotta know. ask why. Because Denver was more interesting to us. <laughs> Philly's pretty big, though, man. You would have. There would have been at least probably. Yeah. I'm not wow. saying we won't play Philly. It's just it didn't work for us at the time, you know. When did they? Oh, they wanted you to come in in April. I think they right? wanted us to do both. See, the and weird thing is, though, that did you know the the lineup though going into it or no? No, because the lineup for this one is. I love Albert, man. He's cool, but I'm just it's DSI doing. I think the first two albums, which is okay. I think Fit for an Autopsy is the other one. Um, it's it's three bands that I just am like, I'm not too mold's the only band I'm into. Yeah, I, um, I think what sold us on Denver also was playing with Midnight. So, oh, really? Yeah, I fucking loved those guys. So no kidding, and, and they were pretty great. high energy, right? They were great live, and we had to follow it. <laughs> and uh, that was a challenge. Yeah, it's a, a different kind of energy there, though, right? Definitely. I, mean, I, I, I think I'm. I mentioned that actually. I was who like, they the got other, who were the other bands on? I can't remember who was the other uh, headline. Crips played. They were great. They're pretty cool. Uh, the Keening played. Um, was it early? Is it early man? No, primitive. Primitive man. Was primitive uh, man? Uh, Nickel no. He. Yeah. Um, Crowbar is also at the, Nick. Who's the other big headliner on the Decibel Fest? I have the poster somewhere. But anyway, yeah, I missed. Yeah, most that would have been a weird. That might have been a weird one for you guys to be on. We. We prefer to just play our own oh, show. Oh, Chemist was the other big band with you guys, yeah. Well, we that was a different day. No, but I mean, they were the other headliner, right? Yeah, I didn't know about any of the... We we, we didn't watch the other night. We were, okay, and, I right. missed, and I missed most of the bands after the Keening anyway. Or, I mean, no, before the Keening, I didn't see any of the bands, so... Oh, really? Okay. And we, we showed up at the venue, because we went record shopping and stuff, and we went out. Yeah. And so we showed up as Ke the Keening were kind of finishing, and then I saw... I think Crips was after them, and then Primitive Man was after them. Biohazard's the other band. That that's not yeah. a mix with you guys at all. Yeah. No. Um, so, yeah, Jimmy was looking for you. He's like, I don't know where these guys are at, but I didn't see them before after the show. Huh? 
we were backstage. Yeah, Jim, you remember Jimmy, right? From, yeah, I, right? Yeah. I, I, I kind of, I would go out and into the crowd and you know stuff, and I didn't see him. So yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure where he got there because I, I hit him up after the set. I'm like, hey, how was he? He's like, dude, he's fucking epic. He goes, but I don't see these guys anywhere, and I got to get out of here. I got to go home. He lives over in uh, Colorado Springs, so he's in like right. way. So. I mean, we had we had we had a spinal tap moment. I'm sure. Did you really? Talked. Did he tell you about it? No. Huh. Uh, during Into the Pain of Gray, we we lost power in the front of the the front monitors and everything. All the front power went out. Shit. And so, so you couldn't like, hear yourself at all. No, we our pedal board shut off. Oh, oh, everything. And shut my in ear monitors shut off. Everything oh, shut off. Fuck. And I I want to I think they. It affected the the mixing console on the side of the stage that was doing the the monitor mix, and wow. all yeah. Suddenly it was just we were playing the song, and then it was just the bass guitar and the drums. So what did you do? Did you just like we had to stop because yeah. because I was looking at Don and I'm playing the parts in, in silence. Yeah, and Don's like, "Don't stop!" And I'm like, "We have to stop." <laughs> yeah, because you know, and at, for for a minute I thought during what song? What? What song were you playing? Into the Pain of Grey. <laughs> what a weird... Has that happened before? We've never. Lost... No? I mean, that hasn't... I mean, we've had other things happen, but that has never happened, where we had to stop, fix the problem, and then start the song over. Was it was was it a uh, like a breaker, or what? No. What? Okay, so what happened was, is the, the, the power unit came unplugged. It, it, it like vibrated un unplugged. No way. And <laughs> Shit. I, I I joked that, you know, once we got everything going again, I was like, let that be a lesson to you. If you rock too hard, you're going to break the, you might yeah, break right, the right, 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 right. And it turns out that we that was kind of the case. <laughs> so the vibration from the sound. The vibration from the, from the bass, I think. And also I think a fan like tripped over the cable or something. Oh, okay. Or, or bumped it or whatever. And it just went out. We were talking about Sun. I saw Sun with Boris when they did the altar thing. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They played the um, Brooklyn. It was in Brooklyn. It was um, a Sonic Temple there. Masonic. Temple. Oh, I'd love to play that place. Have you been to that place? I've never been there. I'd love to play it. It's a cool place. But so we go up there. It was July. Oh, God. It was. There was no air in the place. <laughs> It was fucking like a tomb, a sweltering tomb. Yeah. It literally got up to like 100 degrees. You just like drenched. I can't they're even up there in those fucking monk yeah, costumes. I can't even imagine that. And they're all, and they're playing those fucking walls of um, suns and um, mm -hmm. uh, orange, right? <clears throat> fucking massive. I don't know what kind of amperage they were drawing. All of a sudden, and they're blowing out smoke. John, to the oh, yeah. point where the whole place is like, you kind of like this to see what's going on. And all of a sudden, man, just boom, nothing. Yeah. Except the drums. And Atsuo gets up and he's like, you know, what the fuck is going on? It took him like 30 minutes to get the power back on. And we're right. all I'm sure the fog had to clear before they could see what they were doing. Well, it did. Yeah, it did kind of. But I mean, <laughs> it was, the fog was kind of like, we were up on the second level. So it was kind of rising and it was more thicker up there. And I'll never forget, man. I, I was looking at my buddy. I'm like, man, I must be a pussy now because, like, this is just insane. Like, I want to leave. It's so hot in here. Yeah. We walked outside for a while because it, you could walk outside. It was like being hit with cold air because it was evening then. And that's the only time I've ever seen a show literally, like, stop and be done. You know, you know what I mean? King's X one time, they blew the PA. So they never played the gig, and I was outside, and Doug came out and hung out with it, Jerry and Doug and Ty came out and hung out with everybody. But I've never seen anybody, like, trip something electrically because they were drawing so much yeah. power from whatever the system was. It, the system overloaded, and it was like 30 minutes before they got us back on. So how long were you off? Five it wasn't minutes? that long. It was maybe five minutes, but it felt yeah. like an eternity. How's, how's that feel? Are you over the... In eternity. <laughs> no, no, but are you over the... Like, if that was your first gig, you'd be shitting bricks, right? You'd be like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. But are you way over that now where you're just uh, like... If that would have happened, say, 15 years ago, I would have been fucking pissed. I would have been okay. an asshole about it. 
But you but, don't get like super anxietized about that now. No, I mean, I have a different attitude now. I mean, since coming back with Agaloc, I've I'm a very different person. I'm a little bit more mellow, and yeah. I, I just took it with humor. Because what are you gonna do? I mean, yeah, if you get right. pissed off and look like an asshole, that's that makes it worse. Sure, sure. So I just the whole time I was like, basically, I thought that it was done. I thought we were done because that it was didn't, the end of the show. It didn't look like they were gonna get it fixed. And at one point, I was just like, "Fuck," you know. But then it then everything came back on, and my in ears were working again. My guitar was working again. So I just said, "Did you pick up where you left off, or did you start the song over?" I started over because oh. it was at the beginning of the song. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. But it, yeah, I have to, I have to hunt the YouTube video down. There. There's, there isn't any. Isn't it really? No, I'm surprised that nobody filmed that. Because there was a lot of other footage out. Yeah. Of the show, but somebody, nobody was videotaping nobody, there. Nobody, like, well, maybe it. somebody videoed it, but they didn't post they didn't it. Up, upload it, yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I was, I just made a snarky joke, like I would. I, I almost, I almost said that I, I was afraid that I'd have to do an interpretive dance. <laughs> <laughs> do a little bit of Napoleon Dynamite up there, right? Yeah, that would have been awesome. But yeah, I mean, you know, it comes with it. We've been those three shows we played. Each one had some sort of weird Spinal Tap moment happen, and that's so, you know, that's just that's just what it is, right? It's live music. You can't, and and that's the other thing is it was a nice reminder that this is in fact live music. You know? And 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 you know what? When I saw Horrendous the other night, I I thought, man, they got to be playing to a click. They're just too tight. Went up, talked to the guys afterwards. No computers, no no Kempers, no Axe Effects. Just a couple of stop boxes at TC Electronics. One guy's playing through a, a Plexi. The other dude was not even playing through a head. He was playing through some bass sort of thing. I'm like, what are you? You know, I don't even know what he was playing. But um, hey, I'll show you my one of my new babies here. There you go. Since yeah. I met up with you. I got some money in. I got that. I got a Taylor 424C. That was the one I was playing earlier, CE. And then I got a Dean Cadillac. Okay. Yeah. With a Floyd Rose on it. And then I got, I had two Les Pauls, but I bought Epiphones because I played Les Pauls. And unlike Don, I just, I can't drop six or seven grand on a guitar like that. That, yeah. frankly, I don't think is that much better. I just don't think they're that much. Unless you get like a '60s or a '50s, or which you can't afford anyway. Right? Don can tell the difference because he, we played a show. We played. We did a tour in Europe where he had to like rent a Les Paul, but it was an mm -hmm. Epiphone, I think. Okay. Or maybe it was a, it, Maybe it was actually a Gibson, but it was it was one of their lesser the models. Cheaper models, yeah. He tell he was like, I hate this guitar. Yeah, I mean, I played, but I played a couple customs, man. They're like fifty five hundred, six thousand. I was looking at them. I'm like, I can't justify it, man. Not only that. Like I'm not playing live, so it's not making me any money. Right? This is not one of these. <laughs> oh wait, is that your is that your electrical? That's no, it's a Travis Bean. Oh, that's Travis. Okay. This is this is my '76. Oh wow, I, man. This is the guitar I played in Denver, actually. Okay, I, what, I, what 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 pickups you have? They're they're Travis Bean pickups. Oh, he wires his own pickups. Yeah, they're 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 these are original. Now, do you mind me asking, like, what you pay for something like that? <laughs> you don't want to say. Well, there's what I paid for it and what it's worth. Well, I was going to say like what he would, what he would charge to the open market. I know in in 1976, I think this guitar was two thousand dollars. Okay. Oh, and that I, is a 1976 guitar. 76. Oh shit! So it's worth way more than that now. Well, and I paid for this guitar. I paid thirty five hundred. Okay. But it, that was in two thousand nine. This guitar yeah. is worth. I don't know what it's worth. It's probably upwards to. How long did he make guitars? Because I've never honestly even heard of that. They, uh, I think until 79. And they have a uh, aluminum headstock. Well, it's aluminum, a whole aluminum. Neck. Oh, the whole, the whole body is aluminum. Okay. Yeah. In fact, this, this is all one piece. Yeah. 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 You, you yeah. literally take all of this body out and put it back together and it would just be a, like a Steinberger. But is that, are, are the two halves of it solid wood or are they chambered? Uh, I think this is solid. This is solid Koa. Okay. And it's heavy. It, this, oh, this guitar hurts my back. And that's your that's your main that's your main guitar. That's my main Travis, but I don't travel with it as much anymore because it's too valuable and it's my favorite one. Yeah. I have three of these guitars, so oh, do you really? Yeah, I, I have Where another. Did you even come up with that name? Because I've never heard of it before until just now. Uh, I was thinking it was uh 
I was thinking it was one of those electrical systems. No, it looks like it. Yeah. God's Future Black Emperor was playing him when I saw them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ephraim. Um, yeah, he was playing one. And the other was, dude, uh, the well, was, the other guy was playing a Kramer, but Ephraim was playing a Travis Bean when I saw them. I and remember the that. funny story about that is the guitar that I saw Ephraim play was actually Stephen O'Malley's first Travis Bean later. That's Stephen right. Bought, Stephen O'Malley plays them. Stephen that's bought, right. seen that. bought his first Travis Bean from Ephraim, and that's the really? one that I saw Ephraim play. <laughs> wow. Man, what are they doing? Do you know? Godspeed? Yeah. Look if I know. They put out an album that I didn't care about. <clears throat> I mean, I man, I used to love that band so much, but I kind of, kind of after what was the last one they did? Like in nineteen, there was oh wow, what's that? Is that semi hollow? Yeah, it's a semi hollow. Yeah. This is an Aria, Aria Pro Two, Japanese guitar, right? It's a Japanese one, yeah. It's a uh, it's the it's the TA TR One, and I'm 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 going to use this in San Francisco, and I'm going to probably use my for my solo project too in San Francisco. Okay. So I'm just going to get it set up for it. Yeah, they're nice. I mean, the Aria is what oh, year? Yeah. What year is that? Oh, fuck. It's modern. I'd say maybe 2015. Shit, I didn't even know they were still making stuff. All right. Yep. <laughs> what, do you, what do you use acoustically? I, did we talk about that? Um, I have I have a Gordoba uh, nylon. A nylon? Yeah, I've got a... Uh, a Stegall, which is Odin, uh, 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 still string, and I have a, I have a twelve string. Fuck, what is it? It's in this. Case. I have a I have a Martin twelve string. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, a Martin. Man, I don't even think I've ever seen a Martin 12 string, so. Uh, fuck, okay, I'll you get don't it. Have, no, you don't have to get that. I, <laughs> I don't want to. What year is that? I don't know. It's old. <laughs> did you get that on the road, or did you get it locally, or what? I got it locally. Do you, um, do you shop at the, the shop that Mike works at? Huh? Do you shop at the, the maybe he... Maybe he lives in Eugene. How far is Eugene from you? Uh, about an hour and a half. Is Mike Scheidt in Portland or Eugene? He's in Eugene. Okay. Because I know he works at a shop. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, Martin. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, where is it? There it is. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. So this is... This is a DM12. Okay. And I haven't I don't use it on many things. Literally, I think the last time I used this guitar was on Serpent Spear. Do you um do you play it like solo more or or not? I mean I mean cuz you know with 12s it's, you got to find your niche with them. They're not Yeah. Like, I um, hate tuning them too. Ah, tuning them is a fucking pain. And yeah. changing strings, fuck. Uh, change the strings. You might as well. You might as well go pay someone to do it for you. <laughs> yeah, and I do. Well, yeah. <laughs> I just so this is my acoustic. It's okay. uh four two four C, uh C E or four two four C E walnut Edgeworth. So it's a walnut body. Um, okay. And man, the tone. Yeah. It's got that Taylor tone, you know. Yeah. But I and this is what I play 90% of the time. Got oh. all the electrics and stuff like that. I'm like, man, this is just I love playing it. So um and then you got hagstroms too, we talked about, right? Yeah, I've got a couple of hagstroms. Um Do you have any you don't have any like like standard stuff, right? Like Les Pauls or no. Yeah, this is the Viking. Well, pretty man. Um, I love this guitar. It's one of my favorite guitars. Yeah, and you know, you of course Austin plays those. He loves those things too. Yeah, he does. And then I got a baritone, which you saw in the last video. Oh, 
All right, John, I'm going to let you get out of here, man. I've kept right. you way too fucking long. Uh, I really appreciate it. I really do appreciate all your time. And uh, I will not bug you a lot, I promise. But if you want to do another one sometime, let me know and hit me up and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll jump into it. These are how I roll. This is how I roll. I don't, uh, yeah. I don't back away and go, oh, let's hurry up. I mean, I want to, you know, I think we both had a lot of cool moments where we're like, ah, oh, Ooh, ah, you stole that from me. I stole that from you. And that's that's what makes music so fucking great, right? You know? Right. And um, so thanks to everybody that was here. John, hang on one sec. Uh, thanks to everybody that was here. We're going to cut it here. And um, thanks for everybody that hung out. Still got 11 people watching, so that's very cool. Wow. Uh, Dedicated. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> Only thing to mention real quick is tomorrow night, I am doing my top 23 of 23. It was tough, man. I was tough to get. Honestly, I didn't even. I only bought like twenty three, which is why I'm stopping well, there. I, I hope Zizma is at the top of the list. <laughs> Zizma for an Al Mountain twenty three. Yeah, better go get it. No way, for real. Yeah, it's fantastic. Oh shit! I gotta check that out. It's so. It's good. not gonna make it because I, I won't have enough time. But. And if Agalock had one, it would probably be on there, but uh, they don't. Maybe have or might might not be. <laughs> <laughs> might not be, might not be. Yeah, I got. It might be, I got it some, might be a blood inside for you. <laughs> I got. Some, yeah, I could be. You're right. I got a lot of weird. I got some weirdies and some obvious ones and whatnot. And so, real quick on that though, Rick is going to join me from the Dreadful Minutes, and I believe that Devin is going to join me from Maze of Torment. Maybe one or two other guests, and um, I think that's it. Other than on January 10th, I'm doing a deep dive on UFO. We're doing the Michael Shanker period and the Paul Chapman era. So that's kind of long range where I'm at right now. And uh, appreciate everybody being here. John, hang on. Everybody take take care. Hang on. There we go. I don't know what's going on with my... There we go.